And so Jesse Morrell is a great example. I, I mean, literally, I hope Jesse Morrell helps you to see where the problem is. Uh, James White is a fatalist, hardcore determinist, infant damnationist, perpetual sinning, sinful imperfectionist, Smirnoff drinking, free will denying, Gnostic heretic. I, I could be wrong. Calvinism is heresy, heresy, heresy. And I don't mind saying it after dealing with these people for 19 years, after encountering them for 19 years, uh, I'm fully persuaded that Calvinism is a cult. Calvinists are heretics, that it is, it is a demonic deception. It's, uh, it's the antichrist spirit that First John said would be in the world. And I have no problem saying what I fully mean. All right, welcome back to Open Air Outreach. I know it's been a few weeks since I've uploaded anything. I've actually been working pretty diligently on this uh, response to uh, so-called Dr. James White. I say so-called because there's there's a controversy and debate over the legitimacy of his doctorate, uh, if you research it online. I guess he got his doctorate from some unaccredited uh, school where he even uh, wrote his own curriculum. Uh, that was around uh, his books that he was already writing some type of strange and bizarre uh, situation um, but that's another point um, anyways I have my 108 page response to um, Dr. James White uh, because here's the situation if you watch the last video that I uploaded this Calvinist pastor came out to confront me uh, did a Facebook Live video, and he did a horrible, horrible job. And uh, he immediately appealed to uh, James White, who then tried to um, address uh, the points that I made in that video. And I think James White embarrassed himself uh, even more than Emilio did. Uh, White is supposed to be a doctorate, PhD, but he seemed to really struggle to address the points I made. In fact, uh, he just bypassed and ignored a lot of the, the points I made, probably because he, he didn't have a, a way to address them or answer them. Um, but, you know, this pastor came out because uh, it was a turf war. I, he's, I've been preaching here, you know, every day for, or every week for so many years, and I've actually been preaching on that campus longer than him, so it was this uh, pathetic turf war uh, situation. I've tried to be friends, actually, with that group, uh, tried to be friendly with that group before. I saw them out in Fort Worth once, and I gave them uh, just a word of encouragement, like, oh, it's, you know, it's good to see you guys out here passing out tracks. But apparently that group wanted him to uh, try and confront me then. Uh, I guess he didn't muster up the, the courage or whatever to do so. Uh, but here he did. He finally came out with uh, this video. He saw him come out with his buddy. They had a Facebook Live going. And uh, they, they tried to catch me off guard to ambush me. And this isn't the first time a Calvinist has done that. Um, there's another Calvinist named Marcus Pittman. He's with that Apologia uh, Church uh, Jeff Durbin group. But years ago, Marcus Pittman um, confronted me or had a had one of his uh, his cronies come out to campus in Florida with a camera rolling, trying again ambush me. Um, you know, unannounced, uninvited, uh, no. Um, um, no introduction, just rushed up on me with a camera going, trying to rapid fire some questions and rapid fire some scriptures about Calvinism. And I was able just to dismantle all of his objections and all of his uh, untwist, all of the scriptures that he was twisting and explain it to him. And I never did see that video. They never posted it online. And I was waiting for it because I thought I did a pretty good job explaining it. And uh, one of their main verses was like Acts uh, what, 13, uh, where it says, as many as were ordained to eternal life believe Believed. And I talk about how that Greek word for ordained does not mean preordained. In fact, it means disposed. It refers to the disposition of the people. And the contrast is with the other people in the, a few verses earlier who had a disposition against the gospel. And so, uh, you know, as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed, does not have a Calvinist uh, connotation of this elect uh, business uh, to it at all. If, if, if you actually properly read it, it just means that as many as uh, had a disposition towards eternal life, uh, believed. Anyways, Emilio's fault was that he came out with a Facebook Live. So he rolls up on me with this Facebook Live already going. 
and uh, I saw what they were trying to do, so I immediately uh, counterattacked and uh, started punching holes in Calvinism. And you could tell Amelia looked at the camera and realized, oh, you know, crud, this is already Facebook Live uh, going. And he looked down at the ground and then had to had to just get into it because uh, it was a Facebook Live. So because it already went out to the world, uh, James White had to try and come to the rescue and uh, was in what I would call damage control, uh, but he did a, a horrible job. So. Before I start, let me at least say one nice thing about James White. Uh, the nice thing I would say is that he's friendly towards Arminians, classical Arminians. In the world of James White, orthodoxy consists of uh, Calvinist and Arminians. And if you're in the Calvinist Arminian camp, then uh, then you're orthodox. But you know, any anything outside of that is unorthodox. So he at least treats the Arminians as orthodox, as brethren. Uh, a lot of Calvinists, uh, especially the extreme cultish kind, like uh, well, Emilio is really one of the cultic cultish kind of a uh, Calvinist, but they'll, they'll just call all Arminians heretics. Arminianism is a false gospel. In fact, the guy who gave me a hard time once, Ron Underwood, uh, I ran into him on campus once and he just started trying to blast me as a heretic. I never even met the guy. I didn't even know the guy. And uh, he was out there open air preaching. But as soon as he saw me, I became the topic of uh, discussion for the next like one or two hours. It was insane. Um, but, um, the thing is, Ron Underwood is like an extreme Calvinist, and he attacks James White for not attacking Arminians. Uh, he will say that uh, James White is like a closet Arminian because he doesn't call them heretics. He doesn't call Arminianism a false gospel, uh, that sort of thing. And so White is more moderate when it comes to the Arminians, and I appreciate that because I've always identified as an Arminian in the Calvinist Arminian debate because I believe in free will, I believe in um, conditional election, unlimited atonement, resistible grace, uh, conditional security, or that you could lose your salvation. Um, I believe in those things which, you know, I identify with the Calvinist, uh, or I identify with the Arminian camp uh, more than the Calvinist camp. I mean, I can agree with the Calvinists on things like, you know, the inspiration of the Bible or the Trinity. Um, but certainly not their five points of, of TULIP. Anyways, um, if White was consistent though, he should call Arminians heretics because um, he calls what, what he, for example, like Wesley, uh, Finney, and Booth. These men all taught entire sanctification, that you could live a life of entire sanctification towards God, uh, free from sin, not, not deliberately sinning, and uh, you know, White would classify that as a oh, sinless perfection. You know, this whole sinless perfection is an unbiblical term, um, but Calvinists use it um, to kind of disparage holiness. But if if White was consistent, he should call people like uh, Wesley and Finney and Booth heretics because they taught entire sanctification. Even Dr. Michael L. Brown, who's a friend of Dr. White's, and they, he, Dr. Brown um, is an Arminian, and White is obviously a Calvinist, but, but they're friendly, and they're friendly towards each other, and they would call each other brother and brethren and that sort of thing. But even Dr. Brown wrote a book called Go and Sin No More, and I'm surprised White doesn't call that you know, sinless perfection heresy. You know, it seems like any time uh, you try and uh, preach, go and sin no more, they just call that heresy. But uh, obviously Jesus preached that. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Uh, nobody's going to accuse Jesus of heresy. At least I would hope not. Anyways, um, that aside, so that's my nice thing about James White. It's probably the only nice thing I'll say. Because other than that, I thought he did a pretty pathetic job in his video about me. Uh, Emilio publicly embarrassed himself, but White, I think, embarrassed himself uh, even more. Uh, this whole situation has been what I would call an epic failure for the Reformed camp, an epic failure uh, for the Calvinist movement that we have today. I knew that James White uh, was bad, but I really didn't know it was this bad. Uh, I have to admit, I've never watched a James White video um, until the one he made about me, because uh, I don't care to. I don't care to listen to Calvinists. Uh, they, they make my stomach turn. Uh, I, I mean, Calvinism makes me want to vomit. You know, the God causes all sin. Jesus didn't die for everyone. God doesn't want everyone to repent. I mean, it's just repulsive. Calvinism is repulsive to me. So I don't bother to listen to any of the Calvinists uh, ever. Um, but I knew of James White, 
but I've never actually watched any of his videos in their entirety. Maybe a few clips here and there. Um, I have a hard time stomaching him. That's probably one of the reasons it took me a long time to make this video, was I had to go through a, an, over an hour of James White talking to pick out uh, clips to respond to, which I'm basically responding to all of them. Um, but it's just hard. Calvinism literally grieves my spirit. It, it grieves the Holy Spirit within me. The first time I encountered a Calvinist, I had been a Christian for about a year or two, and they were giving me their view of Romans 9, and it just it just grieved me so bad in my spirit. The Holy Spirit, um, I think the Holy Spirit hates Calvinism, absolutely, because it's a counterfeit gospel. It's the opposite of the truth, really. Anyways, and so, so White I knew was bad, I didn't know he was this bad. And I don't just mean that his theology is bad, Calvinism as a theology is very bad. I just mean as a theologian, he's bad. His reasoning skills are bad. His logic is bad. Um, his, his ability to debate is bad. Uh, people, I've heard James White was like a good debater, but from what I've seen, uh, debating is not his, uh, his strength. Uh, he, should, he should definitely stay out of the debating realm. Um, so, uh, he's really a master of saying a lot and yet saying nothing at all. Uh, I really wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't play even five seconds of me in, the, in his video and then he would talk for like 10 minutes. He would play just a five second clip and then just talk for, for five or 10 minutes, just rambling on and on uh, down some rabbit trail or some type of straw man. Anyways, it was painful to watch. I'd rather have a root canal. Um, so this response, video that you're watching now it was really an act of self-sacrifice for you guys this is for the benefit of you I mean I could watch James White and see all the problems in his arguments and all the problems in his video but you know not everyone can and so I want to make this video response to point out uh, just the epic failure uh, that his video was he really had he had no substance no real content uh, no actual refutations. Uh, he really didn't expose me. His video was called Jesse Morrell Exposed. He didn't expose me at all because I have nothing to hide. Um, he exposed himself as unable to address the biblically consistent theology uh, that I hold to. He literally just like dodged. This was his, his mode of uh, operation. He would dodge like every point that I made. He didn't address really a single argument and he would just counterattack with his own straw men. Rather than to uh, address the substance of what I said, he would just find a way to dodge it and then just come up with his, his own counter argument. Um, that was that's what he did throughout the whole video. So it reflects James White's inability to address my actual arguments. Um, I find it just to be you know, typical of Calvinists to do that. Um, it was like a dodge punch technique. Dodge what I said, ignore what I said, and then just make your own counter attack. Um, just bypass my point and then make your own point. Uh, he oftentimes just gave the same old tired, canned answers that you hear from Calvinists. It's just like a cult, uh, like Jehovah's Witnesses, where they have their canned answers. Uh, Calvinism is, the, is a cult of the same kind. They have their canned answers, uh, how you address um, different issues. And so White sometimes gave great answers to questions I wasn't even asking. Uh, he's addressing uh, uh, my video and addressing the points that I made, supposedly, but his canned answers don't even apply to them. So he gave some great answers to things that weren't even asked. He seems to lack logic skills. He uh, built his whole theology on what you call eisegesis, which is reading your theology into the text when it's not really there. And I'll show you many times in the video when he does that. Um, so I watched this video, at least good parts of it, with a room full of brethren after he uploaded it at the Street Preacher Conference. And we were all just laughing at him. We were laughing at his failed attempts and his, 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 his horrible responses. Uh, I really genuinely thought that, um, that he, would, he would realize his blunder and, you know, down, and, and remove the video from the internet. But apparently he didn't. He just left it up there. Uh, I was quick to download it because I wanted to make this video response. But uh, he, you know, he left it up there. So not to mention, and I say this uh, in all genuine seriousness, it seems to me, uh, having not watched James White before, but he comes across very effeminate. Because um, I deal with homosexuals out on campus and on the streets all the time. So I can pick up different you know, uh, cues. Uh, I can tell almost right away when someone's a homosexual when they walk up in, into the crowd. Because um, there's just, 
they have uh, key characteristics. And with White, the way that sometimes he would bend his wrist, sometimes he would like move his neck, uh, sometimes he would slur his speech, um, it just seemed very effeminate. And uh, I don't know if White struggles with homosexuality, uh, struggle as they say, um, if that's you know a sin that he deals with, with his sinful nature that he commits every day. Um, but I just seem he came across very effeminate. Leave a comment if you've ever watched James White, if you've ever gotten that impression. Another brother, uh, he got the same impression right off the bat um, like I did. He thinks, he thinks White's just a drunken homosexual, actually, because, well, White, uh, apparently I read in ChristianNews.com that White will have a Smirnoff every night to help him sleep. I thought, my, you know, Smirnoff every night to help you sleep. Take some melatonin. Uh, Smirnoff, my goodness. We'll talk about that maybe later. So, uh, amazingly, he left this video up, so I, I've typed out my video response to it. There's a lot to say. Um, let's just say um, there's a lot of teachable moments. So first, let's start with the first clip where this is actually just from the in introductions of, uh, of his video. Constantly hear people that are Calvinists harp on this. Rah, rah, I'm sovereign, I'm sovereign, rah, sovereign, sovereign, sovereign. They just keep repeating it and they repeat it so much you start to think it's a biblical truth. All right, there you go. I thought, I thought that was actually a legitimate point. Uh, they do parrot this cliche God is sovereign. And they say it so much, people think it's a scripture. God is sovereign. Uh, there's, not a, there's no scripture that says God is sovereign. That's like a motto, a cliche of the Calvinist camp, but it's not a scripture. Um, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. It's not a Bible verse. Uh, you have to translate what they really mean when they say these things. Uh, you know, we say that America is a sovereign nation. Um, we say that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, King James was, a, was the sovereign of England, um, but that's not what they mean by sovereign. Uh, what they mean, when they say the word sovereignty, what they really mean is puppetry, um, that everything that happens is caused and controlled by God. If, uh, if you lose your job, that was God who did it. If your wife divorces you, that was God's plan. If your child dies, uh, that was God's will. Um, whatever happens, everything that happens is God's plan, God's secret will. Uh, that's what they mean by when they say God is sovereign. Uh, they don't mean the same things that we mean like uh, the sovereign, America is a sovereign nation or the king is the sovereign. See, a king is the sovereign of his kingdom, but it doesn't mean everything in his kingdom um, is in accordance with his will. It just means that he's the highest authority of the land. Sovereign means, um, you know, highest authority, not ultimate cause of everything. God is sovereign because he's the ultimate authority of everything. Uh, he gave us free will and he will hold us accountable for how we use it. But God is not sovereign in the sense that he's a micromanager who's causing uh, everything. Anyways, let's, uh, let's get more into this. Jesus stands outside the tomb of Lazarus. He says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus said, I can't, I'm dead. <laughs> That's not what he did. Lazarus came out. So you mean to tell me a dead person can respond to the command of Christ? All right, I thought, you know, again, this issue with Lazarus, Calvinists do appeal to Lazarus as like a type of analogy of regeneration, where it says, you who were dead in your trespasses and sins, has he quickened together? And uh, they, they point to Lazarus as like an, an analogy of regeneration. Um, but that's a good point that he made in that uh, introduction, that God always provides the ability to do what he commands. So God commanded Lazarus to come forth, but he provided first, he provi before he commanded it, he provided Lazarus with the ability to do so by, uh, well, by raising him from the dead. So the principle in Scripture is that what God commands, he provides the ability to accomplish. And that's always the case. Um, a dead man can uh, respond to the gospel. Uh, look at the story of the prodigal son. Rather than Lazarus being an analogy, um, of what it means to be dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, the prodigal son is uh, actually an example of what it means to be dead in your trespasses and sins. Because uh, the father said, this is my son who was dead and is alive again. And so the prodigal son was dead. Now dead does not mean no free will. That's what Calvinists will read into the, into the scripture 
eisegetically, um, not exegetically, but eisegesis, um, they read it into the verse that, oh, what does dead mean? Dead means uh, no free will because dead men can't do anything. Well, if you take it literally, dead men can't do anything, so dead men can't sin. So if you're really going to say, well, dead men can't do anything, so dead men can't repent, then you should be consistent and say dead men can't sin either. Sinners can't sin. Uh, but dead relates to your relationship. The prodigal son's relationship to the father was dead. Nevertheless, he was able to say, I will return uh, home. I will return to my father. So here you see someone who was dead to the father, who still had a free will to be able to say, I will return to the father. And so the sinner is dead in his trespasses and sins, but that doesn't mean he has no free will to um, turn to God or repent and uh, come home to the Lord. So Calvinists make a false comparison between Lazarus and regeneration when you really ought to look at the example of the prodigal son. But the point in scripture is you never see God commanding the impossible. God commands Lazarus to come forth. He gave him the ability to do so. Um, God commands all men everywhere to repent. And that means all men everywhere to repent have been, all men everywhere have been given the ability by God to repent. Does God command uh, the impossible? Here's a little Bible study for you. Uh, God's, God commands what we're capable of. In Deuteronomy 30, 11, it says, For this commandment, which I command you this day, is not hid from thee, uh, neither is it far off. And that Hebrew word hid there means beyond one's power or too difficult. So God is saying in Deuteronomy 30, 11, that what he commands is not too difficult to be done. Uh, it is tyrants in the Bible who command the impossible. In Exodus 5.13, uh, you see Pharaoh commanded brick, but he gave no straw. So that's what tyrants do. They command the impossible. And it says, There was no straw given unto thy servants, and they say to us, Make brick. And behold, thy servants are beaten, but the fault is in thine own people. And so, does the command imply the ability? Only if it comes from a just ruler. Uh, command does not apply, imply ability if it comes from a tyrant. Command does not imply ability if it comes from an unjust person. But if it's from a reasonable sovereign, from a just king, uh, then the command implies the ability. So God's commands to go and sin no more, to repent, to turn to him, to seek him, all of that implies the ability to do so. Uh, our obligations are proportionate to our ability. Luke uh, 10, 27 says you're sp supposed to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is with all thy. In other words, you're not commanded to love him with what you don't have. You're commanded to love him with all that you do have. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says uh, no temptation is taken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able and with the temptation will make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Um, Matthew 11.30 says, My yoke is easy, my burden is light. 1 John 5.3 says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Now if God commands the unregenerate to repent, and they cannot repent, then his commands are grievous. If God commands the unregenerate to repent, and they can't repent, and then he punishes them with eternal hell for their impenitence, then God is not just. His commands are grievous. And of course, the Bible says, like in Luke 1, 6, that there have been people that have kept his law. So his law is not impossible because it says, for they are both righteous before God, working, uh, walking in all of the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And so here they kept all of God's commandments. So God does not command the impossible. Um, we need Jesus because, not because the law was unreasonable, but because we were unreasonable. We could have kept God's law, but we didn't. And since we, we um, could have obeyed, but we didn't obey, we deserve punishment. And therefore, we need Jesus. We don't need Jesus because we couldn't obey. Uh, we need Jesus because we could have, but failed to do so. But Calvinism charges God and charges the moral government of God uh, with injustice, commanding the impossible at the threat of eternal hell, um, I mean, you can't get more unjust than that. 
Here's another one. Some new Calvinists, even pastors, very openly smoke pipes and cigars just as they drink beer and wine. All right, so he's talking, I, I believe he's probably talking about James White's church, which is a worldly church, uh, Apologia Church, run by Jeff Durbin, where they literally, they do tattoo fundraisers. They do uh, cigar smoking Bible studies. You can even watch them have a Bible study on YouTube, all sitting around puffing their cigars. I mean, we talk about being a bad example to children. The Bible says if you uh, cause, uh, you know, uh, children to stumble, you know, uh, it's better to have a large millstone uh, hung around your neck. Um, so you're having a Bible study. You're, it's standards are even higher if you're a pastor, and Jeff Durbin's a pastor, and you got kids on YouTube watching him uh, smoke cigars as he reads the Bible. Uh, it's horrible. So they do uh, they do tattoo fundraisers, cigar smoking, Bible studies, and then this is like one of the worst parts. They have like beer party reformation conferences. See when when we when me and my friends get together for conferences, we do um, we do prayer meetings, uh, we do street preaching, um, we do uh, holiness sermons. I guess when these guys get together for their conferences, these Calvinist conferences, they literally uh, go out to the bars. There was a, the Apology of Church was having some Reformation conference, and they were advertising that the that the bar that they're going to has like 21 different kegs, 21 different types of beer. My goodness. Um, it's worldliness, it's carnality. Uh, no wonder these Calvinists hate holiness preachers um, because they're so unholy. I find it interesting that, well, Charles Finney did altar calls and Calvinists want to crucify him. Uh, Charles Spurgeon smoked cigars and Calvinists want to defend him. Um, I say give me a preacher who calls sinners to repent at the altar any day over a tobacco smoking preacher. I mean, I smoked, uh, you know, uh, every day I smoked cigars, I smoked uh, marijuana, I smoked uh, cigarettes before I came to the Lord. But I know after reading the Bible, if you destroy the temple of God, him will uh, God destroy. Or if you defile the temple of God and your body is supposed to be a temple of God and you're just shaving uh, years off your life and poisoning your body with toxic substances, it's, it's horrible. Anyways, yeah, that was 1 Corinthians 3.17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Um, after Spurgeon pronounced that he was going to smoke for the glory of God. Can you imagine that? Smoking to the glory of God. An English businessman began to market the cigars that Spurgeon smoked. Uh, Spurgeon, see all these Calvinists look up to Spurgeon. They, uh, they make fun of the Catholics for having their saints. But the uh, Calvinists have their own saints, uh, like cigar-smoking Spurgeon. Spurgeon entered into a store and he saw a sign that said, uh, Spurgeon smokes. And uh, he heard complaints from parents who were encouraging their children not to drink alcohol or to smoke, uh, only to receive the reply, but, but Spurgeon does. Can you imagine that? You know, so you're trying to, if you're a preacher, especially you're in the eye of the public, you're supposed to be a good example onto children. And you're a, a beer guzzling, tobacco smoking pastor. Uh, it's horrible. Um, Luke 17:2 says, "It were better for him that a millstone were hung around his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones." It's too bad that Charles Spurgeon never got to hear Charles Finney preach. Otherwise, uh, Spurgeon might have repented at the altar. Uh, even. Even Finney, who was a contemporary of Spurgeon, uh, knew that smoking cigarettes or smoking tobacco was a sin. Um, he, he also defined uh, drinking alcohol as a sin. And so you can't say, oh, well, Spurgeon, you know, they didn't know it was bad for you. It was a different time period. Finney knew. Finney knew it was wrong. A friend of mine used to smoke until a brother challenged him and said, well, Pray over the cigarette before you light it up. That uh, pray, pray for God to bless it to your body. And so he 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 tried once. Uh, he just thought it was ridiculous to even pray and ask God to bless it to his body. So he well he just gave up smoking. Good man. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians ten thirty one, whether ye therefore eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Is God really glorified by a by a, a tobacco-smoking, beer-guzzling pastor? 
No, he's dishonored. Anyways, uh, Jeff Durbin and Apologia Studios, they, they ought to be ashamed of themselves. This is James White's church for proudly being a bad example unto their own children. Uh, it's just the rotten fruit of Calvinism. Uh, again, no wonder Calvinists hate holiness preachers. Uh, these are men of the flesh, men of indulgence, men of carnality. Uh, James White will take Smirnoff, like I said, every night to help him sleep, according to Christian News. Well, why don't you pray? Pray for God to help you to sleep. In fact, uh, you know, <laughs> if you pray long enough, it'll probably put you to sleep. Uh, why don't you just take some melatonin? My goodness, you don't need to take Smirnoff every night. And I really think it's starting to reflect on James White. I heard he was like a great debater and some type of intellectual, but all I've seen is the video he did about me, which I'm going to show you all these clips, and uh, I think the Smirnoff is getting to his head. I think the Smirnoff's getting to his brain. So you can't take White's uh, criticisms all too seriously. Uh, it might just be the Smirnoff talking. So... Even Jesus cannot override your unbelief. All right, Jesus cannot override your unbelief. Now, White has this stuff as the introduction to his show because I guess he thinks it's, it's just so stupid. He's mocking it. Um, but actually, read your Bible in Mark 1.15. And it says, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. So here, you see, Jesus commands men to believe. Then you see in John chapter 20, verse 27, And he said unto Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hand, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. So to believe is something that God commands. Uh, it's a choice that God commands people to make. And this is the key here. Jesus rebuked men for not believing. In Mark 16, 14, it says, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So Jesus rebukes them for their unbelief, which implies they could have believed. Now, Calvinists think faith is an irresistible gift from God. But if that was the case, Jesus should be rebuking God for their unbelief. Because the reason they um, have unbelief is, well, God decreed it, and they can't help it, and God hasn't given them faith. And uh, yet you see Jesus rebuking them for their unbelief. In Luke 24, 25, and, it said, and he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So he rebukes them for being slow of heart to believe, implying that they could have believed faster. Which again shows that faith is a free will choice. So yeah, I mean, even Jesus doesn't override your unbelief. He commands you to believe, uh, but he rebukes you if you don't. Because the choice is yours. In Mark 6.6, 6, it says, and he marveled because of their unbelief. He marveled. He wondered. It was amazing to him. He wondered at their unbelief. So God condemns those who don't believe, and he holds them accountable. We see in Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. So all of this is consistent with an indicative of uh, faith being a free will choice of man. It makes no sense at all in the perspective that, oh, faith is an irresistible gift from God, which would ultimately make unbelief God's fault for not granting men the gift of faith. Broadcasting the truth about God's freedom to save for his own eternal glory. All right, the way Calvinists frame the debate, it's always, uh, it's always horrible. What they mean by saying God's freedom to save for his own eternal glory is uh, God predetermining all men to sin, then predetermining that some men will be damned for their unavoidable sins that would then glorify his justice, and others that are predestined to be spared the punishment for their unavoidable sins in order to uh, glorify his, his mercy. Uh, listen, they're delusional. If they think that this false theology actually glorifies God's justice or glorifies God's mercy, there's no justice 
in God damning men for sins that he predestined them to commit, which they had no free will ability to avoid. And there's no mercy in sparing them from that type of punishment if they, again, were predestined to commit those sins and had no free will ability to avoid them. So they claim to be the champions of God's grace, of God's justice, of God's glory, but really nothing could be further from the truth. Um, it's, it's, it's a mockery of justice. It's a mockery of, of grace. The doctrines of grace, as Calvinism is called, is really a, a disgrace. It's the doctrines of disgrace. Anyway, welcome to Radio Free Geneva. I was not planning on doing a Radio Free Geneva today. Uh, it's Robert Reese's fault. Thanks, Robert. Appreciate that. Um, I was literally heading out the door when I got a Facebook message from Robert Reese, who had just uploaded the video um, of a an encounter that Emilio Ramos had with Jesse Morrell at UNT. Okay, so again, I told you, I've never actually listened to James White speak before. I've seen just sh very short clips of him from a few different videos, but I've never watched uh, him extensively. Um, and I thought, well, I thought my friend Chris Fisher did a pretty good, um, and in, made a pretty good comment and an interesting observation just about the way that, um, this guy speaks. Anyways, watch this. He speaks like this very slowly as if he started his sentence before he knew where he was going with that sentence. We might have to play it like a double speed or something, but then we'll get to the Jesse Morrell clips and it's going to be normal speed because uh, Jesse Morrell has a normal functioning brain, so he talks like a normal person, not this James White guy. Ah, these Calvinists. Anyways, I thought that was a pretty funny observation. He does speak very slowly, like he, he doesn't know where he's going or what he's going to say next. It's just extremely annoying. I guess some people will play him at like a 1.5 speed or a 2 speed. You can change it on YouTube. Uh, but that was just a funny observation. And I want this video to be educational and, and humorous uh, in order to keep your attention. I think it's also funny that Emilio did a video uh, about me. Then James White did a video about that video. Then Chris Fisher did a video about the James White video, about the Emilio video, and now I'm doing a video on all of their videos. So that's pretty funny stuff, uh, this new YouTube generation. Uh, and it was, as I was listening to it over lunch, there were just so many teachable moments, I guess, would be the term we could use. You know, that's exactly what I thought watching James White's video. Lots of teachable moments. And that's what this whole video is all about. So here we go. I literally wrote over 100 pages. And I hope that James White, so-called doctor, is ready to learn. So many things where Jesse says stuff is... He says stuff that's just... Again, that's... In, you know, coincidentally, that's exactly what I think about Calvinism. I can't believe the things that Calvinists get away with saying. James White, in one of his debates, was asked, you know, if, if, a, if a child is raped, it, was that God's will? Uh, was that God's, God's plan? And White says, oh, yes, because otherwise it's just a meaningless uh, act, you know. So White, in his mind, thinks that if if you credit the will of God to all sin, then that gives uh, sin meaning uh, rather than being a meaningless act, and that somehow makes things better. So I just, uh, I can't believe the stuff that these Calvinists are able to get away with saying and doing. Uh, their doctrine is horrible. It's just built on eisegesis. I think, how could anyone actually believe this stuff? The Bible's pretty clear. Jesus tasted death for every man. And they say, oh, James White would say, that's every category of man. He died for Jamaicans. He died for Americans. He died for the Chinese. But it doesn't mean he died for every individual. Uh, you know, for God so loved the world becomes for God so loved the elect. Uh, I can't believe they get away with some of this stuff. Anyways, we'll get to um, we'll get to more of it. It really, really illustrates why we were saying some of the things we were saying just on the last program about the 
decree of God versus the revealed will of God. Um, and what, what happens when you deny that? All right, so in Calvinism, they have, uh, well, they have multiple wills of God. They have the public will of God or the revealed will of God, which is like his commandments. He says, uh, thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not murder. Uh, but then he has his secret will, which if it's a secret, how do these Calvinists know about it? It's a joke. But this secret will is that uh, you should commit adultery and you should murder. His, his secret will is the opposite of his revealed will. He says publicly, I don't want you to commit adultery. But secretly, he wants you to. He told Adam and Eve publicly, don't eat from the tree. But secretly, he wants them to. They would say, otherwise, God's not sovereign. If everything is not God's will, then God is not sovereign. And so everything that happens is God's secret will to happen. Uh, I mean, give me a puke bucket. But they'll, they'll appeal to instances like the atonement. Look, uh, thou shalt not murder is a commandment, and yet it was God's will uh, for them to crucify Christ, or they point to the Assyrians, which you'll see him do later, or Joseph's brothers. They take these instances where God was able to incorporate the sins of men into his plans, which you would expect uh, him to do in his wisdom, but then they fallaciously argue that all sin was God's plan from the beginning. They point to these isolated um, instances in Scripture and then say that's how it is all the time. Anyways, watch. That's what you're going to see. That's what you're going to see him doing. Now the problem is Jesse Morrell is a is a compilation of heresies. He's not. He doesn't have just one heresy. And you know when you think about it, most people don't just have one heresy. Uh, most people are not solid and everything else, and then they just got this one uh, thing. Uh, heresy spreads. It, it, because Christian truth is a whole, once you become imbalanced in one spot, that frequently ends up causing problems elsewhere. All right. If heresy is defined as false teaching, then certainly, I mean, Calvinism is, is, is heresy. It's a compilation of heresy, all five of them. Tulip which is total uh, depravity, and what they mean is total inability, um, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. All of these are the opposite of the truth. It's not total depravity, it is free will. It is not unconditional election, it's conditional salvation. It's not limited atonement, it's unlimited atonement. Jesus died for all. It's not um, irresistible grace, it's resistible grace. You do always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. It's not perseverance of the saints, it's he that endures unto the end shall be saved. It's, it's conditional security. And so Calvinism is literally the opposite of the truth. You come to the Bible and the Bible says, be holy. Calvinism says, you can't. You have to sin every day. You come to the Bible and the Bible says, God doesn't want you to sin. Calvinism says, oh no, but he secretly does. The Bible says Jesus died for everyone and they say, oh no, not for everyone. And so it's a counterfeit um, religion. It's a cult. It's a counterfeit gospel. It's, it's make-believe. It's demonic. Um, but that's... He says, I'm a compilation of heresy. That's exactly what Calvinism is. He's projecting. Anyways, and yeah, uh, you know, it's systematic. Uh, it's not, he, Calvinism's not just wrong in one point. Calvinism is wrong all across the board. It's a systematic error, uh, systematic heresy. One point logically leads to the other because their premise is wrong. If it's true that man is totally depraved in the sense of totally unable, to obey God, unable to repent, then all the other points of Calvinism logically follow. Man then has to be unconditionally elected, and if unconditionally elected, then Jesus would have only died for them, and then you would have irresistible grace, and then you would have perseverance of the saints. It all logically follows um, upon their false premise that, uh, that man does not have a free will ability to repent and to do good and to turn to God. And so what you see in morale is a, is a consistently man-centered perspective. All right. Man-centered. I keep thinking, uh, you'll see he uses that word a lot, and I don't think he really knows what it means. Um, man-centered. Calvinism literally starts with man. 
tulip. Man is totally depraved. That's where Calvinism starts with man. And uh, then everything follows from that conclusion. So Calvinism is literally a man-centered theology. It all hinges upon man's total inability. It starts with man and not God. Only after they start with man, that man is man's just too pathetic and too incapable, uh, then they say, therefore, God uh, has to unconditionally elect. So God only follows after they start with man. In um, So it's a man-centered Man has no free will. Uh, Calvinism has it backwards. Uh, they think that if men need to do something to be saved, that that's man-centered. They think that God-centered theology would say God does everything. But in reality, a man-centered theology is when God does everything for man. You have man in the center and God is the one serving the man. Man does nothing. God does everything. God repents for you, he believes for you, he, he does everything for you, and so that's what Calvinism has, a man-centered theology where man does nothing, God does everything for man. Uh, a, a, man uh, a God-centered theology would have God in the middle where man is the one serving God. So they, they have it backwards. They think if you have to do something to be saved, that's man-centered. No, no, no. If you're the one serving God, then that's God-centered. If God is the one serving you, which, I mean, to a degree, God does uh, condescend and uh, he provided his son, but that's, uh, I mean, the, the, the emphasis of Christianity is that you deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow him. Um, God is an example of self-denial and benevolence, and we're supposed to follow in that example so that we're, we're focused on others. God is focused on uh, others. He's not a selfish being. Um, of course, he does uh, regard himself as supreme as he ought to, and he uh, loves himself as supreme as he ought to, um, but not to the exclusion or to the neglect of man. Um, anyways, in a God-centered theology, man's the one who has to do things for God. And in a, God is the center and man is the one who is serving God. Calvinism has a man-centered theology because they have man at the center and God is the one doing all the work for man. It's also a sin-accommodating theology. That's what Calvinism really is. It doesn't require you to repent of all your sin. It doesn't require you to stop sinning in this life or, you know, you just wait until you die and God will give you a glorified body and then, uh, and then you'll never be able to sin again. Um, that's another issue. Boy, I could go off on that. Um, a glorification is physical, not moral. Sanctification is moral, not physical. You need a, a new heart in this life or else you'll never make it to heaven. Glorification is not when a sinner becomes a saint. Glorification is when a saint gets an immortal body. Um, anyways, James White will keep using this expression, man-centered. I don't think he really knows what it means. If it means, if man-centered means, oh, man has to do something to be saved, well, then the gospel would be considered man-centered because the gospel says, you know, repent and believe. Uh, the gospel says, re you know, repent and uh, go and sin no more. The Bible says all sorts of things that man needs to do. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Uh, all these things would be classified as man-centered. Um, God said, I set before you life and death. Choose life. Uh, really, I mean, James White would be accusing God of being man-centered. Look, God is commanding men to do something. The prophets and the apostles all called men to repent and to believe. So Calvinism would say, oh, well, that's man-centered. Anyways, here's a, here's a clip again from uh, my friend Chris Fisher. I thought it was interesting. Consistently man-centered perspective that takes him outside. Again, look at his. So uh, James White is arrogantly stating that Jesse Morrell is man centered. I don't think Jesse Morrell is. Jesse Morrell, literally, what he does is he drives campus to campus. He endears the most vile, vicious things from college students. He's assaulted daily, uh, and maybe not daily, but weekly. Uh, there's a lot of videos of people hitting him, punching him, destroying his stuff. He, he suffers all of this out of love. He's not doing it for himself. He's doing it to spread the gospel. This is this is like the one guy that you could pick that is like truly, truly like I spend a lot of time like playing video games and, and watching movies and stuff like that. So it's not like I dedicate my life to the extent that Jesse Morrell does 
to God, this is the like the least man centered dude out there. And uh, and James White's like this guy, this guy, he's all about himself. It's all man centered. You're the man centered person, Mister Alpha and Mega Ministries. You're the man centered one. It's projection. These lunatic leftists, SJWs, back to the SJW podcast, they project. They accuse other people of what they themselves do. All right. Well, so Calvinism is twisted and perverted thinking from religious sinners. They always have it backwards. And what they say is almost always the opposite of the truth. Their whole theology is man-centered, properly defined. God does everything for you. You do nothing. Um, there you go. That takes him outside the realms of the realm of orthodoxy, way outside the realm of orthodoxy, as he, of course, says about us, too. All right. Calvinism is heresy, no doubt. And I've been studying it for 19 years now. I'm very confident in saying Calvinism is heresy. Calvinism is a cult. Uh, Calvinism is counterfeit Christianity. Um, now, if heresy uh, is defined as just what is commonly accepted, which is actually what heresy uh, or, or a deviation from what is commonly accepted. Orthodoxy is what is commonly accepted. So if heresy just means what, you know, deviating from what is commonly accepted, uh, which would be orthodoxy, then it just becomes like a matter of what, popular vote? Uh, it becomes a matter of, uh, of, of how many people can agree with you. Um, is Calvinists the majority in mainstream Christianity? Are the Calvinists the majority there? Uh, no, they're not. So, by definition, that would make Calvinism heretical because uh, Calvinism is not the, the primary mainstream branch of Christianity. They are a smaller minority. Um, do most Christians think, like James White does, uh, that all acts of sin were predestined by God? No, most Christians don't believe that. So, by definition, that would make James White a heretic because he's deviating from what is commonly accepted. Most Christians believe in free will. Uh, James White denies free will. Uh, that would make James White a heretic. And by free will, I mean the power of contrary choice, that when you sinned, you could have chosen not to sin. Uh, his views do not conform to the majority of the mainstream, which is how you would classically define orthodoxy. So, I mean, really, everyone's a heretic, according to different religious groups. The Calvinists would call the Catholics heretics. The Catholics would call the Calvinists heretics. In Acts 24, 14, Paul said, But this I confessed unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I God of my fathers, and believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. So uh, James White calls me a heretic, but uh, here people called the Apostle Paul a heretic. Uh, that's just how it is. Ask the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, what they think of Calvinism, and they'll tell you that's not orthodoxy. It's a matter of perspective. Calvinists love to classify what's heresy and what's not, what's orthodoxy and what's not. They're, they're always using that uh, terminology, but properly defined, Calvinism falls outside of orthodoxy altogether. It's really just a matter of perspective. Uh, James White James White must think himself the Pope of Calvinism, that he can declare uh, his views as orthodox and all opposing views as unorthodox. So White thinks he has the power of papal decree. No joke. Calvinism is Gnosticism. Gnosticism denied free will. Gnostics taught that nature was evil. Gnostics said that the flesh was sinful. Gnostics said you can't stop sinning until you die. Calvinism is modern-day Gnosticism. It's the spirit of Antichrist that was spoken of in 1 John. Uh, these Gnostics will twist and pervert the scriptures, especially the writings of Paul, and that's exactly what Peter warned the Gnostics would do. And, uh, you know, they call it Pauline theology. Uh, they think that Paul was like, they, they, they think it, was, it goes from Paul to Augustine to Luther and Calvin, like they're all in the same branch, but that's because they twist the writings of Paul with their Gnostic heresies. So they want everyone to call them brothers, but they call everyone else heretics. I mean, White will call the Arminians brothers, but, but he's, uh, he's the more moderate. He's not consistent. The consistent Calvinists, the more hardcore Calvinists, 
will call everyone but Calvinism, um, everyone but Calvinist heretics. Because like Charles Spurgeon said, oh, Calvinism is the gospel. That's what they said. Calvinism is the gospel. So if Calvinism is the gospel, then uh, if you don't believe in Calvinism, you don't believe the gospel. That's their view. Of course, Calvinism's not the gospel. That's why they don't preach Calvinism on the streets. Go out onto the streets and tell sinners, God predestined you to sin. Go out to the streets and tell them Jesus only died for some people. And uh, you're not going to preach that on the streets because it's not going to convert anybody because it's not the gospel. Calvinism's not the gospel. Anyways, uh, it goes from not the real history of Calvinism historically is Gnosticism to Manichaeanism to Augustinianism to Lutheranism to Calvinism. Calvinism is not Orthodox Christianity. Augustine borrowed these ideas from Manichaeanism, which was a branch of Gnosticism. He brought it into the church because, well, Augustine was a, was a Manichaean Gnostic for nine years. And that's where the denial of free will originated from. And that's the very first basis of, uh, of Calvinism. The first point of tulip is the denial of free will. So it's a counterfeit Christianity. It's a counterfeit gospel. So yeah, he, he, he says, I'm unorthodox. I say he's unorthodox. Um, but if you look at the facts of Christian history, uh, Calvinism is, is a heresy. Um, but you end up, you know, how many times have I said it? Who is a consistent Arminian? An open theist. So he's an open theist. All right, here's a point I can agree with. Uh, free will and open theism are one and the same thing. If we have a free will, then the future has open possibilities. If there's open possibilities, we have a free will. To teach free will and yet not see the future as having open possibilities would be a contradiction, a total contradiction. And if the future has open possibilities, then God must foreknow the future as such. Uh, so God's foreknowledge of the future would include all of the various possibilities and alternatives that free will has. All right, so who's a, who's a, a you know, consistent Arminian? An open theist, if you really are going to be consistent with free will. Now, who's a consistent Calvinist? The, uh, the hyper-Calvinist. The hyper-Calvinists are the ones who say that prayer and evangelism can't change anything because everything's already fixed. Everything's already predetermined. So whether you pray or not will not change the future. Whether you evangelize or not will not change the future. So evangelism and prayer um, end up becoming viewed as almost meaningless and the urgency is sucked out of them. At most they say, well, those are the means that God ordained for the end. Um, but the fact still remains that whether you do it or not will not change the future. And whether you do it or not was also predestined. So if you don't pray, it's because God predestined you not to. And if you don't evangelize, God predestined you not to. And it's not going to change the future that God predestined. So hyper-Calvinists are the consistent Calvinists. There's no urgency for prayer. If everything's already been predetermined, why pray for anything? And they have no urgency for evangelism. Because if you're diligent in evangelism or negligent in evangelism, that will not increase or decrease the number of the elect or the number of the reprobate. If you're urgent in it, in evangelism, you're not going to increase the number of the elect. You're not going to decrease the number of the damned. If you're negligent in evangelism, you're not going to increase the number of the damned and you're not going to decrease the number of the elect. So there's no point in Calvinism to be urgent for evangelism or for prayer. Uh, as a street preacher with a heart for the lost, uh, I find Calvinism, consistent Calvinism, hyper-Calvinism, really any form of Calvinism is just unacceptable. The logical conclusion of Calvinism is you don't have to worry about souls. The elect can't help but to be saved. The damned can't help but to be damned. Being diligent or zealous will make no difference as to the number of the saved or to the number of the damned. That number is eternally fixed and it can't be changed by anything you do. Um, salvation is a change of the future and that makes salvation open theism. Open theism just says the future can be changed. That it's not predetermined and fixed, at least not unchangeably predetermined or unchangeably fixed. Open theism and consistent Calvinism are polar opposites. So I rejoice that most Calvinists are inconsistent with their theology. You know, like men like George Whitfield, who would actually weep for the lost. Uh, true Calvinism gives no reason 
to weep over people because, well, everything is God's perfect will. Everything tends to his glory. So there's no point to weep over anything. He's a Pelagian. All right, he's a Pelagian. Here's the Pelagian boogeyman. If someone believes in free will, if someone believes you can avoid sin, if somebody rejects, uh, you know, infant damnation and this whole uh, you uh, inherit sin uh, business, oh, he's a Pelagian. Uh, Calvinists are incapable of talking about me without this slander that, oh, he's a Pelagian. It's, a, it's just a Pelagian boogeyman. I'm not a Pelagian. I've never called myself a Pelagian. I don't identify as a Pelagian. I think poor Pelagius has been mistreated. That poor Pelagius um, was the first Christian persecuted by the Catholic Church uh, under Augustine. Augustine gave birth, ironically, to the Catholic Church, and uh, Augustine gave birth to the Reformation. It's interesting. He just is a total heretic who just ruined, uh, uh, you know, this history. Um, but. But Pelagius was, a, was a, a godly man who taught free will. He rejected the idea that you're, you, know, you just inherit sin like some type of disease. And um, even Augustine at one point said that you know, Pelagius was a holy man. And so I defend Pelagius against the straw men attacks people have against him. But that doesn't make me a Pelagian. Um, I have points of agreement with the Pelagians. That doesn't mean that I'm a Pelagian. I don't condemn them as heretics, but again, that doesn't mean that I'm a Pelagian. That would be a fallacy and slander. Because James White has points of agreements with the Arminians. He will even defend the classical Arminians as brothers. Uh, and he won't call Arminians heretics. But it would be false to say that James White is an Arminian. Uh, it would be... Um, a slander to call him one. And so I certainly deny that nature is evil. I affirm that uh, man has free will, and that's typically what is being classified as Pelagianism. But here's the thing. All of the early church fathers taught this long before Pelagius ever existed. Can you imagine that? Pelagianism existing before Pelagius did. I mean, how can that be? Well, maybe it's because it's not Pelagianism to teach free will. It's not Pelagianism to deny this Gnostic idea that the flesh is sinful, that nature is evil. That's just early Christianity, which Pelagius actually was familiar with and Augustine was not. Pelagius was familiar with the early church fathers. Augustine was not. Pelagius read the Greek New Testament and uh, Augustine did not. And it was because Pelagius read the Greek that uh, he was familiar with the early church fathers and Augustine was not. Augustine was familiar with the Gnostics, with the Manichaeans, that said nature was evil, that said man had no free will. And so while Pelagius was influenced by the thoughts of early Christianity, Augustine was influenced by the thoughts of early Gnosticism. Pelagius, or the Pelagians taught that the Bible was inspired by God. They also taught the Trinity. But it wouldn't be um, accurate to say everyone that believes in the Trinity is a Pelagian or everyone who believes the Bible is inspired is a Pelagian. That's uh, a fallacy. And also, the Pelagians taught free will, but not everyone who believes in free will is a Pelagian. The Pelagians denied that human nature was inherently sinful, but that doesn't mean everyone who denies human nature is inherently sinful is a Pelagian. The early church fathers before Augustine existed taught that. So if they want to call us Pelagians, fine. Let them call us Pelagians. And we're just going to call them Gnostics. And while theirs is a slander, ours is not. Um, James White is a Gnostic, a modern-day Gnostic. They just don't call it Gnosticism anymore. Even a man like John Wesley was accused of being a Pelagian. And uh, John Wesley defended Pelagius. He said, Verily, I verily believe the real heresy of Pelagius was neither more nor less than this. The holding that Christians may, by the grace of God and not without it, for that I take as a mere slander, go on to perfection. Or in other words, fulfill the law of Christ. Who was Pelagius? By all I can pick up from ancient authors, I guess he was both a wise and a holy man. Now, the fact is, not even Pelagius was a Pelagian. Uh, Pelagianism, as it's defined today, is hearsay, uh, not heresy. 
Here's what John Wesley said. Oh, Augustine himself, a wonderful saint, as full of pride, passion, bitterness, censorshipness, and a foul mouth to all that contradicted him. When Augustine's passions were heated, his word was not worth as rush, worth a rush. And here is the secret. St. Augustine was angry at Pelagius. Hence, he slandered and abused him, as his manner was, without either fear or shame. And as St. Augustine was then, in the Christian world, what Aristotle was afterwards, there need no other proof of any assertion than ipso dixit, St. Augustine said it. See, Augustine said, oh, the Pelagians believe that um, you can obey God by free will without the help of grace. That Pelagians denied the need of grace. But this is what the Pelagians said. We, the Pelagians, maintain that men are the work of God and that no one is forced unwillingly by his power either into evil or good, but that men does either good or ill of his own will, but that in a good work he is always assisted by God's grace, while in an evil, he is incited by the suggestions of the devil. Uh, Pelagius himself said, I anathemize the man who either thinks or says that the grace of God, whereby Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, is not necessary, not only for every hour or for every moment, but also for every act of our lives. And those who endeavor to disannul it deserve everlasting punishment. Pelagius said, God always aids by the help of his grace. God aids us by his doctrine and revelation while he opens the eyes of our heart, while he shows us the future, that he may not be engrossed, or that we might not be engrossed with the present, while he discloses the snares of the devil, while he illuminates us by the multiform and inevitable gift of heavenly grace. Does he who say this appear to you to deny grace, or does he appear to confess both divine grace and free will of, and the free will of man. So here's the thing. It was actually Augustine's view of grace that was inconsistent with free will, not Pelagius. Augustine said, I have tried hard to maintain the free choice of the human will, but the grace of God prevailed. See, Pelagius affirmed both free will and the necessity of grace, but Augustine denied free will because of his mistaken view of grace. So in that sense, it was Augustine who was a Pelagian. Since it was Augustine who said grace is not necessary if we have a free will. That's not what Pelagius said. That's what Augustine said. So Calvinists like say John Owen, who basically said the same thing, uh, that if we have a free will, there's no need of grace. And uh, that means that it's really the Calvinists who are the Pelagians, according to the definition of what they call Pelagianism, the, the teaching that grace is not necessary if we have a free will. That's, the, that's Calvinism. Um, the Calvinists believe in free, or the, the Pelagians believe in free will and grace. So anyways, that's not Pelagius, it's a straw man, and uh, poor Pelagius has been the victim of their straw man attack, attacks for thousands of years. I know all too well how these Calvinists operate with their straw men, and so I w immediately recognize that's what Augustine was doing with poor Pelagius, just uh, creating a caricature and uh, um, exaggerating his position way out of proportion just for the sake of debate. Uh, he denies original sin. Oh, so James White says, I deny original sin. Look, I reject the doctrine of infant damnation. Because the Bible says God's not willing that any of these little ones should perish. And the children being in the womb, having not yet done any good or evil. Romans 9, 11. Calvinists love Romans 9, but Romans 9, 11 says the children in the womb haven't yet done any evil. And so uh, modern Calvinists might say, oh, we don't believe in infant damnation either. Fine. But infant damnation is really the, uh, is the historical doctrine of original sin. But Calvinists, really, the only damnation that they believe in is infant damnation. They believe that you're all born condemned, that you don't become condemned because of your personal sins, that you're born condemned because of Adam's original sin. Um, 
I've heard Calvinists like Piper say, well, the infants who die in their infancy are elect, but they're somehow saved by grace. But that would be a denial of uh, justification by faith. So Calvinists can be inconsistent on this because they inherently know that infant damnation is unjust and cruel. But they believe that we are born sinners and as sinners condemned. And uh, that's how they, so really infant damnation is the only damnation Calvinists believe in. Uh, the consistent view would be that babies are innocent, uh, which the Bible actually calls them innocent blood when they would sacrifice their babies to uh, Baal, and that they have no sin to go to hell for. Because uh, Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. The Bible says, to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. The Bible says before the child knows to refuse the evil and to choose the good and that they have no knowledge of good and evil. And so since babies are blind, morally speaking, they have no sin to go to hell for. Uh, but Calvinists like James White uh, also rejects the doctrine of original sin as defined by Augustine unless James White believes that sexual desire is a sinful nature inherited from Adam. And that sexual desire is the curse that was God put upon human nature because of Adam's sin. Uh, so does White believe that sex was transmitted or that sex is what transmits sin from parent to child because sexual desire is itself sinful and that human nature is sinful because it inherits sexual desire? Because that's the quote-unquote, historic, orthodox doctrine of original sin as taught and defended by Augustine. See, Augustine's view of sex, uh, which is really his view of original sin, is just straight Manichaeanism. It's Gnosticism. The Gnostics believed that sex was sinful, and that the whole body was sinful. So God created human nature with sexual desires, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. And the Pelagians rightfully mocked Augustine, saying, well, how are they going to be fruitful and multiply without sexual desire? Were they just supposed to shake the babies out of the trees? I think it was Julian of, of Eclanum who mocked Augustine on that point. If White believes that sexual desire was ordained by God, then White agrees with the Pelagians on this matter. So I've never met a modern Calvinist who didn't deny the historic doctrine of original sin. Even White teaches this novel doctrine of federal headship, which is not the historical doctrine of original sin at all. It's actually only about 150 years old. Uh, Traducianism, or what they call seminal, seminal identity, um, is, is the original doctrine of original sin, um, which White denies. Uh, we'll get into the, those issues later, but White needs to study uh, theological history a little bit better. He's going to accuse me of denying original sin. Um, the doctrine of original sin is the doctrine of infant damnation, the doctrine of uh, sex being sinful of human nature, having uh, sin because it has sexual desire. Um, I've never met a Calvinist who actually, a modern day Calvinist who would um, admit all of those points. And he's a sinless perfectionist. A sinless perfectionist. I don't use that term. I don't call it that. I never have because, uh, well, sinless perfection is a derogatory term, a term used only by Calvinists to speak disparagingly of holiness. Um, just like I never identify as a Pelagian, I've never identified as a sinless perfectionist. Those are just Calvinist labels, Calvinist slander, Calvinist misrepresentations. Uh, to the contrary, I've actually written articles against sinless perfection. Uh, sinless perfection, I said, is a heresy that says it's impossible for a true Christian to sin. That if you sin, it means you were never truly saved to begin with. This is heresy. The Bible says it's possible for a believer to sin, and it's possible for a believer not to sin in 1 John 2, 1. And at the moment of temptation, we have a choice to sin or not, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Now, it is possible for a believer to sin and even depart from the faith, the Bible warns. See, sinless perfectionists deny that you can lose your salvation. They say it's impossible for you to backslide. It's impossible for you to lose your salvation. Uh, the, I, I've always taught that we have a free will, that we can sin or not, that we can fall away from God or not. So inherently, that is not sinless perfectionism. Now, to my shame, I have sinned as a believer, 
which means I deliberately disobeyed God. I didn't have to do it, but I did it, and I shouldn't have done it. And the Lord chastened me, and I quickly repented, lest I perish with the world, as the Bible says. Now, a false convert is someone who lives in sin. They practice sin. They sin every day. They never stop. A true convert is someone who habitually obeys God, habitually practicing righteousness. If sin occurs, it should be the exception and not the rule. Now, I'm often falsely accused of teaching sinless perfection, but it's slander. I don't believe it's impossible for a believer to sin. I simply believe that it's possible not to sin. That at the moment of temptation, you have a choice to say yes or no, and that you can overcome sin by faith, and that Christians habitually, true Christians, habitually overcome temptation. Uh, I've never believed in sinless perfection. I've never defined it, uh, or as I've defined it here, I've never used the term sinless perfection to describe my doctrine of holiness. It's not part of my vocabulary. See, biblical terms would be like holy, sanctified, new creature, born again. Um, these are biblical terms. Uh, holy, sanctified, free from sin. The Bible doesn't use the term sinless perfection. Calvinists have a whole vocabulary of unbiblical terms and cliches. You know, God is sovereign or uh, progressive sanctification or sinless perfection. Um, just original sin. You know, they have a whole vocabulary of unbiblical terms. Anyways, sinless perfection denies free will. It denies conditional security that believers can lose their salvation by sinning, by not repenting. I've always believed in free will. I've always believed in conditional security. Um, in fact, I remember Mark Spence with uh, Ray Comfort's ministry. He came up to me once on the street and he said, what's the greatest misconception people have of sinless perfection? I said, you know, I really don't know. Uh, I don't believe in sinless perfection, but I do believe at the moment of temptation, you can say yes or no to sin. He said, oh, well, well, I think even John MacArthur would agree with that. I don't know. I don't think so. Saying that you have a choice to sin or not is free will. Saying you have a choice to sin or not at the moment of temptation, well, that's open theism. That's open future. Uh, Calvinism says you have no choice. Uh, God predestined the outcome. There's no options, no alternatives, no possibilities. You can only do what God predestined you to do. And in Calvinism, God secretly predestined you to sin every day. So it's actually Calvinism that teaches sinless perfection because uh, Calvinists teach that when you die, God will give you a glorified body and you cannot sin anymore. Once you get to heaven, sin is impossible. Uh, Calvinism says that you can attain a state of sinless perfection after you die. Uh, that's a denial of free will. The reason God gave us free will in the first place is the reason God doesn't violate our free will in salvation. It's the reason he doesn't violate free will when we get to heaven. Heaven will be full of people who refuse to sin. Heaven will be full of people who choose to love God. And that's what he wanted from the beginning. That's why he lets us go through this life of probation um, so we can form our own character. To, uh, to become saints or to be sinners, to choose our path. And uh, those who choose to be sinners will go to hell, and those who choose to be saints will be fit for heaven, not earn heaven, not merit heaven, but to be fit for the kingdom of God. But Calvinists think that your current body is necessitating you to be sinful, and so a glorified body will necessitate you to be holy. Like R.C. Sproul said, you, uh, you can't stop sinning until you die and get a glorified body. It's straight Gnosticism. Gnostics say the body is sinful, and so you can't stop sinning until you get a new body. But they think once you get to heaven, it's impossible to sin. And that's false, because the devil sinned in heaven. Satan sinned in heaven. You can sin in heaven. It's just people who get there are saints who refuse to sin while they're on earth. So, of course, they're going to refuse to sin when they're in heaven. And uh, Adam and Eve both sinned with a perfect body. The idea that you can't sin in heaven is false. The idea that you can't sin with a perfect body is false. Adam and Eve sinned with a perfect body. Jesus was sinless even before he had a glorified body. He said on the third day he'll be perfected. He didn't get a glorified body until he rose from the dead. Um, so Jesus, with a body that was corrupted like ours, uh, capable of death and decay like ours, and yet he was sinless because moral character doesn't come from your body. Moral character comes from your choice. 
character is not a substance, a physical substance. So Calvinists have a Gnostic view of the body. Uh, they're the ones that actually teach sinless perfection is attainable when you die and go to heaven. I simply say that you have a free will to say yes or no to sin, yes or no to temptation, and that the Bible says uh, Christians habitually overcome sin. And that's what the Bible says. You have a choice. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 1 John 2, 1. Uh, I'm not a sinless perfectionist. When they resort to these slanderous arguments, um, they're just, they're just uh, being unjust. Just like, you know, Augustine was to poor Pelagius. You know, how many times have I said it? Who is a consistent Arminian? An open theist. So he's an open theist. He's a Pelagian. Uh, he denies original sin. <laughs> oh, oh, he denies original sin? And he's a Pelagian? Oh, no. Oh, me, oh, my. That's, that's so terrible. And he's a sinless perfectionist. Oh, oh, he teaches people that they... Don't have to sin? Ah, oh, that is the worst heresy in the world. Someone preaching against sin, telling people not to sin, people telling other people that they could choose not to. Oh, it, it hurts my heart. It's why, oh, it's so heretical. You got to teach people that they're utterly depraved and they're sinning all the time. And, uh, you know, there's nothing they could do to change their sinfulness. Oh, man, which... Jesse Burrell is literally emulating Jesus's ministry. John the Baptist is going around too, saying, you know what? The end times are close. Repent. Uh, do good works. Do works worthy of uh, repentance. Uh, Jesus says, be perfect like the Father. Uh, so Jesse Burrell is literally preaching the same things that Jesus was. And then uh, James White's criticizing him. This is the delicious thing about Calvinism. It is so alien and foreign to the Bible that they'll sit up there and they will have polemical speeches against Jesus's ministry. Oh, it's gross. It's gross. Every one of those, when you think about it, is so much derived from man-centered <laughs> thoughts. Never centered on his... <laughs> Last time I, I checked, uh, first of all, we're made in the image of God. And second of all, Jesus's ministry, his gospel to people was pretty man-centric. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's pretty man-centric. He's telling people what to do so that they could enter the kingdom of God. And besides all that, besides all that, your criticisms of Jesse Burrell are criticisms of Jesus. You're criticizing Jesus. You are criticizing Jesus. You lunatic. You lunatic. You lunatic. You lunatic. I love how Chris Fisher just calls them lunatics. Their their minds are just warped. I think they. I think Calvinists really have a reprobate mind. Um, you know, they teach that God uh, elects uh, some for heaven and reprobates others. I, I, I think that according to real standard uh, from the Bible, the biblical standards, Calvinists have this reprobate mind. They're full of real slanders against the character of God, accusing him of commanding the impossible, of not wanting everyone to repent and be saved, of not sending his son to die for everyone. They have reprobate minds. Every one of those, when you think about it, is so much derived from man-centered thoughts. So again, he, he start, he's accusing me of man-centeredness, of uh, you know Pelagianism, denying original sin, sinless perfection. It's all man-centered, White says. Uh, no, my theology is literally centered on glorifying God. Denying infant damnation uh, glorifies his justice. Uh, teaching that you can live holy and righteous in order to glorify God with your life is glorifying God. Uh, teaching that you, um, or, or my, my theology is, is centered around glorifying God, uh, whereas uh, Calvinism calls it man-centeredness because, well, Calvinism is demonic and satanic. And the devil is the father of lies and he twists and he deceives. Uh, when it it's really, it's all, my whole theology is about serving God, glorifying God, honoring God with your life. And uh, they call this, oh, this is man-centeredness. Um, Calvinism it just is wicked. Never centered on, his thought never starts with God and then informs what we believe about man. It always begins with man and then edits God to fit with the conclusions he's come to with man. Uh, again, that's exactly what tulip does tulip starts with man and uh, has this false 
concept that man lost free will, something Genesis never says, and all of the consequences God declared in Genesis as a result of Adam's original sin, the loss of man's free will was never mentioned even once. In fact, God spoke to Cain as someone who could uh, master and rule over sin. Um, God spoke to Israel after the fall as people who had a choice between um, good and evil and life and death. And so the whole assumption of Calvinism is that free will was lost, and then they everything hinges upon that. Then their whole view of God is, you know, their conclusion based upon their view of man. So now God commands man to do the impossible. Uh, God commands men to do what they, what they cannot do because they started their theology with a false view of man. Um, anyways, he just pulls these accusations out of thin air. Somehow I start my theology with man. Uh, my theology starts with, in the beginning, God created man. So it's God first. And God created man in his image. So we have a free will. And free will is the doctrine that starts with God, not man. Uh, saying that it starts with man and then somehow edits God, it's just another tired, old, straw man argument coming from a Calvinist. Um, God said, I set before you life and death. So he's saying, I set before you life and death. So it, free will doctrine starts with God. God gives us free will. God sets before us life and death. Um, Calvinism is just all hinges on their view of man. It's just, it's just total projection. And so Jesse Morrell is a great example. Hey, that's one part that I can finally agree with. Uh, Jesse Morrell is a great example. But uh, then in typical Calvinist fashion, he goes on and he ruins it. Of what to avoid and why you should avoid it. And so Jesse Morrell is a great example. Yeah, he is a great example. Of what to avoid and why of you should avoid it. what to do. He's a great example of a good human being. A good, decent, great human being. And he reaches so many people. He's got so many followers. He, he, he reaches out to people who wouldn't otherwise hear anything about the Bible or God. And he presents them with new arguments that they've never heard. And these people who reject God because of Calvinism. And you could hear it in Jesse Morrell's back and forth with people at his college campuses. Because he records these and he puts them on the internet for everyone to watch. And you, you could see them. They're, they're wheel spinning when they're presented with a biblical picture of God. You know, it is beautiful. Everyone, everyone should aspire to be like Jesse Morrell. Jesse Morrell is a better guy than I am. Better guy than I am. Well, hey, thank you, Chris, uh, for your very generous and kind words. It's, uh, well, it's, an, it's edifying to my soul because, uh, you know, Calvinists can be so harsh and critical. Anyways, thank you, Chris. Now let's go back to uh, James White. Uh, also known uh, as Captain Criticism. Because what you're, you know, we, we rejoice in the inconsistencies of our brothers uh, in the faith. All right, so James White prefers inconsistent Arminians who are just easy targets that he can tie into knots. Uh, but he doesn't really know what to do with a theology like mine because it's logically consistent. Uh, as you will see, he has a very terrible time trying to critique my theology because he can't find contradictions. And that's the approach of presuppositional apologetics. It's called internal critiques. Uh, I use it all the time. Even Charles Finney used it, internal critiques. Uh, I, you, you, you look at someone's system systematic theology or systematic worldview and you point out systemic contradictions. And I can point out systemic contradictions in Calvinism just all day long, which I'll, I'll do in this video. Uh, but, but he rejoices in the inconsistent Arminians, he says. And we rejoice in the inconsistency that they don't take it to its final conclusion like Jesse Morrell does. He takes it to the final conclusion and in doing so, leaves the 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 orthodox uh realm of orthodoxy and goes right out there and is proud to be an open theist pelagian original sin denying sinless perfectionist um and that comes out very clearly so all right so he wants to play this game let's string it all together the accusations and theological labels game okay fine let's play uh james white is a fatalist, hardcore determinist, infant damnationist, perpetual sinning, sinful imperfectionist, Smirnoff drinking, free will denying, Gnostic, 
heretic. Now the only difference is that my string didn't contain any actual false accusations like, like his did. Uh, so, I mean, I'm scoring some major points here, and James White's still at zero. Uh, so that was a fun little game. I win the string it all together accusation game. We can play that again sometime. So here is um, Emilio uh, has found Jesse Morel. I guess one of the problems here, thankfully, Jesse comes across clearly. His voice does. You can't always hear, hear Emilio because he's he's facing toward Jesse. Jesse's facing toward the camera, so you you hear him a lot better. That's because they were literally shoving their camera in my face. <laughs> uh, they uh, well, they were trying to get an unflattering close up, I suppose. Um, they just got better audio of me. That's fine. It backfired, but. Well, hey, God is sovereign, so God wanted better audio of me than Emilio. That's the will of God. Who are we to complain? But there's something going on uh, with the street preaching around here. Yeah, we were having a street preacher conference. This was not a theological debate conference. There's, there was something going on. Yeah, it was called the National Street Preachers Conference. We're out there preaching the gospel on the street. We're not there to debate theology. Um, and then, you know, here comes Emilio and his uh, motley crew of Calvinists to try and, uh, you know, cause division and start a problem, pick a fight that they wish they didn't. I felt like Jesus, who was uh, trying to call sinners to repentance, and then comes these Pharisees to challenge him and trap him. I mean, I wasn't out there to debate theology at all. I had zero interest in debating Calvinism. Um, uh, and then your man, Emilio, just forced my hand. He came out to pick a fight that he quickly wished he didn't. Uh, it shows the corrupt spirit of Calvinism, that we're out there just to preach the gospel to the lost, to warn the wicked about hell and sin, to call them to repentance, to urge them to believe on Christ, uh, tell them that Jesus died for them. Um, and then here comes Calvinism uh, to try and pick a theology fight right in front of all the sinners. That's not the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit of the Pharisees, uh, who were like the Pharisees who were envious of Christ they were envious of the crowds that Christ had, and they were concerned about their public appearance. And that's precisely what Emilio was concerned about, uh, the crowds and his appearance. And he's just a total Pharisee. So mind you, uh, the Pharisees were religious sinners. They were sinners who thought they were saved based on different technicalities while they remained sinful. And that's exactly what a Calvinist is. You ready to go? All right, here we go. Here's Emilio and Jesse Morrell. He said, hey, there's this preacher that comes out. What should I ask him? I said, ask him if homosexuality is God's plan. So I'm, I may have to interpret some of this. Ask, ask them, so he's talking about asking Emilio, if homosexuality is God's plan. So immediately, from the start, what you're going to see illustrated over and over and over and over and over again is the absolute confusion and overthrow of biblical categories of faith that comes from a not not a failure to recognize but an unwillingness to recognize the absolutely biblically mandated difference between God's will as expressed prescriptively in his law God reveals this is, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's found in God's law. It's found in the moral fabric of how he has created. That's his prescriptive will. But that does not exhaust the God of the Bible. And if you say it does, you end up destroying the Bible. All right, look, Calvinists are dishonest. He's giving this long-winded answer, beating around the bush. Just to a simple question, all I asked, is homosexuality God's plan? Is abortion God's plan? Just hurry up and come out with it. I mean, admit it. Calvinism says homosexuality is God's secret plan. Abortion is God's secret plan. Just own it. You know, Calvinists try to pretty up their horrible doctrine with long-winded answers. And uh, he is saying that you have to make a distinction between God's commandments or his descriptive will and God's sovereign secret will. But listen, blasphemy by any other name is just as putrid and horrid 
They imagine that God has these decrees that are separate from his commands, but, I mean, his commands are his decrees. Um, they imagine that God commands one thing, but then secretly wills another. But it's this distinction that makes the matter worse. It doesn't solve the problem. It is the problem. He's acting like I don't know the distinction that they make. When I said, is homosexuality God's plan, I knew that Calvinists classified it as his secret plan, as his secret will, but that's besides the point. The point is that they believe homosexuality is God's secret plan. They believe abortion is God's secret plan. So they charge God with insincerity and duplicity, publicly commanding one thing, but secretly declare, uh, decreeing the opposite. It says God told Adam and Eve not to sin, and he gave the public impression that he didn't want them to sin, but then they claim that he secretly wanted them to sin and decreed that they would sin so that they couldn't avoid it. I mean, this is the God you serve, James White? I mean, you can't trust anything that he says. How do you know that Jesus is the only way if that might just be what God publicly says? Maybe God publicly says Jesus is the only way, but secretly, everything is, his, everything is the way. Every religion leads to him. If, if God doesn't mean what he publicly says, you can't trust anything that he says. So the text says, which I'm going to quote, it's when it comes to child sacrifice, neither came it into my mind, God says, that they would sacrifice their children. Neither came it into my mind. So that excludes, he says, I commanded not, neither came it into my mind. So that excludes what they would call his revealed will, which is or his commandments, and his secret will, which would be the purposes of his mind. He says, I commanded it not, neither came it into my mind that they would do such a thing. So God completely exonerates himself from any responsibility. He completely separates himself from child sacrifice, that it by no means originated in his mind, but that's the very thing Calvinism accuses him of. Um, Calvinism literally says that sin was God's idea from eternity. This is what they say in their Westminster Catechism. God from eternity did by his most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever cometh to pass. So in other words, sin was God's idea and it's unchangeable. You can't avoid anything that happens. You know, Q sera sera, whatever shall be, shall be. So sin originated in God's eternal plan uh, before any sinner ever existed, before a sinner ever thought of it, God thought of it. Uh, he could have decreed a sinless universe, but he decreed a sinful one instead. Because the God of Calvinism prefers sin over holiness in every instance that sin occurs. If you sin today, if you, let's say, um, let's say you're married, and uh, let's say you're a woman, and your husband commits adultery on you today. That was God's will for your husband to do today. His secret will. And uh, God could have decreed for your husband to be faithful, but he decreed for him to commit adultery instead. So in that case, God prefers sin over holiness. God preferred adultery over uh, faithfulness. And that's the God of Calvinism. So in Calvinism, every sin happens because it was God's idea originating in his mind from eternity past, though they, they think calling it his secret will somehow makes it better. That doesn't solve the problem, James. That is the problem. You end up standing on your head trying to explain how God commanded Abraham to offer Isaac. Okay, first, God stopped Abraham from offering up Isaac because it wasn't God's will for him to sacrifice his son. Second, I mean, notice how James is jumping around from, I just asked, is homosexuality God's plan? And then Emilio is going to bring up the atonement, which is him jumping around. And now here, James White's jumping around to Abraham sacrificing his son. And then he's going to get on to the Assyrians. When all I asked was one simple question, is homosexuality God's plan? Is abortion God's plan? Just stick to the topic. Just say yes or no. Just own it. Just hurry up and tell everybody that you think homosexuality in every instance of it occurring is God's secret will. 
every time a baby is aborted, that was God's sovereign will. Just, just tell the world what you think. So they think, just like God commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, they think God is secretly commanding people uh, or decreeing people to have abortions. I mean, just that's what they believe. That's what they're trying to say. And it's totally fallacious. It, the logic doesn't follow. Uh, it's, it's what they believe, but it's not logical. Just because God told Abraham to sacrifice his son on the mountain does not mean God is decreeing all of these women to abort a million and a half babies a year. I mean, that's the point James Watt is making right now. You stand on your head trying to explain the cross. You end up doing what this guy's going to do. And that is, Emilio keeps asking him, what about Acts 4? Predestined by God's purpose. Not, oh, well, God can make good come out of evil. Those are not the same things. Those are not the same things. You try to make them the same things, you're lying. And that's what Jesse Morrell has to do. All right, look. Saying that God incorporates into his predetermined plans the free will choices and free will sins of men, it's not lying. I mean, White here reveals that he thinks anytime God predetermines anything to be done, that he must be overriding their free will in order to do so, which would actually make God less than a man, uh, because we ourselves predetermine things to happen all the time that involve the free wills of others. He says that it's lying to say that it's the same thing, as if God cannot incorporate into his plans the future free will choices of men. Okay, I mean, look, I, all the time, I go, like I go to campus to preach, and I know that they're going to heckle me, but I can incorporate that into my plan to draw a crowd, knowing that an atheist might heckle me, and I'm going to use that to draw a crowd. That doesn't mean I'm causing the heckler to do that, it doesn't mean that I'm overriding his free will. It just means that in my wisdom, I know what he's going to do and I can turn it around for good. Now, God knew that they were going to crucify Christ. In fact, Christ knew that they were going to hate us. If we preach as we ought to, the world will also hate us. But that doesn't mean that God is causing that to happen. It, just because he incorporated their sinful choices into his plans does not logically mean that he caused it to happen or that all sin was God's plan from the beginning. So again, I asked one, so far in this video that he's responding to, I asked one simple question. Is homosexuality God's plan? Is abortion God's plan? And they're just jumping around from, oh, the Assyrians and Abraham and, uh, and the atonement. Just answer the question. So he, he's just kind of dodging the point. I asked a question, is homosexuality God's plan? He's not giving a straightforward answer. Instead of giving a simple answer, like yes or no, he's just jumping around. Now, regarding the atonement, it says in Acts 4.28, it says, To do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Notice this verse doesn't say anything about unconditionally or irresistibly decreed from eternity. So you have to have Calvinist glasses on to read that into the text. When they read that, they read God decreed from eternity that this would happen unconditionally. It, it doesn't, it doesn't hap, hap, happen that way. All, all throughout our lives, we are anticipating the choices of others and planning our future accordingly. And God can do the same. Um, you plan to go to college to get a degree. Well, how can you plan to go to college and get a degree if you're not controlling the free will of that professor who's supposed to teach you? Well, you just anticipate that that professor, by his own free will, is going to be teaching the course. So you plan to go to college and get a degree incorporating the free will choice of another. God can do the same thing with planning his future or the future of his son to incorporate and anticipate the free will choices of men. So just because it says they did what God de uh, determined before to be done, does not mean you have to add all of this unconditional, irresistible, decreed from eternity uh, concept into that verse. That would be eisegesis. Again, Calvinists think that if God plans the future, then the people involved in his plan must have no free will uh, to act freely or to do otherwise, but that's false. We have, uh, we plan the future all our time, uh, incorporating the choices of others. We plan to go buy food at the grocery store. 
Well, that involves the will of those who deliver the food to the grocery store and the will of the clerk who's stocking the shelves and the cashier who's checking you out. And that's amazing. So you can plan your future to buy food at the grocery store, which involves the wills of other people, and yet you yourself are not causing or controlling their will. So Calvinists say God can't do that? Was there any shortage of people who hated the truth? who hated Jesus, who were willing to crucify him, so God had to make sure that he caused it to happen? No. Calvinists make God out to be less than a man. See, they, they claim as an open theist that we make God a man, but they, as these hardcore determinists, are making God less than a man, saying that he can't do what we ourselves do, and that's plan the future in such a way as to include the free will choices of others into our plans. Every seminary in the country is planning and promising future classes to students who enroll without causing or controlling the free wills of the professors. So God planned the atonement without forcing any sinner to do anything. He didn't need to. People were willing to crucify Christ of their own free will. Even we incorporate the choices of others into our plans and Jesus said no man takes his own life but he lays it down of his own accord. He said that he could have prayed for 12 legions of angels to deliver him and that would have changed the future despite the previous prophecies if he wanted to. In other words, it was not unconditionally, irresistibly decreed from eternity. He could have prayed for 12 legions of angels and changed the whole course of history. He has an overarching man-centered tradition that will not allow him to handle the text of scripture with any kind of fidelity at all. It's impossible. Okay, again, mind you, so far in this video, I've asked one question. Is homosexuality God's plan? Is abortion God's plan? And he's scattering all over the place. Now he's accusing me uh, uh, once again of having this overarching man-centered view. I've asked one simple question. And we're already talking about Abraham and the Assyrians and the atonement and man-centeredness and Pelagianism, open theism and original sin. I just asked one simple question. So man, this guy can go on and on about what I supposedly believe. All I've done is ask one simple question. So uh, they go all over the place with these things. It's, it's a simple question. It deserves a simple answer, not an ad hominem attack or an ad hominem uh, straw man some long-winded rabbit trail that James White's already on. It's actually James White who has a pre-commitment to a man-made theology which does not enable him to deal with the scriptures in an honest way. Uh, for example, God was going to destroy Israel and make a nation out of Moses. We'll see this in the video later on. Uh, and uh, White can't accept the fact that Moses' intercession changed God's plans. He says, no, no, it was God changing Moses, which the text doesn't say. Or say the Israelites sacrificing their um, children um, to Baal, and God said, neither came it into my mind. Uh, White can't deal with that text honestly because he has this pre-commitment that he has to reinterpret the meaning of these verses by uh, means of eisegesis. He makes these passages try to fit his preconceived ideas of theology, and that we're going to see very clearly uh, he's going to do all throughout this video. So, if you will not see the difference between God's decree and the fact that God decrees to glorify himself in the redemption of a particular people in Christ Jesus from eternity past, and that this includes all the purposes and realities of sin. You can tell by the way this guy talks when he's quoting out of some systematic theology book that he read. They have phrases like, oh, decrees to glorify himself from a particular people in Christ Jesus from eternity's past. My goodness, just talk like a normal human being. You talk like a, a 17th century uh, Puritan. It's, uh, it's, it's just Calvinism that talks like that. It's not the Bible that talks like that. Uh, you can tell when he's just uh, get his theology uh, from, you know, Calvin, Spurgeon, Edwards, Owen, B.B. Warfield, 
he's not getting his theology from the Bible. Uh, that's why he's talking like, uh, oh yeah, you know, uh, decrees to glorify himself from a particular people in Christ Jesus from eternity's past. But again, blasphemy by any other name is just as horrid. His distinction between a revealed will and secret will doesn't solve the problem. It is the problem. Calvinism makes God out to be the author of sin by saying that God from eternity decreed all sin, making sin God's idea. This is what John Calvin said, which is where he's getting his ideas from. I mean, after all, he is a Calvinist. Calvinist, it's just, you know... I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and he says, no, it's not supposed to be that way. That's carnality. Well, Calvinists are carnal. They're, oh, I'm of Calvin. John Calvin said, whatsoever things are done wrongly and justly by man, these very things are the right and just works of God. In other words, Calvinist says, anything that's wrong that man does is actually God's right, right work. Martin Luther said, since, therefore, God moves and does all in all, he necessarily moves and does all in Satan and the wicked man. Luther also said, God works all things and all men, even wickedness in the wicked. Now, as horrid as this is, I'm, I at least appreciate the honesty which what Calvin spoke and Luther spoke. This James White guy is uh, just not coming out with the honest truth that he thinks abortion is God's secret plan. That he thinks homosexuality is God's secret plan. Because they try and pretty up their doctrine to make it more acceptable because it's just in, in, inherently putrid. So who wanted Adam and Eve to sin? God or the devil? Calvinism says God. God wanted Adam and Eve to sin. John Calvin said, The first man fell because the Lord deemed it meet that he should. Piscator said, God made Adam and Eve to this very purpose, that they might be tempted and led into sin. And by the force of this decree, it could not be otherwise, but that they must sin. Dr. John Edwards, or Jonathan Edwards said, He might have hindered the fall, but he would not. The reason was because he decreed their fall. As we may gather from God creating the tree of good and evil before their creation. All right, talk about eisegesis. Just read Genesis and you will see nothing of the kind. God tried to prevent the fall and to persuade Adam and Eve not to sin by warning them of the consequences. It was actually the devil who wanted Adam and Eve to sin and gave them motives to do so. It wasn't God. So Calvinism is confusing God with the devil, and Calvinism is turning God into the devil by saying it was God who wanted them to sin. The God of Jesse Morrell is not the God of the Bible. It is the serpent that appears in the Garden of Eden. And then All right, so Emilio came out the first day to confront me with this Facebook Live. Then he came out the second day with his bullhorn, and he preached for like two hours to my crowd, which ignored him, uh, all about me. Every other word was Jesse Morrell, Jesse Morrell, Jesse Morrell, Jesse Morrell, Jesse Morrell believes this, Jesse Morrell believes that. It was unbelievable. We had a crowd of a thousand sinners in front of us, and instead of preaching the gospel, he preached Jesse Morrell. Of course, he has no gospel. He has a limited atonement. He has Calvinism. Anyways, it's ironic. Emilio says that my God is the serpent in the garden when it's his theology that says God wanted Adam and Eve to sin. No, it was the devil who wanted Adam and Eve to sin. So if you think God wanted Adam and Eve to sin, your God, Emilio, is the devil. Your God is the serpent in the wilderness. So it's just, it's just Calvinism makes God out to be worse than the devil. Because the devil can only tempt you to sin. But they say God irresistibly decrees that you would do it. Talk about warped thinking. Their understanding is, is darkened. And that this includes all the purposes and realities of sin, and that this does not remove from man his responsibility and culpability. This is a, a canned Calvinist argument. Oh, God decrees it, but man is still accountable. Just because God predestined it doesn't mean man is not responsible. Look, that's a great little answer to a question that nobody asked. Again, my question is one simple, well, it's two questions really. It's, it's, is homosexuality God's plan? 
And then the same vein is homosexual is is abortion God's plan? Just that's the question at hand. It, when people are homosexual, when people have abortion, is that God's plan? And he's already off deeper on this rabbit trail about how uh, how predestination doesn't eliminate accountability and responsibility. All I asked was one simple question, but. Uh, that's, they have to say that because Calvinism says God decreed for man to sin unavoidably, irresistibly, unchangeably. And yet, oh yeah, somehow man is still, uh, still accountable. Nobody even brought it up. It's just uh, nobody's asking about that. Nobody is making that uh, argument. Uh, it's just coming out of his own mind in his own little world. But this is what the Westminster Catechism says. That God decreed whatsoever comes to pass, they say, yet not so... As thereby, neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. So they realize the logical conclusion of their first statement that God decrees whatsoever comes to pass unchangeably. Uh, the logical conclusion of that is that God is the author of sin. So they have to try and now cover it up and say, but... He, he decrees all sin, but not in such a way as to be the author of sin. That's like a mafia boss claiming that he never murdered anyone because he simply decreed his henchmen to do it. But notice in the Bible there is a correlation between uh, free will and accountability. In Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 28, it says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing... If you obey the commands of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse, if you will not obey the commands of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. So he's saying blessing or cursing is a result of your choice. I set before you blessing and cursing, and you get which one you choose. In other words, your choices have consequences and you're free to choose your consequences so there's a correlation between free will and accountability free will and consequences but Calvinism said God doesn't set before you blessing and cursing God picks for you which one you're gonna have Deuteronomy 30 19 says I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death blessing and cursing therefore choose life that thou and thy seed may live Again, you choose the consequences, and that's why you're justly accountable. So man's accountable and responsible, justly facing consequences for his decision because he is free to choose between alternatives, obedience or disobedience, and the consequent blessing or cursing. Calvinism removes free will and then says man's still accountable, simply because God says so, with no rationale as to how that could possibly be justice. We all intuitively know from our sense of justice, which God himself implanted into our human nature and reason, that if a man is free, he's accountable, and that if he is not free, he is not responsible or accountable. In fact, the very first Christian apologist, who was also a martyr, by the name of Justin Martyr, that's why they called him Justin Martyr, but he was the first Christian apologist, he said, we have learned from the prophets and we hold it to be true that punishment and chastisement and rewards are rendered according to the merit of each man's actions. Otherwise, if all things happen by fate, then nothing is in our own power. For if it is predestined that one man be good and another man evil, then the first is not deserving of praise and the other to be blamed. Unless humans have the power of avoiding evil, and choosing good by free choice, they are not accountable for their actions, whatever they might be. For neither would a man be worthy of praise if he did not himself choose the good, but was merely created for that end. Likewise, if a man were created evil, he would not deserve punishment, since he was not a evil of himself, being unable to do anything else than what he was made for. So you would think Justin Martyr was refuting James White or refuting Calvinism. Justin Martyr was refuting the paganism of his day. And that's exactly uh, what Calvinism agrees with, the paganism of fatalism, uh, that 
Uh, people are created evil and they can't avoid it. They can't help it. They have no free will. That's not Christianity. That's paganism. That's Gnosticism. That's not early Christian thought at all. That's not Christian ideas at all. The Christian idea is that you're accountable because you have a free will. That you have a blessing and cursing set before you, consequences of blessing and, and cursing, and uh, man is justly held accountable because he's a free moral agent. So the only way a man's accountable for what he does and uh, what God predetermined to be done, like in the case of the atonement, is if God's predetermined plan included their free will and did not usurp it. And that's why in Acts 2.23, when Peter said they did that which was determined before to be done, he went on to rebuke them for their brutal, brutal treatment of Christ. He said, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So evidently, God's determined counsel included their free will choices so that they are still held liable and accountable. Just as the king of Assyria was rightly judged, for acting on the intentions of his heart in Isaiah chapter 10, yet God used the king of Assyria in his sinful attention, uh, uh, intentions to punish the people of Israel in fulfillment of the very word that God had given to Israel in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, the blessings and the cursings. Wait, wasn't he just mocking me for saying God incorporated it into his plan, that he brought good out of it, that he was using it? And now here, he just said that God used the king of Assyria. So he's even using the same language that I was using. Now, just because God can be seen at times in the scriptures using the sins of men does not mean that he has a secret will for them to sin or a secret will that includes all sin. I can use the sins of men. I use hecklers when I preach on campus. I can use their sins for good. But that doesn't mean I planned it from eternity, that they can't do otherwise. It doesn't include any of these Calvinistic notions which they, which they uh, fallaciously attack uh, or attach uh, to these scenarios. So just stick to what the scriptures actually say and don't add anything to them. Um, my will for these hecklers is that they repent. I don't have a secret will that they would heckle me. I just know that if they do heckle me, I can use it. Um, so I still, I, I want them to repent, but I can still use their opposition for the glory of God. So God wills a sinless universe. If you're going to use that term sinless, it's not biblical, but God wants a holy universe. That doesn't mean he can't use the free will choices of men when they sin. Uh, he can at times even override their evil intentions, using them to accomplish good things like he did with Joseph's brothers or the king of Assyria. God using the sinfulness of the Assyrians to punish Israel and then holding the Assyrians themselves accountable does not mean that God usurped their free will, nor does it mean that all sin was God's eternal plan. So again, all I ask so far in this whole scenario that James White's addressing is if homosexuality is God's plan. And this guy is just way off there in la-la land talking about the Assyrians. Now, again, remember, when you're dealing with open theists, all this goes out the window. You don't have an orthodox doctrine of God. You have a very man-centered doctrine of God. You've got a God who's, who's just doing the best he can with what he's got. Um, but that's the only consistent direction to go. This guy literally thinks that an orthodox doctrine of God is saying homosexuality is God's plan. That abortion is God's plan. He thinks orthodoxy is saying all sin is God's plan. That's what he calls orthodoxy. That's a joke. Um, so anyways, while we're suddenly on the topic of open theism, apparently all I asked, I mean, <laughs> can a guy ask a simple question around here? All I asked is, is homosexuality God's plan? And we're already on open theism. Fine. Let's talk about open theism. Open theism is a God-centered theology that's based on the scriptures. I was not an open theist until I studied the scriptures. Okay? Now you have uh, plenty of fatalists who never read the Bible. Plenty of hardcore determinists who never read the Bible. Uh, you, you know, as in ancient paganism and in, in Greek uh, philosophy of uh, fatalism and determinism. But uh, open theism 
is a, a peculiar revelation from God, which um, says, uh, well, first of all, I got a whole list, a whole list of probably hundreds of scriptures. I'll just give one scripture for each point. God speaks of the future in terms of what may or may not be. For example, Jeremiah 36, where he says they may or may not repent. God changes his plans in response to the changing circumstances. Jeremiah 18, 1 to 10, Jonah 3, 10, Exodus 32, 10 to 14. The Bible says God's willingness to change his plans is actually considered one of his glorious attributes, like Jonah 4, 2, Joel 2, 12 to 13. Uh, God will test people to see what types of decisions they will make. Genesis 22, 12, when he was testing Abraham. 2 Chronicles 32, 31. Uh, God has had disappointments with how things have turned out. Genesis 6, 5 to 6. God repented of making man. Or God repented of making Saul the king in 1 Samuel 15, 10. God, here's a, here's a kicker. God expected things to happen that didn't happen. Isaiah 5, 1 to 5. He says, uh, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done to my vineyard that when I thought for it to bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes instead? What more could I have done to my vineyard, the Lord says. Well, I don't know. How about irresistibly decreed for them to bring forth good grapes? Why didn't you monergistically regenerate them so that they could bring forth nothing but good grapes? You know, obviously, the God of the Bible is not the God of Calvinism. Because, well, obviously, he's talking about he used means consistent with their free will. He used means consistent with their moral agency. He did all that he could do consistent with their moral agency for them to bring forth grapes and yet they brought forth wild grapes instead. But as it relates to open theism, the point is God expected things to happen that didn't happen. Uh, Jeremiah 3, 6 to 7, or 19 to 20, chapter 3 still. Uh, God gets frustrated and grieved when he attempts to bring people into alignment with his will and they resist. Ezekiel 22, 29 to 31. How about this? The prayers of men have changed the plans of God. Uh, we see that in prayer changes the future. Uh, Exodus 32, verses 10 to 14. Jeremiah 26, 19. Isaiah 38, 5. Prayer changes the future by changing the mind of God. This is not the God of Calvinism. This is the God of the Bible, which is the God of open theism. God is said to have repented or changed his mind many, many times in the Bible. Like Genesis 6, Exodus 32, Numbers 32, I mean Numbers 23, Deuteronomy 32, Judges 2, 1 Samuel 15, uh, 2 Samuel 24, Psalms 90, Psalms 106, Psalms 110, Psalms 135, Jeremiah 4, Jeremiah 15, Jeremiah 18, Jeremiah 20, Jeremiah 26, Jeremiah 42, Ezekiel 24, Hosea 11, uh, 13, Joel 1, uh, Amos 7, Jonah 3, uh, Zechariah 8. I mean, all throughout the Bible, it's a repeated theme, a repeated revelation that God repents and uh, praise God that he repents because he's repenting of his judgments, repenting of destruction, repenting of destroying people. Prophecies are often God foretelling of what he himself will bring to pass. So they really have more to do with his omnipotence to bring his plans to pass than merely, say, foreseeing the future. Um, this types of prophecy would include, like, the Messiah, his birth, the location of his birth, the miracles of his birth. They're not accidents that merely uh, he foresaw. Uh, they were deliberate plans of God. And so that's... Um, a point in open theism that the future is partly determined and uh, God can make plans and then bring them to pass. Only if the future is open is he able to do that. The future is partly open, the Bible says, uh, in like say Exodus 3.18 uh, and the future is also partly settled, like say Genesis 3.15. Uh, the future can be changed, like Jeremiah 18. Uh, the scriptures also say that God has a past, present, and a future. Uh, for example, like John 1.14, Revelations 1.4, uh, Revelations 1.8, Revelations 4.8, Revelations 5.12. Uh, 
God has a past, a present, and a future. He's the Lamb who, who was slain. He was, He is, He is to come. Uh, scripture says that God has et God's eternity is endless time, which is time without end or without beginning. Uh, for example, Psalms 23, 2, Psalms 92, Psalms 102, 24. You know, the, the psalmist says that the years of the Lord shall never fail. So eternity is not timelessness. Eternity is, is uh, time without end. The Bible even speaks of man's eternity as endless time. In Revelations uh, 14, 11, you know, the Bible speaks of... Uh, of the damned having uh, the smoke of their torment rise up forever having no rest day or night so eternal damnation is not damnation in a timeless realm it's damnation with eternal time the bible speaks of heaven uh, in heaven they say holy 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 and they rest not day or night revelations 4 8 so heaven or eternal life is not a a timeless life that has no time in it but it's time without end so there's a theory of time in open theism. Anyways, um, he brought up open theism. We're going to end up talking about it throughout this video. And so we shall. If you have a God who is sovereign over all time, then everything he's saying is just foolishness. It's ridiculous. Okay, he says God is sovereign over all time. And again, when Calvinists use the word sovereignty, what they really mean is puppetry. They're talking about a micromanager, meticulous predestination, hardcore determinism of everything that happens. That means when they say God is sovereign over all of time, they mean everything in history was God's plan. The Holocaust was God's plan. Uh, a million and a half aborted babies a year, that's God's plan. Um, the 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 early Christians being eaten alive by lions. That was God from eternity planning that to happen. Everything, rape, murder, child molestation, it's all God's sovereign secret plan. Anyways, God is not sovereign in the Calvinist sense. God is not the author of or the ultimate cause of everything that happens. The Bible says that God tempts no man. It also says that God's not the author of confusion. So God is sovereign in the true sense that he's the ultimate authority over everything, like a king is the sovereign of a nation. Doesn't mean nobody in the nation or uh, nobody in his kingdom transgresses his law. Uh, God is the sovereign of the universe. He sovereignly gave us a free will. He will sovereignly hold us accountable for how we use it. Um, the Calvinist definition or view of sovereignty is heresy. That's why I say Calvinists don't really believe in two lip, they believe in two lips. You gotta add the S at the end, tulips. Uh, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints, and then the S at the end is sovereignty. Uh, they all believe this God is sovereign business. Look, the Bible says God did not sovereignly decree the entrance of sin into the world. Genesis 6, 5 to 6 says that God repented when he saw how wicked the world had become. Because he didn't make them for that, he sent the flood. Um, God does not sovereignly control all of the political collection, uh, elections that happen. Hosea 8.4 says they set up kings, but not by me. They made princes, and I knew it not. God does not sovereignly control everything that rulers do. 1 Samuel 15.11 says it repented me that I set up Saul to be the king, for he has turned back from following me. God does not sovereignly will the sacrifice of children. Jeremiah 19.5 says they built also the high places of Baal, and they burnt their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, neither spoke it, neither came it into my mind. God does not sovereignly decree the outcome of all events. And God said in Isaiah 5.3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray, between me and my vineyard. Uh, what could I have done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. Not all men do the sovereign will of God. Luke 7.30 says, But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Some events happen, the Bible says, by time and chance. Now, there's no chance in the Calvinist world. In fact, John Calvin is a quote. John Calvin says, nothing happens by chance. Well, here's what does the Bible say? Ecclesiastes 9, 11 says, time and chance happens to them all. Or Luke 
1031, Jesus told a parable and he said, And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by the other side. Uh, God does not always get what he wants as a result of man's free will. Matthew 23, 37 said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you would not. See, God wanted something, but he didn't get it because they would not. So God respects our freedom because he granted it to us. He lets us, as free moral agents, make our choices. So his will is not always done. So God is not the sovereign cause of all things. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. God is not the author of sin. James 1, 13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God speaks of the future with uncertainty. Jeremiah 36, 3. It may be that the house of Judah will hear of the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquities and their sin. So God speaks of the future in terms of contingencies. The actions of men have changed the plans of God. Jonah 3, 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil which he said he would do unto them, and he did it not. God tries to give repentance to people who refuse it. Revelations 2.21 And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. See, the list of scriptures can go on and on, but these are just the ones that just came to the top of my head. The Bible is clear that God is not the sovereign in the Calvinistic sense, the sovereign of the universe in the Calvinistic sense, he does not plan or cause everything that happens. He doesn't get everything that he wants. His will is not always done. Now, there is sovereignty and man's free will. Um, for example, I mean, is God sovereign? Yes, in the biblical sense. Does man have a free will? Yes, in the biblical sense. Uh, he sovereignly decided that we'd have free will and he just sovereignly holds us accountable to it And that's what you see in Luke 19:27. It says but those enemies of mine Which would not that I should reign over them bring hither and slay them before me So he says those enemies of mine, which would not so that's their free will That I should reign over them. So that's God's sovereign or sovereign sovereignty reign sovereign that would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So they get killed for their choices. So that's free will, and that's sovereignty. God gave you a free will, you can choose heaven or hell. God's sovereignty is that if you choose sin, you're going to go to hell, and if you choose to repent, uh, you'll get his mercy and you'll go to heaven. So that's his sovereignty and free will working together. So the God, the sovereign God of Calvinism, who decreed all sin from eternity past, is literally a man-made idol that they worship. He doesn't exist. He's the figment of their perverted imagination. Uh, this, I mean, to the Calvinist, uh, fatalism, determinism is the is the their great Diana. Anyways, uh, so he just has to throw Psalm one fifteen out, one thirty five out, and well, Isaiah and all of prophecy. Well, look, once you throw out, once you're an open theist, there ain't much left. But there you go. All right, so he says, you're an open theist, you just throw out the Bible. Oh, yeah, there's just nothing left. Look, we already saw that open theism is built upon a mountain of Scripture. The funny thing is, uh, James White says, oh, once you're an open theist, there ain't much left, referring to the Scriptures. Because, But the funny thing is that their doctrines of, like, original sin is literally based on, like, five Scriptures. It's open theism is based on like a mountain of scripture from Genesis to Revelation all over the Bible, well over a hundred scriptures. Uh, you can find support for the open view, uh, hundreds and hundreds of scriptures. But they will readily accept the doctrine of original sin based on like a handful of verses. And yet they're so quick to just outright reject open theism. I mean, literally, all, the, the support for original sin is like, um, five scriptures. They say Psalms 51 5. 
I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And they're like, oh, see, look, it's right there. You're born a sinner. Well, first of all, I was talking about David and his mother. It's not talking about you and Adam. It's not talking about all of mankind and Adam. And he says, in sin did my mother conceive me. So who's the subject? The mother. Who's the object? David. So who does the sin belong to? The mother. My mother was in sin when she conceived me. She wasn't married. And so that's what it means. He's saying, I was shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. His mother was sinning at the moment when she conceived David. That's what it means. But they're like, oh, look, biblical support for born a sinner. Because Augustine had a pre-committed idea that he got from all, uh, Gnosticism, went to the Bible, and now he interprets the Bible by these uh, preconceived ideas. Psalms 58 says, um, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go forth uh, as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Now, that's a psalm. It's hyperbole. It's poetic. Babies that are newborn don't know how to speak at all. So they say, oh, they're wicked or estranged from the womb. They go forth as soon as they are born speaking lies. It's, it's, it's an exaggeration. Babies don't speak at all. And of course, Romans 5. Now, the ironic thing about Romans 5 is that Romans 5 says nothing at all about birth. It says nothing at all about human nature. And yet that's like the ultimate proof text that they think they have of uh, how you're born with a sinful nature from Adam. All it says is, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. He doesn't say how. He doesn't say federal headship. He doesn't say seminal identity. He doesn't say uh, a corruption of nature. He doesn't even mention birth. Uh, none of that is, is mentioned at all. The problem is, Augustine was reading from the Latin uh, Vulgate, which was a translation of Jerome, which mistranslated um, sin came into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Verse, this is 512. The Latin Vulgate says, in whom all sinned. So Augustine had this idea that you sinned in Adam, not through a federal headship, but through a seminal identity, that you literally existed in the loins of Adam. Um, so they have, uh, so I mean, those are like the three major verses for original sin. Oh, and then like Ephesians, what, 2, 3, uh, by nature, children of wrath. But that word nature can mean a mode of feeling and acting, which by long habit has uh, become second nature to you. The whole context is about your lifestyle and your habits. And so by habitually sinning, um, sinning becomes second nature to you, like smoking cigarettes. You corrupt your body, it becomes so habitual, getting drunk, even lying, you can become a habitual liar. Uh, even though your conscience used to bother you at first, it doesn't anymore. It's against your nature because it violates your conscience, but you can do it so habitually it becomes like second nature to you. So there's like four verses that they use. They're like, look, original sin is a biblical doctrine. It's so obvious and they just embrace it over these four scriptures, whereas open theism is hundreds of verses all throughout the Bible, and they're just like, nope, nope, can't accept that. So they reject original sin uh, outright, even though there's a plethora, or they, they reject open theism, even though there's a plethora of scriptures, uh, is meaningless, uh, they say. Uh, anthropomorphic is what they uh, call it. You know, the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And so that means it's uh, b being a sinner is a personal choice. You know, at the age of accountability, uh, when you know right from wrong, you choose to do wrong. And so all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. So who do I blame for becoming a sinner? Myself. Adam opened up our eyes by eating from the tree of knowledge. He gave us the opportunity, which we have taken to sin, um, by one man's disobedience, which was eating from the tree of knowledge, many were made sinners, that is, many choose to do what they know is wrong, and so he opened up our eyes to good and evil, and with that knowledge, we choose to do wrong. Just like Christ, who by his death has made salvation available to every man, but your free will choice still has to be involved uh, to receive him, uh, so also Adam made um, sin uh, available to you by eating from the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, but your your choice to be a sinner is still involved. So to reject open theism, you literally have to re just outright reject a whole plethora of scriptures as meaningless, or what they call anthropomorphic, which actually doesn't make them meaningless, they think it does. 
Um, but they falsely accuse open theists of rejecting the scriptures. I mean, I'm serious. Calvinism is like a mental disorder. But this also illustrates how errors in theology proper, open theism, are almost always related to errors in soteriology. Because God acts consistently with his nature in the gospel. And so if you end up messing up God's nature by messing up his omniscience based upon his being the creator of all things, um, then you're going to end up with a very different perspective on the gospel. All right, yes. Uh, if you mess up God's nature, you mess up salvation, which is exactly what Calvinism does. Calvinism says it is consistent with God's nature for him to decree sin. And then salvation becomes a matter of saving man from the sins that God irresistibly decreed for him to commit. But salvation from punishment for unavoidable sin would be justice, not grace. That's why there's literally no grace in what they call the doctrines of grace. Again, Calvinism says that it's consistent with God's nature to decree the sin and the damnation of souls who don't even yet exist, and then God creates these souls so that they go and sin and are damned, and then he offers them no salvation, that Christ did not die for them, and they were actually created for this end, just to sin and go to hell. And they say that's consistent with God's nature to decree people to sin and go to hell. This is repugnant to our conscience. It completely denies the benevolence of God, the benevolence of his heart. It literally destroys the gospel, which is an offer of salvation to all men. So James White is correct that if you get the nature of God wrong, you will consequently distort and destroy the gospel. But that's exactly what Calvinism does, not open theism. Open theism says hell was not created for man, but for the devil and his angels. Therefore, man was not in God's mind when he created hell. Open theism says all men were created for the pleasure of God, and that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And therefore, man was not created to be wicked or to be damned. Again, not everyone's consistent. Thanks be to God. Jesse Morales, and phew, out he goes into all the various forms of heresy. All right, notice he said, thanks be to God, because, well, he gives God credit for just everything that, that happened. So James White believes, so he's, I mean, if you're thanking God that some people are inconsistent, well, you should also thank God that some people are consistent. You should thank God for everything that happens, because everything you think is God's plan. But James White believes that God predestined me to be an open theist, and then that Calvinism, he says also, that God decreed everything for his glory. So that would mean that open theism glorifies God. I mean, so what is he upset about? Uh, if, it's, if it's heresy to say that homosexuality is not God's plan, which is what I'm saying, which, again, is the only point that, I'm, that White is supposed to be addressing so far in this whole video. The one question I asked is all he's played so far. If, if heresy is saying homosexuality is not God's plan, then I'm happy to be a heretic. My heresy is biblical. Uh, my heresy comes from the Bible itself. Uh, God's will is uh, holiness. God is calling all men everywhere to repent. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want anyone to sin and doesn't want anyone to go to hell. So if I'm a heretic, hey, the Bible is in on the heresy. I literally got my heresy from the Bible. So this question, is homosexuality God's plan? So what is, what, just watch. You'll, you'll see these guys do it all the time. They will conflate and confuse God's decree to uh, glorify himself with his prescriptive will that represents his holy nature. Okay, when he says God's decree to glorify himself, what he really means is God's secret will for man to sin. See, these guys always pretty up their doctrine to try and make it look more appealing or sound better than it really is. Oh, God's decree to glorify himself. What you really mean, James, is God's secret will for man to sin so that he could glorify his justice and damning them for sins they couldn't help but to commit and to glorify his grace and mercy by sparing them of the judgment of the sins that they couldn't help but to commit. And when he says God's descriptive will that represents his holy nature, he's talking about God's commandments, which he believes God secretly decreed for us to break every day. 
every second of every day. He's saying that I am confusing God's commandments with his sovereign will simply by asking the question, is homosexuality God's plan? But by doing so, he's actually admitting that God's commandments are not his secret or his, God's commandments are not his sovereign will. In the Bible, his commandments are his sovereign will. That's what he sovereignly wants us to do. And then we do it or not. And so God's sovereign will is not always done. Um, sin is not God's sovereign will. His commandments are his sovereign will. But Calvinism says publicly that homosexuality is not God's will, that he outlawed it, but secretly they think God planned it, that he decreed it. So I just don't buy into this bogus idea that confuses, uh, you know, so he says my question confuses the two, but no, I, I understand that Calvinism believes that homosexuality is God's secret will, and they just don't come out and say it. They don't own it. They beat around the bush. But I just reject it. I understand it, and I reject it. So what they want to do is they want to create the false idea that if God's sovereign over all things, then he desires that sin, that it reflects what he wants in his own experience, rather than recognizing that that sin is a part of his decree. All right, so White is saying that God decreed sin, but it doesn't mean that God wants sin. What? He's the one that literally calls it his secret will. That's also the language of John Piper. I mean, it's traditional Calvinism, that sin is God's secret will. So if it's God's will, they shouldn't have a problem with me saying, in their view, God wants it. God wants babies to be aborted. God wants people to be homosexual. God wants people to sin and go to hell. That's what they believe. That's what will means. It's like they're using words. That, don't you know what it means when you say it's God's secret will or God's sovereign will? It means that's what God wants. And he objects to me using that language. They say it's God's sovereign will. That means God wills it. So they shouldn't object to it. He's trying to say that God decrees sin, but he doesn't want sin because sin is contrary to his nature. I mean, well, that's an excellent point. If the will is not free, but is only free to choose according to your nature, which is what Calvinism says, then how is God able to make decrees that are contrary to his nature? How can God decree all sin if all sin is contrary to his nature? as Calvinism claims. So White here is admitting that sin is contrary to God's nature, but that just gives me more rope to hang him with because how can God decree that which is contrary to his nature if the will is not free to choose contrary to his nature? That's what Calvinism teaches. So yet another systemic contradiction within Calvinism, and there's so many, there's so many. I'm just... Uh, I'm not confusing God's revealed will with his secret will. I understand the Calvinistic distinction. I just want him to publicly admit it, that homosexuality, in his view, is God's plan. That home abortion, in his view, is God's plan. In every instance that it occurs. That is dealt with either through the self-sacrifice of Jesus Christ or justly in the punishment of sinners on that last day. All right, this guy rambles and rambles on rabbit trails. So he's saying that God decreed sin and then God punishes sin. Nobody brought that up. I just asked a simple question, is homosexuality God's plan? But okay. So Calvinism says sin is either punished in Christ or punished in sinners. Either way, all sin is punished. So there's literally no forgiveness of sin in Calvinism. Calvinism teaches uh, penal substitution, whereby the atonement is not a means by which our penalty for our sins can be remitted, but is rather a means by which the sins are actually punished in our substitute. So Calvinism says all sin is punished. Therefore, logically, no sin is ever forgiven. This is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that our sins are either forgiven through Christ or they are punished in us. If we are forgiven, then they're not punished. If they are punished, then they're not forgiven. When sin is punished, it's not forgiven. When sin is forgiven, it's not punished. That's just how it works. So Calvinism 
has only the punishment of sin, but absolutely zero forgiveness of sin, which is yet another false doctrine. It's a heresy found in Calvinism. Again, there's no grace in the doctrines of grace. So, they want the idea to be that if God decrees it, then he must want it as in representing his nature. And so then that's how he'll say, well, I'm more loving than your God is, and your God is terrible and disgusting and horrible and all the rest of that stuff. And it's all based upon this unwillingness. And they know that we make that distinction, and they know that we can defend that distinction. And they know that we can defend that distinction. And they can. Yeah. I know that you make that distinction. Just come out and say it. Say that you believe homosexuality and abortion is God's secret plan. Just say it. You call it God's secret will or God's sovereign will, so don't be upset when I say Calvinism says God wants people to be homosexual. God wants babies to be aborted. But no, you just you can't really defend that distinction. You won't even admit it. White says the Bible becomes confusion. If you don't make that distinction between God's revealed will and God's secret will, the opposite is true. If you admit that distinction, then the Bible becomes confusion. If you admit a revealed and a secret will, it causes confusion throughout the whole Bible. When you pray thy will be done, which will are you praying to be done? His revealed will? Well, no point in praying for that because it'll never happen. They say his revealed will is impossible. It can't be done. Is it his secret will you're praying to happen? Praying for his secret will to be done? Once again, no point praying for that because it can't help but to happen. Your prayers won't make it happen. God already decreed for it to happen. If you neglect to pray, it's still going to happen because in their view, everything is God's secret will. So if you admit this idea of a secret will versus revealed will, it makes no sense of the prayer, pray thy will be done. Not his revealed will or his secret will. Can't make sense of either of it. So James White's distinction between revealed will and secret will is literally supplying the rope by which he hangs himself is a dilemma for Calvinists. See, the Bible says in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So when this verse says, doeth the will of my Father, is it talking about his secret will or his revealed will? Calvinists make a distinction between God's secret will, which is all the sin that happens, and his revealed will, like thou shall not sin. Then they uh, say that God publicly commands one thing, like don't sin, but he secretly decrees the opposite, which is that you would sin every day. So when the Bible says, he that does the will of the Father will enter the kingdom of heaven, in Matthew 7, 21, or when it says, he that does the will of the Father abides forever, in 1 John 2, 7, is this talking about his revealed will or his secret will? If it's talking about his secret will, well, Calvinism says everybody does that. So does that mean everyone is going to heaven? Obviously not. So then it must be talking about his revealed will, right? Wrong. Calvinism says that God's revealed will is that you do not sin. But that's impossible in this life, they claim. God decreed that you sin every day in word, thought, and deed. That's what they teach. God's secret will is that you sin every day. So these passages cannot mean that you have to do the revealed will of God to enter the kingdom of heaven, because that would mean nobody is going to get in there. So Calvinism says doing God's revealed will is impossible because God's secret will is that you violate his revealed will every day in word, thought, and deed, to quote the catechism. So when it said, so I mean, here's the question, which is it? When it says, doeth the will of my Father, is it talking about his secret will or his revealed will? This is a dilemma that Calvinists cannot answer. Don't expect them to ever answer this. Now the Bible says in John 9, 31, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. So you literally can't make sense of this verse if you admit James White's unbiblical distinction between revealed will and secret will. It says, he that does his will... His secret will, everyone does that. His revealed will, nobody does that. So what, what's this talking about? God hears the prayers of those who do his will. The fact is, Calvinists believe that abortion is part of God's secret plan, yet they themselves are pro-life activists. So that would mean that it's God's secret plan for Calvinists to be against his secret plan. What a mess. You catch that? 
they say abortion is God's secret plan. But everything that happens is God's secret plan. Calvinists are pro-life activists, which is against abortion. So that means it's God's secret plan for them to be a pro-life activist, to take a stand against his, his other secret plan, which is abortion. So God secretly decrees for them to publicly be against God's secret decrees. What a mess. So who are you, old man, to reply against God? If God decreed abortion to happen, who are you to reply against God? I mean, in, in Calvinism, it was God who decreed the Supreme Court to legalize abortion, which means it's really God who legalized abortion because he decreed the Supreme Court to legalize it. And yet Calvinists who are pro-life take a stand against abortion. I think the only way to make sense of it is that God's will is that you not sin and the devil's will is that you would sin. And that makes sense. It is a willful misrepresentation. It is a twisting. It is, it, they have to do it because they got nothing else. They can't stand on the whole of Scripture. They can't do it. And so you have to twist things around. So, Wow. Talk about looking in the mirror. Calvinism twists like every verse that it touches. It can't accept the entire Bible for what it teaches. It has to insert its theology into the text where it isn't there. You have to reject all the verses that say things happen that God didn't decree to happen. The scriptures that say things happen by chance. The scriptures say God is sometimes surprised or disappointed with how things turn out. Isaiah 59 verse 16 says, And he saw that there was no man, and he wondered that there was no intercessor. Wondered here means to be stunned, awestruck, appalled, stupefied. In other words, God was surprised. But that doesn't mesh with this preconceived idea of God. So you have to reject that scripture, and you can't stand on the whole counsel of God's word. If God has a secret will, which encompasses everything that happens, then God's will is always done. But how do you explain the Bible saying God is provoked to jealousy? What, why be jealous if his sovereign will is always done? Why pray thy will be done? Why pray thy will be done if God's revealed will can't be done since he decreed for everyone to sin every day? And if God's secret will can't be helped but to be done, then there's no one who can resist it. That's like praying for the law of gravity to work today. Was there a possibility that it wouldn't? Yet this is another example of the imaginative secret will and how it destroys the scriptures and confuses the Christian life. Thy will be done is a prayer that makes sense if God's will in heaven, which is to be done, is holiness and happiness, and that's not being done on earth. I pray thy will be done because I think his will is perfect holiness. The prayer implies that God's will is not always done. Thy will, praying thy will be done implies this a possibility that, and, uh, and that it's not being done. So prayer is proof that Calvinism is false. Let me say that again. Prayer disproves Calvinism. White believes that if a child is raped, that was God's will. Otherwise, it would just be a meaningless act. He thinks it's better to view such acts as God's will because then they have meaning. Now, God could get good out of evil uh, without evil being his will. It, God can get good things from evil men without causing the evil men to do those evil things. So it's not necessary to view um, child rape as God's will in order to get meaning or good things out of it. God works all things for the good of those who love him. Uh, if somebody hurts me, I believe God can get good out of that without believing that God caused it to happen. So it's not necessary to view all things as God's will to get meaning or good out of them. So the Bible says time and chance happens to them all. And uh, in the parable of Jesus, it says uh, the man walked by by chance. So the Bible teaches some things happen by chance. That means without design or by accident. So it's far more comforting to think that child rape is not God's plan than to think that it is. And James White just has a warped mind. Because Calvinism says everything is God's plan. And then I said, ask him if abortion is God's plan. Because they're against abortion. Is the cross God's plan? They're against abortion, but they say it's God's plan. Is the cross God's plan? God might at times use sinful acts. That doesn't mean all... No, catch that. This is, this is going to... All right. 
Look, notice that Emilio deflected the abortion issue by bringing up the atonement. Okay, nobody said the atonement wasn't determined. Calvinists have to create a straw man objection in order to give their canned answers. The problem is that Calvinists see Romans 4, determined beforehand to be done, to think that it means from eternity past. To obey is better than sacrifice, the Bible says. God never wanted Adam and Eve to sin in the first place. The Bible says Christ was ordained before the foundation of the world, just like you would put a parachute on a plane in case it crashes, but it says he wasn't slain until from the foundation of the world. That's when the first sin happened. The first prophecy of the atonement was after they sinned that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Uh, slain means, or slain from the foundation of the world. That Greek word is apo, and it means uh, from or since. Uh, it signifies a separation from, like he shall cleanse you from your sin. He, he, it's, a, it's, a, it's a separation. And so Christ was slain from the foundation of the world, which means after, a time of separation. It doesn't use the Greek word pro, which means before. A lot of times Calvinists will literally twist and modify that scripture to say Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. That's not what it says. That's totally twisting it. So the Calvinist argument is that, well, the cross was God's plan from eternity, Therefore, the sin that made the cross necessary was God's plan from eternity. But that's blatantly false. The cross was not God's plan from the eternity. From eternity, to obey is better than sacrifice. So it doesn't say that the cross was God's plan before the foundation of the world. It literally says it was, uh, he was slain after the foundation of the world. So even though God incorporates the sins of men into his atonement plan and can override their evil intentions, it doesn't mean that their sins were God's plan from the beginning. Uh, that's the fallacy of Calvinism. It's just one of many heresies found in Calvinism. And Genesis 6, 5 to 6, just clearly says otherwise, that God did not create the world to sin. When he saw that they were sinning, it repented the Lord that he made man, and he sent the flood to destroy them, because that's not what he created them for. Misrepresenting what Acts 4 says. All right, he says I'm misrepresenting what Acts 4 says. Acts 4 says, determined before to be done. Again, it's the Calvinist who's inserting and adding these concepts like eternity's past, irresistible, unconditional, no free will. That is misrepresenting Acts 4. Nobody is disputing the fact that the sacrifice of Christ was determined before by God to be done. Nobody's even disputing that. It, they're arguing a point that nobody's arguing. All I asked is, is homosexuality God's plan? Is abortion God's plan? And they're all over the map now. We're talking about the atonement and other things, all these rabbit trails. Just stick to the, to the topic. Just give a straightforward answer to a straightforward question without doing all these theological gymnastics, uh, jumping through all these theological hoops to try and skirt the issue. And that's, who else do we hear doing that? Did we not hear Leighton Flowers doing that? Now, Leighton Flowers is not Jesse Morrell. Leighton Flowers is not Jesse Morrell. Wow. What a genius. This guy is brilliant. I mean, thank you for clearing that up because I think everyone was confused. But if Leighton Flowers keeps going the way he's going, he'll end up being Jesse Morrell. All right, now James White's actually talking about, he's actually talking like an open theist talking about the course of the future in terms of if. If he continues to go down the course he's in. That's, that's an open theist perspective of the future. There's no if uh, in the Calvinist world. It's, it's, there's no possibilities of ifs. So, okay, so who's lighting flowers? You know, I, I don't really know. I know he's some kind of Baptist. I think he's, a, he, he's, I think he's with a Bap Southern Baptist college or something. Something along the lines of an evangelism director, Southern Baptist, I think. I don't know. I know that he used to be a Calvinist, and now he speaks out against Calvinism. So I don't know him. I've never really listened to him. I do know, because someone shared it with me, that he recently did a podcast about how Calvinism came from Gnosticism. And I did a documentary on that like 10 years ago. So maybe I've had an influence upon Light and Flowers. I don't know. Maybe I helped get this guy out of Calvinism. I've done that for many Calvinists. I don't know about him. Uh, but White goes on to say that Light and Flowers and I have the same argument about the atonement, um, that 
just because God incorporated that into his plans does not mean that all sin is God's plan, which is just a logical argument. So maybe Lightning Flowers is listening to my stuff. I don't I don't know, but I think James White's like implying that I'm listening to this guy um, or listening to his podcast or something, which I'm not. We hope and pray that he won't go there, that he'll be restrained from going there, that he'll be restrained from going there. Wait a minute. Now he's totally talking like an open theist. Hope and pray that he won't go there? If it's already determined from eternity, what are you now praying for? If the future was predetermined from eternity past before you ever prayed a single prayer, how does prayer change anything? The answer, in Calvinism, it doesn't. Then why uh, does every Calvinist pray when they believe everything from eternity past, has, or everything was decided from eternity past? Every Calvinist is an open theist when they pray. So here, James White's praying about the future as if it's not decided yet. We hope and pray he doesn't go there. God already made up his mind in eternity. Your prayers now are meaningless. So he's praying like he's an open theist as if your prayers can affect the outcome of the future. Calvinism says God decreed all things from eternity past before you ever prayed a single prayer. So no prayer could ever be a contributing factor to the outcome of the future. James White just betrayed his own position and literally became an open theist by saying that he's praying for the future as if prayer makes a difference. See, the Bible teaches the power of prayer, saying the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Hezekiah prayed and God added 15 years to his life. Prayer literally destroys Calvinism. Prayer literally proves open theism, that the future is yet partially undecided and can be changed, that our current prayers can be offered to God and offered up to his mind to influence his decisions as to the outcome of future events. Again, if the future is already exhaustively predetermined, why pray about anything? It's already settled. Prayer disproves Calvinism. Every Calvinist is an open theist when they pray. James White just betrayed his position and became an open theist. If God's secret will is that light and flowers does go there, and yet you're hoping and praying that he doesn't go there, then you're hoping and praying that God's will is not done. Not only that, but God's secret will is that you would not want his secret will to be done. I mean, what a ball of confusion. So for light and flowers, Listen, about open theism, totally go there. Just do it. Go there. Uh, open theism just rips the carpet out from under their feet. It totally destroys their entire theology. That's why as biblical as open theism is and the biblical support is uh, overwhelming, Calvinists have to reject it. Even though they claim to be sola scriptura, they have to reject all these scriptures and they can't take them uh, at face value for what they really are because... Open theism is the opposite of God predetermining everything. Calvinism says God predetermined everything. Open theism says God gives you free will and lets you uh, kind of like a choose your own adventure book. So go there. Because this is blatant heresy. All right. Listen, Calvinists call people heretics the same way liberals call people racist, uh, if, if you know what I mean. Um, Everyone that a liberal calls racist is not a racist. Everyone that a liberal calls a sexist is not a sexist. Uh, and everyone that a Calvinist calls a heretic is not a, a heretic. They use that as a, a theological weapon, just like liberals use racist as a political weapon. So uh, here's my friend Chris Fisher. That he'll be restrained from going there, because this is blatant heresy. <laughs> but... Everything's that's, heresy. That's the only direction he has to go. Heresy for you. Heresy for you. the exact same thing. Everyone's a heretic. Is instead of seeing... All right, look. If a Calvinist calls you a heretic, take it as a compliment. They call the greatest men of God throughout the history of, the, of Christianity heretics. John Wesley was called a heretic by the Calvinists of his day. Charles Finney was called a heretic by the Calvinists of his day. William Booth was called a heretic by the Calvinists of his day. Leonard Ravenhill is still called a heretic by Calvinists of our day. Uh, some of them like him, but I think they must not understand him because Ravenhill uh, was not a Calvinist. Um, if a if A. W. Tozer was called a heretic by the Calvinists of his day, and yet ironically, some Calvinists like Tozer today, even though Tozer spoke out against 
Calvinism. It's funny. So if a Calvinist calls you a heretic, look, you're in good company. Just take it as a badge of honor. Going to Acts chapter 4, it doesn't say that God permitted or that once in a while he uses. It says he predestined this to happen and involved the free will actions of many, 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 many people. In fact, it was the free will actions of people for generations. Hence, it would have been hundreds of thousands, millions of free will acts. God determined to bring about the cross at the time and the place in the way that he chose to do so. Look, it, he says free will that it involved the free will of many people. But, I mean, he doesn't really believe in free will. Were they free to act differently? No. Calvinism uses the word free will to say that you are free to sin or you are free to do God's sovereign will. But they don't mean free will in the sense of a power of contrary choice. I, on the other hand, believe that God predetermined the sacrifice of Christ and that he incorporated the free will actions of men into this plan and it's not a problem for my theology. He Just like I don't have um, foreknowledge of everything that's going to happen, but I can plan on buying groceries at the grocery store, which involves the free will decisions of other people, uh, it's not a problem. I make future plans all the time that involve the free will choices of others, and if I can do it, then it's no problem for God. The problem is that Calvinists think that God predetermined the cross, and therefore God predetermined all sin. Remember, that's the topic at hand. I said to God, uh, is, is abortion God's plan? Is homosexuality God's plan? Emilio says, was the cross God's plan? So the argument he's trying to make is, if the cross was God's plan, then all sin is God's plan from eternity, which the logic doesn't follow. It's an illogical point. So at this point, that's all I asked in that whole discussion, and they have to just fall back on their canned answers. Rather than answering the question, is abortion God's plan, they're trying to frame the debate around the atonement and bring it to an area that they're comfortable with so that they can give the canned answers that they've rehearsed. So notice that they're equating abortion with the atonement, saying that just like the atonement was God's will, abortion is God's will. Just come out and say it. The God of Calvinism is pro-abortion. It was his idea. Abortion was God's idea. God planned the cross, and therefore God planned all sin. That's their thinking. It's warped. It's, it's demonic. It's illogical. It's, it's wicked, but that's what they think. God planned the cross because sin was not God's plan. He, Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. That's why Christ came. Christ didn't come because sin was God's plan. Christ came because sin was not God's plan, and he wanted to destroy the sin that was not God's plan. But again, Calvinism is so demonic, it has everything backwards. Even the cross, which was, came, which was God's plan to destroy sin, they twist it to somehow mean, oh, the cross means sin was God's plan. It's, it's just demonic. That's why God sent the flood, because sin was not his plan. That's why God sent Christ to destroy sin, because sin was not God's plan. So Calvinism will take the exceptions and turn them into the rule. They see God intervening into human history, and then they will illogically and arbitrarily say God causes all of human history. The Bible explicitly teaches that God does not decree everything that happens. I've already shared lots of verses on that. So James White, he really just keeps dodging my point that just because God incorporated some sin into his plan, it doesn't mean that all sin is God's plan from the beginning. He just keeps inserting, it was predestined, it was predestined. That's beside the point. Nobody says it wasn't. The point is, God incorporating some sin of some men into his plans at some times does not mean that all sin from all men was God's plan from eternity. The logical point that white ne that's the logical point white never actually addresses. Sinful acts are God's plan. That's the fallacy of Calvinism. So, so Jesse, is, is the saying cross, that all sin is God's is plan. Is the cross part of God's plan? Or not? Yeah, I just told you God could use sinful acts at times. Like, I answered the question. I just the did. Cross. If you were listening, yeah. So yes, it so, is or no, it's so, not. So the the crucifixion of Christ is it part of God? God, plan or not? God could use that into His plan. You're saying the, he could, but the betrayal of Joseph into the into slavery in Egypt, God can incorporate that into His plan. Yeah, that's but the just I because you. God incorporates it into his plan For the record, does yes, not mean all sin is God's plan. What I would say to you is that you guys need to leave here because, you know, I've been preaching here for you 11 years. You preach a false gospel. 
No, 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 wait a minute. What, what, are you, what are you laughing about? When I, when I see you cracking up uh, the, the, on the rich camp... These are just isolated incidents, James. Right, no, I know. They're just, they're just isolated incidents. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. There's isolated... Yeah, I know. Uh, it was... It's it's sad to see someone just spin in the wind uh, with this kind of stuff. But it's not the last time he's going to do that kind of stuff, believe you me. So apparently my point just goes right over their heads because they never actually address it. I ask, is abortion God's plan? They counter with, was the atonement predestined? Okay, but that doesn't mean that abortion was God's plan. And they think that the obvious answer is, oh yeah, if God predestined the atonement, then abortion is God's plan. So they literally just take a few examples in scripture of God using sinful acts, which you would expect God in his wisdom to be able to do. And then they fallaciously argue that all sin was God's plan from the beginning. It's, it's total heresy. It goes against the totality of the scriptures. It's an assault on reason and an assault on logic itself. Um, but reason, logic, the totality of scriptures all fall to the wayside because they are pre-committed to this idea that all the sins of history were planned by God in eternity past. Otherwise, they would say God is not sovereign. And something that, you know, you read in a, in a catechism or a systematic theology, but not something that you'll ever find in the Bible. So they never actually address the, the point I make that it's logically fallacious. To say God using sins from men at times does not mean God from eternity planned those sins to happen. I've been preaching here for atonement, which the Bible says. Eleven years. I've been preaching for longer than that. I've been here since 05. Really? Since 2005. Right. And I, when I was on weekly, staff for Ray Comfort with the like Great News me, Network, weekly like me for 11 years. I've been coming here annually for since yeah. 2005. Yeah, right. So yeah. what I would tell you, is listen, you need to take your false gospel. And you don't need this. No, you don't want everyone to be saved, so you're not loving. I want everyone to be saved because I'm, an, I'm, I don't I'm want not any, a Calvinist. No, I don't want anything. I don't. Want Are you more loving than God? Do you want everyone to be saved? No, sir. I don't want anything. That God right. So, you, God so you're not loving. Right. You don't love these people. I do. Yeah, so you, you don't want the them all to repent. You don't. Now here's here's the next one. Uh, if if you recognize that God is righteous in the exercise of grace, that God has freedom, that God has freedom to love, then you are not loving. If you recognize that God is righteous in the exercise of his grace, then God is not loving. That's, that's not what I said at all. Uh, notice he can't deal with my actual point, so he just creates the straw man. If you recognize that God is righteous in the exercise of his grace, that God has freedom, freedom to love, then you are not loving. What? I mean, seriously, this guy's in his own little world. He's building a straw man and he's putting words in my mouth because he can't deal with the actual point that I just made and that point was that if you don't want everyone to be saved then you are not loving towards everyone that's all I said didn't say anything about being righteous in the exercise of grace he's he's in he's Calvinists especially these guys try and reframe the debate trying to put words in your mouth to create a straw man instead of dealing with the actual argument that you're making all I said is if you don't want everyone to be saved then you're not being loving towards everyone. It's a simple point, so don't confuse it, just address it. But you can't, which is the real dilemma for Calvinists. Uh, the Bible says we're to love our neighbors as ourselves, which means we should want everyone to repent and be saved because that's what love demands. That's what we would want for ourselves. But the Bible also says to be imitators of God. So the problem for the Calvinists is that God doesn't want everyone to repent and to be saved in their view. So that's the dilemma between imitating God and not wanting everyone to be saved, and loving your neighbor and wanting everyone to be saved. And as long as they hold to Calvinism, they can't do both. So this is a, a dilemma for the Calvinist. Which one do you go with? Do you love your neighbor as yourself, or do you imitate God? You can't do both. It has nothing to do with, quote, recognizing that God is righteous in the exercise of mercy, or that God has freedom to love. Nobody mentioned any of that. Nobody said any of that. We're not even talking about any of that. So Calvinists resort to a straw man. They put words in your mouth. They try and reframe the debate to fit their canned answers or to reframe it in their favor. I mean, it's a nice try to avoid the dilemma, doctor of theology, but uh, you failed. Uh, your unwillingness to actually address the argument shows your inability to do so.
And so if now no reform person, at least no reform person with any balance or anything else, no reform person claims to know the identity of the elect. And so you preach the gospel to all men and you pray fervently for all men to repent and to come to Christ. All right, again, we see that they back up to their canned answers, their rehearsed answers. None of these guys seem to think for themselves. Nobody knows the identity of the elect, so we preach and pray for all men. That's what he said. Look, that's a great answer to a question nobody asked. Besides, why are you praying for all men to repent and be saved if you don't believe that is God's will? In your view, praying for all men to repent and be saved would be praying that God's will is not done. Just because you don't know the identity of the elect doesn't change that fact. You should be praying for the elect to repent and to be saved, to be consistent with your theology. But Dr. White, uh, well, he's not consistent with his uh, theology. Uh, he is trying to save face here and say, oh, no, we can still be loving. We can still want everyone to repent and to be saved. No, no, you can't. So Emilio here is actually more consistent with Dr. White because Emilio admits that he doesn't want everyone to repent and to be saved because his God doesn't want that. I asked him, do you want everyone to repent and be saved? He said, no, I want, I want what God wants. And his view is that God doesn't want everyone to repent. God doesn't want everyone to be saved. So Emilio is more consistent than James White. James White is, like I said, trying to save face and be like, oh no, we can be loving and be Calvinist. I don't think so. He says that makes you more loving than God. Notice what that requires. If you're going to say that makes you more loving than God, then what you're doing is you are reducing God to the level of a human being and making comparisons between us based upon your ignorance and, and based upon your demotion of God from being God. Demoting God. All right, so if I love everyone and I want everyone to be saved and God doesn't love everyone and doesn't want everyone to be saved, Saying that I am more loving than God is somehow demoting God from his godhood and it brings him down to the level of a man? I mean, what is he even talking about? I think this guy starts talking before he thinks through what he is saying. It's What I'm saying is simple. If I love everyone and God doesn't love everyone, then I am more loving than God. This has nothing to do with demoting God or bringing God down to the level of a man. I just think James White doesn't know what to say. So he just falls back to his rehearsed canned answers, the, this Calvinist rhetoric of demoting God, and uh, even when it doesn't even fit into the discussion at hand. I mean, the argument is simple. If I want everyone to be saved, I'm, love, I'm loving towards everyone, and the Bible says God is love. And there's no way that I could possibly be more loving than the God of the Bible. So if your theology makes me more loving than God, your theology has to be wrong. Because there's no way I could possibly be more loving than God, who is love. And if I want everyone to be saved because I'm loving, then that's exactly what you would expect a loving God to do as well. Which the Bible says, he's not willing that any should perish. And accomplishing his purposes, because you don't believe he has an overarching purpose he can accomplish anyways. Just like the devil, full of false accusations, you don't believe God has any overarching purpose he can accomplish anyways? Dude, what are you talking about? All I've said in this whole debate so far is like, is abortion God's plan? Is homosexuality God's plan? Um, I mean, and somehow he gets out of all of this that God has no overarching purpose to accomplish anyways, in my view. I mean, where does he get this stuff? He just pulls it out of thin air. Here's an accusation, just pull it out of thin air. When did I say God didn't have an overarching purpose? Never. So, listen, I'm not your puppet. Don't put words in my mouth. You know, uh, that's what Calvinists like to do. Um, God does have an overarching purpose. His plan from the beginning was to have a holy people, people who would choose righteousness out of their own free will, who would say no to sin and say no to the devil and say no to temptation, who would choose to be good like he is. And everything that you see God doing from Genesis to Revelation is God's efforts to accomplish that purpose. The flood, the atonement, the prophets, the apostles, the great commission, all of that is so that God can have a holy people. That's his overarching goal, purpose, and plan. Creation, the flood, atonement, regeneration, all of it is so he can have a holy people that serve him out of, his own, out of their own free will. But, I mean, if you can just put words in my mouth, can I put words in your mouth? 
James White doesn't believe that God is a trinity. I mean, you see how stupid that is? It gets us nowhere. I guess your method is this. If you can't address a person's actual arguments, then just, just put words in their mouth. That's, that's his debating style. It's, uh, he, I heard he was supposed to be like some great debater, but honestly, James, you're horrible. I mean, stupid. Debating is not your forte. Uh, I think whatever you're good at, maybe you should stick to it. And I hope that you're good at more things than just drinking Smirnoff. And making comparisons between us based upon your ignorance and based upon your demotion of God from being God and accomplishing his purposes because you don't believe he has a overarching purpose he can accomplish anyways. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's definitely a claim that Jesse Merle ever made. These people are lunatics. I'm glad that I'm not the only one that saw this. Uh, when White can't deal with your actual argument, he simply just, number one, he ignores it. Or two, he changes the topic. Or three, just put words in your mouth. Just ignore it, change the topic, or put words in your mouth. Just watch. That's what he does throughout this whole video. I mean, this guy is really horrible at debating theology. Uh, if you can't deal with the actual points, then just get out of the debate realm. These people are lunatics. I was dealing with the Calvinist, the same type of Calvinist as James White, dealing with him in a di Discord channel. And he's like, well, God can't say that uh, anyone's eternally saved if God could change, if the future's not set. I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, that, that seems psychotic. I mean, I could do things. It's not like I'm particularly powerful, but I could make things come about and do things. So I, I asked him, I said, what's the minimum amount of power is necessary for God to make claims that he could eternally save someone? And and he's like, I don't understand the question. I'm like, what's the minimum amount of power? I mean, I mean, do, do, is it anything less than absolute control of all things? And he said, no. This is how psychotic these people are. If God doesn't control all things to every last particle that exists in the universe, God can't make claims about how he saves people or who he saves and, and what he could do and what he could accomplish. We're dealing with literal, legit lunatics. These people are mentally unstable. All right, yes, Calvinists believe in absolute control in order for God to accomplish anything. Listen to this. This is R.C. Sproul, who's one of the worst. Uh, he wrote a book called Chosen by God. He said, if there is one single molecule in the universe running around loose, totally free of God's sovereignty, then we can have no guarantee that a single promise of God will ever be fulfilled. So he says, one rogue molecule could undo all of God's plans and purposes. God can't accomplish anything if he grants free will to anyone or anything. So what R.C. Sproul is saying is that God must control everything if he's going to accomplish anything. This is utter nonsense. See, the reason I can't be a Calvinist, besides the fact that I read the Bible for myself, is uh, something called reason and logic. I just, my mind cannot accept their fallacious reasoning and argumentation. So we ourselves don't control everything, yet we make future plans and bring them to pass all the time. So have you ever promised to your kids to bring them to an amusement park and then make it happen? We also do things all the time that involve the free will choices of others without controlling their will. Like I've already said, every seminary in the country promises classes to future students without controlling the wills of their professors. To say that God cannot accomplish anything without controlling everything is to say that God cannot do what men do all the time. So Calvinists make God less than a man. It's a weak and impotent God who cannot grant free will to his creatures and yet still accomplish plans and purposes. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thy and thy seed may live. So God grants free will. Well, you're that if you if you do, it's a very vague general thing and not a specific thing. Again, just false accusations. Uh, you know, if he does have an overarching purpose, it's just a vague, general, nothing specific. People living wholly by their own free will, guided by faith, under the influence of grace. I mean, uh, heaven in in heaven, happy and holy forever. Very specific. So he just makes things up, just pulls them out of thin air. Oh, if you do. He says, Ew, if you do, see, he doesn't even know what he's talking about. He's just making it up as he goes along. He's speaking out of ignorance. 
The Bible says a fool answers a matter before he hears it. That's what the Bible says. So I believe, as already stated, that God has very specific overarching purposes. It's obvious that this guy is just relying on his usual canned answers that a typical Calvinist uh, rhetoric uh, uh, would apply um, to somebody. He doesn't actually know what my theology is. He doesn't actually know what I believe. He's addressing a matter before he hears it. He's just talking. Sometimes it seems like for the sake of talking. Again, he's ignoring the actual arguments that I'm making, that I made just because uh, God incorporated the sins of some men into his plans to set for the sacrifice of Christ doesn't mean that all sin was God's plan from the beginning throughout human history. Uh, I mean, that's just a solid point that James White has yet to address or to refute. It's just simple logic. So the the idea is, and it and it's a it's a very vacuous argument that I am that you I am I'm more loving than your God. Um, Oh yeah, it's just a very vacuous argument. Again, you see, you see James White just struggling to answer, like he doesn't really know what to say. It's a simple argument. I want everyone to be saved. Your God doesn't want everyone to be saved. Therefore, I am more loving than your God. It's not vacuous. It's a syllogism. This is a legitimate, solid argument. The Bible says God is love. So any theology that makes me more loving than God cannot be a biblical theology. Calvinism makes me more loving than God. Therefore, Calvinism cannot be a biblical theology. Well, you can't save anybody. You don't have the power to save anybody. Uh, I never said I could. Uh, once again, just Calvinism fails. Calvinism is contradicting the Bible. Uh, White shows that he doesn't actually know the scriptures. Uh, he knows his theological training. He n doesn't really know the scriptures, uh, nor does he believe the scriptures. He believes just Calvinist cliches. You can't save anybody. That's just a Calvinist cliche. Uh, it's not a scripture. The Calvinist cliche that I can't save anyone, only God can, is not biblically accurate. The Bible says uh, in James 5.20, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. You see, evangelism makes a difference. Witnessing and warning people makes a difference. You can save a soul from death. 1 Corinthians 4.15 For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. And so we have the preacher of the word who can actually save souls with the help of the Holy Spirit and with the gospel of Christ. Uh, even Peter in the book of Acts commanded men to save yourselves. So not only do preachers save souls, but sinners can save themselves. How do they do that? Well, Peter said, repent and believe. That's how a sinner saves himself, by turning to Christ. I like William Booth of the Salvation Army used to put out a sign in front of their meeting hall that said, save your souls. That's great. So the salvation of a soul is not a monergistic work of God, where God alone, or mono, is active. Uh, the Holy Spirit has a role, the Word of God has a role, the preacher has a role, the sinner himself has a role. Uh, that's the, what the scriptures, the totality of the scriptures teach. That's why Charles Finney said, conversion and regeneration are sometimes in the Bible ascribed to God and sometimes to man and sometimes to the subject because we all have our role. The sinner has to repent and believe. The word needs to be preached. The preacher needs to preach it. The Holy Spirit comes to convict them. So it's this understanding that gives evangelism real urgency and it elevates evangelism in its work to of extreme and uh, eternal importance. Uh, their souls right now that could be saved by your labor, who would be damned if you neglect it. Uh, we now have uh, a way, we, we now are determining and affecting the future, even the eternal destiny of souls. In light of the biblical doctrines of like synergism and the open view of the future, we see the vitality or the vitalness um, of fulfilling the Great Commission. The, we start to feel the heavy weight of, uh, of responsibility to seek and to save the lost. And so, you know, get out there and win some souls. But he's saying, oh, um, you can't, you know, my argument that I'm more loving than God is vacuous because I can't save anybody. Uh, that doesn't actually refute the point that I want everyone to be saved and your God doesn't. 
And that means, and since wanting everyone to be saved is a loving thing, then I'm being more loving than your God is. Your God does not have the power to save anybody. Just mention that in passing. All right, so he says, your God can't save anybody. Again, he's just putting words in my mouth. I never said or implied any of that. All I've said at this point is, uh, what he's supposed to be addressing is, I want everyone to be saved, and so I'm more loving than your God. Oh, your God can't save anybody. What are you talking about? James White's just speaking out of an assumption, out of ignorance. He's acting like Calvinism has an exclusive claim on God's ability to save. Uh, what he's talking about is, you know, irresistible grace, uh, unconditionally saving whoever he wants. Uh, that's not the God of the Bible. God does have the power to save, but he also has the power to usurp a person's free will, but those are not one and the same thing. Because I don't believe that God uses irresistible grace in salvation. Well, he thinks that I believe God doesn't have the power to save anyone. No. God uses means consistent with man's free will uh, to save him. God uses means consistent with freedom in salvation. God does have the power to save, that he uses that power in a way that's consistent with man's free moral agency. Uh, that's what we see in Isaiah 5, 4. He says, uh, what more could uh, I have done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it should bring forth wild grapes. Well, why didn't he try a sovereign decree? Why didn't he try monergistic regeneration? See, he's talking about means consistent with their free will. In Matthew 23, 37, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you would not. So again, it sounds like uh, he gave them free will. He didn't use a sovereign decree to make it irresistible. He didn't monergistically regenerate them. You just, you cannot find Calvinism in the Bible. I see free will all throughout the Bible. Isaiah 59, 1-2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. So this verse is saying that it isn't that God cannot save, but that men are choosing not to be saved. And instead of choosing to sin, and instead they're choosing to sin, that God is respecting their free will. His arm of salvation is stretched out towards them, but they're choosing not to grab a hold of it. You know, the Bible also says, uh, um, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be uh, red as scarlet, they will be, um, you shall be white as snow. And so here, you see, God uses the means of reasoning to regenerate a sinner, to change and transform a sinner, uh, consistent with their free will. Romans 10, 21 says, But to Israel, he says, All day long have I stretched forth my hand unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. The Bible also says, Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. The Bible says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Salvation is synergistic. <laughs> Just because God gives men free will and he uses means consistent with their freedom in securing their salvation does not mean that God has no power to save anybody. I mean, what, what a, a straw man. What an exaggeration. What a false accusation. The fact that James White is just resorting to these pathetic straw men shows that he actually can't refute my theology at all. I mean, seriously, he, he's horrible at this. Theology is not his thing. Stick to whatever you're good at. Yeah, you're literally dealing with cultists. You're, you're wasting your time interacting with these people. They're, they're not honest. They're, they're, they don't have intellectual integrity. They misrepresent. They purposely don't understand. It, it's just sometimes it's a waste of time. All right, I've been studying Calvinism for 19 years now. I've been dealing with Calvinists for that long, and I think Chris is probably right. It's, it's, it's mostly a waste of time. I do it for the sake of other people who are watching and listening. Um, they are intellectually dishonest. They put words in your mouth. They built straw men. They literally, I mean, all I've said in this video is homosexuality, God's plan, is abortion God's plan. I'm more loving than your God because I want everyone to be saved. And somehow White's got in this whole, you don't believe in any overarching plan of God. Your God doesn't have the power to save anyone. I mean, no, no, nothing I've said uh, implies or alludes to any of that. 
So the guy, he's a liar. He's a deceiver. Uh, the more that he talks, the more that he just slanders. Um, but that, that comes from the devil, not from God. Um, and so we're, we're, we're comparing apples and oranges here. We're talking about a sovereign God who has the right to be free in the expression of his mercy and his grace. If you can't find that in Scripture, if you can't, if you can't read the Old Testament and go, hmm, Israel, Egypt, hmm, dealing with these in different ways. But nobody is denying that God is free in his expression of mercy and grace. He said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. He says, repent, turn to God, do works, meet for repentance. The Bible says, uh, he that... Uh, covers his sin will not prosper, but whosoever uh, confesses and, and, and forsaketh his sin uh, shall find mercy. The Bible says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord our God and uh, he will have mercy and abundantly pardon. So God is free in the expression of his mercy. He lays out the conditions. He says, those who forsake their sin will have mercy. Those who do not repent and believe will be damned. So he's free in the exercise of his mercy. Nobody's debating that. But what you're promoting, Dr. James White, is God being arbitrary in the expression of his mercy and grace. I believe that God has chosen to give grace and mercy to those who repent, to those who humble themselves, that God is free to determine the conditions by which man must be saved, and he uh, creates those conditions out of his wisdom and out of his love and not out of any arbitrariness. Um, in order to be a recipient of his grace, you need to meet those conditions. I fully believe God is free in the exercise of his mercy and grace. God's not obligated to forgive anyone. Now, in Calvinism, God is obligated to save everyone that Jesus died for because it would be unjust, they claim, in a penal substitution for God to punish the same sins twice. So actually, James White does not believe God is free in the exercise of his mercy once the atonement has been made. He must, by justice, spare those for whom Jesus died. I believe those Jesus died for can still perish. And uh, that's what the Bible says. Uh, don't cause your brother to stumble for, or to perish for whom Christ died. Or um, the false teachers deny the Lord who bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Or if we sin willfully after we receive a knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin because you're trampling the blood of Christ underfoot. So I believe that those Jesus died for can still perish and therefore their uh, salvation is purely a matter of grace. White doesn't believe that. But I reject the idea, the Calvinistic idea, that God is not willing that all should come to repentance. They reject the idea that God is, uh, or they teach the idea that God is willing that most people should perish. They teach that God takes pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now, did God treat Israel and Egypt differently? Yeah, but nobody said God treats all men the same. God treats each man according to their works. God treats each man according to their merits and their demerits. He will judge you by your works. Uh, so he's fair in that he judges all men according to their works. God being fair doesn't mean he, he treats everyone the same in the exact same way. I think capitalism is fair. You, even though you have the rich and you have the poor, uh, people get what they earn. People get what they work for. So the socialist tries to say, oh, capitalism isn't fair. F fairness isn't paying everyone equally. That's what socialism tries to say, but not everyone works equally. Not everyone is equally skilled. Not everyone contributes to society equally. So socialism is unjust, even though they claim it to be equal. Capitalism is equal, even though they claim it to be unjust. And you see the same thing here. Um, he's saying that, uh, you know, oh, God didn't treat everyone the same way. Yeah, nobody said that he did or that he had to. So he's fair in the sense that he provided the atonement whereby all men could be saved. But that doesn't mean that everyone gets the identical treatment. So White forgets God's overarching purpose with Israel, which was to be a light onto the nations, uh, which includes Egypt. He chose Abraham to be a light or to be the father of many nations, that in his seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. So Israel became um, Calvinistic in their thinking that, oh, they're the chosen people, that God only cared for them. When in reality, God wanted to reach the entire world through Israel, including Egypt. God said to Abraham that his seed uh, shall, 
uh, be a blessing to all nations. I already said that. Israel was God's chosen people, but that doesn't negate God's benevolent heart for the whole world. The Calvinists are just like the Israelites. They think that they are the chosen people and that God doesn't really care about everyone else. Just like uh, the people, the Jews of Jesus' day. From his perspective, he must have dealt with them all the same way, right? Because he's equally loving to all. No, that's a, uh, it makes no sense whatsoever. But, hey, you know, that's what heresy does to you. Just put more arguments in my mind. I never said any of that stuff. So again, he's speaking out of ignorance and presumption, uh, putting words in my mouth. I just explained that's not the case. I mean, why can't James White just actually deal with the words that have come out of my mouth without reframing the debate, creating straw men, saying things I didn't actually say? Um, it's because he can't refute the actual points that I've made. So far, all I've said is that I want everyone to be saved, so I'm more loving than the God of Calvinism. And therefore, the God of Calvinism cannot be the God of the Bible. Because there's no way that I'm more loving than the God of the Bible. So white only gets worse from here on out. Them all to be so saved Jesse, you won't answer the question. So the cross is not part of God's plan, is that right? No, I said God can incorporate some sins. I didn't ask you what he could do. God can you, incorporate all help. some sins, but that, but that doesn't answer mean the all sin. Let me ask you this. When they sacrifice no, their you won't babies, answer the question if I, I've the answered cross it multiple times. is part of God's plan or not, yes or no. When, when they were sacrificing their babies to Israel, Israel. No, Calvinism you can use it. Is, I've exposed Calvinism time and time Jesse, again. Jesse, you can use a million different examples, but if you want Listen, to answer the central issue... I'm here because I love these people. I'm happens. not here to debate with you hateful Calvinists, right, right. you heretical Calvinists. You don't want everyone to be saved. I do. I want so every, I don't care if you God call my gospel... Like uh, you know, the funny thing is, we're actually the ones that believe that if God wanted to save everybody, he could. It's not his choice to do so. He chooses, likewise, to justly bring judgment. You don't... Your God can't even do that. That's beyond his capacity and power. All right. He says, we are the ones that believe God could save everyone if he wanted to. So Calvinism says God could have saved everyone, but he decided not to because he prefers that most people sin and burn in hell forever. And that's what he prefers. That's what he wants. So they don't believe in a loving God. It's my belief in a loving God that has always kept me from embracing Calvinism. Because I could never believe that God wanted to change and bless my life with salvation and not those of all of my family or all of my friends around me. So I witness and I evangelize all over the nation because I want God to do for them what he did for me. And I believe, based on the Bible and on my conscience, that God is a benevolent God who doesn't want anyone to sin, who wants everyone to repent, who wants everyone to be saved, who wants everyone to be eternally blessed and happy. Uh, but he says, oh, we are the ones who believe God could save if he wanted to. So he is implying uh, that we believe God wants uh, to save everyone, but he, he just can't, as if it's a question of God's power and ability as if salvation's a matter of uh, brute force and omnipotence. The Calvinists turn salvation purely into a matter of, matter of brute force. So they don't understand that salvation, regeneration, repentance, they're moral changes that must be brought about by moral means consistent with our free moral agency. The matter of salvation is not a matter of brute force. God does not violate a man's free moral agency in the salvation of sinners. Not everyone is saved Though God wants everyone to be saved, not because God lacks omnipotent power, but because he has established conditions of salvation that must be met by man's free will. Oh, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So, we see that man can neglect salvation. It's not that God wants everyone to be saved unconditionally, but lacks the power to bring it to pass, but God wants everyone to be saved conditionally which means it's up to man to meet those conditions, which means not everyone is guaranteed to be saved. So God said that he repent, God said, uh, repent and believe, those who repent and believe will be saved, those who don't will be damned. It's simply that uh, God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But uh, if they don't come to repentance, uh, then it's his wisdom and his justice that demands that they should perish. So the God of the Bible prefers mercy over judgment, 
whenever it can be safely and wisely granted. The problem in Calvinism is that God prefers judgment over mercy, not wanting everyone to repent so that he could then flex his muscles to the universe and show everyone how just he is for damning men for doing the sins which they couldn't help but to do because they were predestined by him to do them before they were born. So the fact is there's no true justice or mercy in Calvinism. No justice because men are punished for their sins when they had no free will and no mercy because, well, all sin is punished either in Christ or in us, so no sin's ever forgiven. All right, I'm going to go take a break. Check. All right, one, two, microphone check. Day two, video response to Dr. James White. All right. And for anybody to stand there, uh, you know, blasting everybody as heretics, all right, so look, I've been dealing with Calvinists for like 19 years, and I'm just playing the game by their playbook. Uh, this is how they operate. I knew that Emilio came up to me to try and uh, confront me on film as a uh, heretic, and so I just beat him to the punch, and I called him a her uh, heretic first, and he's just upset that I uh, took the sail out of his wind. I turned it around, I turned the tables on him, you know, checkmate. Uh, so they're just... Uh, They've been calling me a heretic for years, saying that, you know, oh, I worship a false god. Fine. Okay. I just accepted this premise that we're worshiping different gods. And if that's the case, uh, they're heretics because I worship the God of the Bible. Uh, our God is different. Uh, so it's your God that's false, not mine. It's your theology that's heresy, not mine. And I can prove it biblically and exegetically uh, using sound hermeneutics. So there you have it. Here's my friend Chris Fisher again. And for anybody to stand there, uh, you know, blasting everybody as heretics, when he doesn't even believe that. <laughs> oh, 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 okay, James White. James White's like, oh, you're a heretic, blah, blah, blah. This Calvinist in the video, you're a heretic, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, now Jesse Morrell called us heretics. Oh, oh, I'm sick. I mean, this is just how uh, Calvinists play the theology game. They establish themselves as the default orthodox position, even though they are a, uh, a Gnostic aberration. And then they blast any theology that contradicts their Calvinism uh, oh, as heresy. I mean, this is just how they get down. It's just how they play the game. And they can give it, but they can't seem to take it. They can call other people heretics, but if you call them heretics, oh, they freak out. Uh, they are really just mad that I pulled out the H word before they did. Uh, I beat Emilio to it because I foresaw it coming. And so, look, even open theists uh, believe in uh, foreknowledge because I can uh, foresee it coming. Uh, but they want to call open theists heretics. Uh, but they don't want open theists to call them heretics. Uh, sorry, that's not how it works. You can't have it both ways. Uh, if, you're, if you want us to accept your premise, uh, then uh, fine, we'll accept it. We worship different gods, and uh, you're the one worshiping a false god. So remember, it was your camp who drew out uh, those lines first. And so don't be upset when we simply recognize uh, the lines in the sand that you yourself uh, have drawn. It's just, you know, you're the one on the wrong side. When he doesn't even believe that his God knew when he created that they would be standing there on that sidewalk doing this. Because there's no way God could have known that. All right. Once again, what we see James White doing is just dodging my point, not even addressing the point that I made in the video, and just giving his own counterpoint to avoid dealing with the actual issue. I said that according to the Bible, God said, neither came it into my mind that they would do such a thing, uh, referring to babies being sacrificed to Baals. Yet Calvinism says that it was God's idea. And therefore, in Calvinism, uh, you know, sin originated in God's mind when the Bible says, neither came it into my mind. So I said Calvinism is heresy since it contradicts the Bible by saying that uh, child sacrifice originated in God's mind. And rather than addressing that point, that they are contradicting the Bible and therefore they are heretics. Uh, he simply launches his own counter argument and attack on open theism, uh, which wasn't even the issue of debate. Uh, he's just bypassing the point that I made. Um, so he's just uh, giving his own counter argument about whether God knew at creation whether there would be a sidewalk 
at this moment and blah, blah, blah. Listen, who cares? Uh, that's not what we're even talking about. So just stay on topic. What we're talking about is child sacrifice. Did that originate in the eternal mind of God? Uh, when God says, clearly, uh, neither came it into my mind. So his whole technique of debate is to ignore my points and then just assert his own uh, tiresome arguments and launch his own uh, uh, attacks without actually addressing the points that I'm raising. He's going to say later on in regards to open theism, God knows everything that is knowable. That's the standard open theist thing. Um, he, he knows all truth, but not since, since free will choices are, are, don't exist and they cannot be known. That's the, that's the open theist thing. That means when God created, he did not know that Jesse Morrell would even exist because Jesse Morrell is the result of many free choices of free creatures. He didn't know any of us would do this. He did not know this was going to happen. All right, so in open theism, God foreknows the future as it is. Whatever the nature of the future is, that's what God's foreknowledge corresponds to. So you have necessities, you have certainties, and you have contingencies. Any parts of the future that are necessities, God knows as necessities. Uh, well, for example, um, there will be a judgment day. That's a necessity of God's nature. So he foreknows judgment day as a necessity. It will happen. It must happen. Uh, then there's certainties. Uh, now, while a necessity uh, must happen, uh, certainties will happen. Um, there are certain things that God has uh, planned to happen. Uh, he's still you know, capable of changing his mind on those things, like destroying Nineveh. He determined that to happen, then he changed his mind. Um, but he, he can foreknow certain future events as certain because that's what they currently are. Uh, because he's predetermined uh, certain things to happen, or the devil has already made plans about the future, uh, like you see in the book of Revelation. And then there's contingencies. And that's when you see God speaking in terms of ifs or maybes. He said, maybe they will listen. Maybe they will repent. Um, so God foreknows future contingencies as contingencies, or you would call them uh, possibilities. So in open theism, God has foreknowledge of the future, the debate is what is the future that God foreknows. In the Calvinist system, the future is all predetermined. It's all predestined. And so he foreknows all future events as predestined. But in the open theistic worldview, there's necessities, there's uh, certainties, and there's contingencies, and God foreknows each of those as they are. And so, uh, anyways, that's that. So in open theism, God can and does predestine uh, future events. So it's really not true what James White said that, oh, there's no way God could have known that. Uh, that's an exaggeration of open theism. There's no way God could have foreknown uh, that that sidewalk would be there or that we would be there. God could have predestined that. Uh, you see in the Bible, uh, God foreknew that King Cyrus, uh, his name was you know, uh, prophesied hundreds of years before the fact, and God predestined it to happen that way. And so God, in open theism, is free to decide future events because the future is open to God, and therefore it's open for him to decide. See, if God from eternity just foreknew everything that would happen with certainty, then everything is already settled in his mind, and God would not be free to determine anything. But if God stands there with uh, open possibilities that he can choose between, then God is free to decide uh, events to happen. So anything that God predetermines, uh, God foreknows as predetermined, and anything that God leaves open, God foreknows as open. Uh, this isn't really complicated. So when he says God cannot uh, know future events in open theism, that's just an, an exaggerated uh, straw man. Uh, God knows future events through different means. For example, he, he can foreknow future events through predetermination, like you see in Acts chapter 4, where he predetermined the cross of the sacrifice of Christ to happen. Uh, God can also foreknow events through extrapolation. Um, that's what you see in Deuteronomy uh, 31, 20 to 21, where he says that he knows that they will uh, disobey him because of what is currently in their hearts. So God can look at the present and extrapolate the future 
as a result. I mean, even we can do that. I know my wife will always choose uh, you know, chocolate ice cream over vanilla ice cream because I know her past and I know her, her, uh, you know, her taste. And so she will always choose chocolate over vanilla. Now, is she free to choose vanilla? She's free to, but knowing her, her past, knowing her character, I can extrapolate. It was actually David Ravenhill who first uh, gave me that analogy because uh, he was the first one that introduced me to these biblical concepts of, uh, of open theism. The open future. And David Ravenhill is the son of, uh, of Leonard Ravenhill, who was my favorite preacher. Anyways, the Calvinist uh, f uh, fallacy is to assume that God foreknows all future events as certainties, and they argue that God must have predestined everything since he foreknows all future events as certainties. Uh, but that's eisegesis. Iso that's an eisegetical view of foreknowledge, inserting their own views of foreknowledge into the Bible that really aren't biblical. The biblical view of foreknowledge is that God can foreknow things through uh, predest predestination or through extrapolation, and it's not that he foreknows all future events as certainties, and therefore he's predestined all future events. Uh, that's just not what the Bible teaches at all. Um. You standing there talking about that and then blasting at us for having an orthodox biblical perspective. <laughs> in, in orthodox biblical perspective, that babies being aborted is God's plan, that's this guy's idea of orthodoxy. That God from eternity predestined millions and millions of babies to be aborted. And he says that's an orthodox position. Uh, is abortion God's secret plan? That's what you call orthodoxy. Uh, God separated himself as far as possible uh, from child sacrifices. He says, I commanded it not, neither came it into my mind, and yet Calvinists like James White say that God secretly decreed it, that it originated in his mind, and then he calls himself uh, you know, orthodox, his view as an orthodox position. I mean, seriously, James, you're nuts. That's just, it's blasphemy, it's demonic, it's slander, it's heresy. You're accusing God of planning the murder of millions and millions of babies and then calling that orthodoxy when God in the Bible separated himself as far as he possibly could from those types of actions. I mean, you're literally calling biblical truth heresy and you're calling heresy biblical truth. I mean, Calvinism is not just heresy because I say it is. It's been condemned as heresy all throughout church history. The Calvinist doctrine of predestination, limited atonement, irresistible grace, they were all condemned throughout church history. Uh, Lucidus was condemned by the Council of Oral in 473 and the Council of Aries in uh, 475 and the Council of Orange in 529 and he was teaching these things like double predestination and limited atonement. Uh, Gottschalk, who German fellow, was condemned by the Council at Mentz in 848, condemned, uh, condemned by the Council of uh, uh, Chisery in 8 uh, 49. And so when you when you appeal to this issue of uh, orthodoxy, you're literally appealing to uh, church councils and popularity vote and Calvinists claim to be, uh, you know, sola scriptura. But then they appeal to things like the Synod of Dort in uh, 1618 to 1619. Uh, of course, don't forget the Council of uh, Constance in 1414 for John Huss, the Council of Worms for, uh, in 1521 for Martin Luther, the Council of Trent in 1561 for the Protestants. No matter how you like it, Calvinism is really not orthodoxy at all. Neither is it biblical. You say, oh, but those were Catholic councils. Yeah, and so are the councils that condemned Pelagianism, which the, uh, which the Calvinists always appeal to. The Calvinists say, oh, Pelagianism has been condemned throughout church history. And then they start appealing to the um, Catholic councils that Augustine was a part of and that came after him. Well, look, the point is Calvinism is an aberration uh, a Gnostic heresy that came into the church through Augustine and then spread through Luther and Calvin. Um, it's been condemned throughout church history and as much as these Calvinists claim to be uh, the standard of orthodoxy, uh, it's, it's just a, a lie, a complete and total fabrication. It's not biblical and it's not orthodox. 
because it's so painfully obvious that none of the prophets believed in open theism or anything like this. I mean, it's just so plainly a shallow way around dealing with what the Bible actually teaches, that it's... All right. He couldn't be more wrong. Uh, Jonah was an open theist. That's why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He thought he could change the future. And uh, he knew that God repents. That's what it says in Jonah chapter 4. And he knew that if he preached to them and they repented, God would repent of the destruction. And he didn't want God to uh, spare them. And so Jonah, the whole story of Jonah is uh, open theistic. The reason that, uh, I mean, he said in 40 days you will be overthrown. Well, if you don't have an open theist perspective, God was lying to them. If God knew from eternity that he wasn't going to destroy them in 40 days, uh, and yet he said that he would, then God lied to them. In the open theistic worldview, uh, God did not lie at all because that was true at the time. That was the tendency of uh, the course of history at the time. And when they repented and God saw their repentance and then God repented or changed his mind about destroying them, the future literally was changed. And so uh, only in the open theistic worldview can you understand things like canceled prophecy like you have in Jonah. Uh, Jeremiah 18 says the same thing. God said, if I declare to a city that I will bless it because of their righteousness, but they turn from their righteousness and turn to sin, I will repent of the, th of the blessings I said I would bless them with. Or he says, if I say to a city that I will uh, you know, destroy them and curse them because of their wickedness, if they repent of their wickedness, then I will repent of the uh, destruction that I pronounced against them. So you see, there is in the Bible um, contingent prophecies. And those are prophecies that are at times canceled and even reversed. And that shows an open theistic worldview. Uh, Isaiah is a prime example of that. God told Isaiah, to go talk to Hezekiah and tell Hezekiah that you will die and not live. And Hezekiah prayed and said, God, remember my righteousness. And God heard his prayers and then sent Isaiah back and told him, well, well tell Hezekiah that, um, that you will live and not die and I'm adding 15 years to your life. So it was a complete and total reversal. The first prophecy got completely canceled that Hezekiah would die and not live. And then he added 15 years to his life. In other words, he changed the future. So there is another perfect example in the prophets of uh, open theism. And then, uh, well, Ezekiel as well. Ezekiel was told to lay on his side and to cook his food off of human dung. And then he, uh, he reasoned with God and God said, fine, you can use animal dung. And so God repented and changed his mind. Uh, the negotiations between Abraham and God over Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, God changed his mind multiple times in that narrative. So all throughout uh, the Bible, you see um, open theism, that the prophets were in fact open theists. Uh, not only that, Jesus was an open theist. Because Jesus said things like, um, for, the day, for the sake of the elect, those days have been shortened. Now, shortening the days means changing the future. And changing the future is open theism. Or he said, um, uh, he said that he could pray for 12 legions of angels to deliver him from the cross. So that's an open theistic view of the future. That Jesus had a free will and he could choose between going to the cross or praying for 12 legions of angels. He had a choice between the two. And uh, all the prophecies about his, his sacrifice uh, could have been canceled if he prayed for 12 legions of angels. It's like he was rebuking his disciples for not being open theists because he said to them, you know, don't you know that I could pray for 12 legions of angels and they would come and deliver me? And so prayer is open theism. Uh, anytime you pray for the future, uh, you're assuming that it hasn't yet been decided or that your prayers could contribute to it or that if it has been decided that it can still be changed. And that's why Jesus also taught, he said, pray that your flight not be in winter. Well, what sense does that make if it's already been predetermined from eternity whether your flight will be in winter or not? And so when he says, pray that your flight not be in winter, that assumes that you offer up your prayers to God. He will listen to your prayers and then determine the future um, accordingly, that he'll take into consideration your prayers when he determines the future. So Jesus was an open theist. So um, there's also a prophet 
who tried to persuade Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Remember, he took his belt off and said, the man who wears this belt will be bound in Jerusalem. And uh, the whole point was to try to persuade Paul not to go to Jerusalem. So there's another example of a prophet who believed in a changeable future. In fact, many times, prophecy is used to change the future. Uh, God sent Jonah to prophesy uh, in order to change their future, that they might repent, and that the destruction in 40 days uh, would be canceled. Uh, this prophet in the book of Acts, who tried to persuade Paul not to go, gave his prophecy to try and change the future. And so all of the prophets uh, were o open theists. They all had an open view of the future. They understood prophecy, not in the Calvinistic sense, they understood prophecy in the open theistic sense. And so um, all the prophets were open theists. The whole point about prophecy is to warn people to avoid what is being prophesied in order to change the future. Um, just to give you the scriptural references, it was in Matthew 26, 53, that Jesus said he could pray for 12 legions of angels to deliver him from the cross. Uh, Matthew 24, 22, Jesus said that for the sake of the elect, the tribulation has been shortened. In other words, the future was changed. And in Matthew 24, 20, uh, he said, pray that your flight not be in winter. So there's countless examples of the future being changed throughout the Bible. Uh, Exodus 32, God said he would make a nation out of Moses and destroy Israel. And Moses interceded and changed God's mind. Jonah 3, we already talked about that. Um, Isaiah 38 with uh, Hezekiah and Isaiah, we talked about that. And then Abraham negotiating with God in Genesis 18. Uh, God looked for an intercessor to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge that he would not destroy them, and yet he found none. That's Ezekiel 22. So here you see God has an open future, that he's looking for an intercessor who would stand in the gap, make up the head so that he would not destroy them, that's future number one, um, but he found none. So there's future number B, destruction. So destroy them or not destroy them, contingent on an intercessor. So the future was open to God and God um, declared it to be that way. So the list can go on and on. Open theism is taught from Genesis to Revelation. Only the open theist can explain all the prophecies of the Bible. The Calvinist can, explain, uh, can try to explain um, prophecies that talk about, you know, it was predestined or um, it happened. Um, but they can't explain canceled prophecy. They can't explain contingent prophecy. Uh, the open theist can explain all of it. Because in the open theistic worldview, uh, you can have predeterminations and uh, open possibilities. It's both. So we embrace the totality of Scripture. So the biblical truth of open, the open theism is simply this, that God is sovereign and God can change the future whenever he sees fit. And that's what Jeremiah 18 is all about. And so in open theism, uh, God is sovereign to change the future. In Calvinism, God's not really sovereign. He's not sovereign because he can't change the future. He's not free to change his mind. He's not free to determine between all alternative possibilities. So the future is not fixed from eternity uh, God is the potter and we are the clay, the Bible says. So the, that's Jeremiah 18. And so the future is not cement, at least not all of the future. Um, the future is clay in God's hands. We say, well, what about the book of Revelation? Is that subject to change? You know, I don't think the end of the world is subject to change. It's going to happen. Uh, but what is subject to change is uh, when is it going to happen? The Bible says, like in uh, the epistles of Peter, that God uh, delays his judgment. And so God can delay it. Um, but I think his plans about how he's going to destroy the world is already set. Uh, the devil's plans on how he's going to try to attack uh, and to make war in heaven. Uh, the devil's already made his plans and the whole thing's going to happen when the world is uh, reprobate in mind and heart and they don't repent and uh, you can extrapolate that just by the tendency of the course of history and uh, the, way, uh, the way the world always, always tends. And so I don't think um, the book of Revelation is subject to change, but what is subject to change is um, when is it going to happen? Jesus said, no one knows the day nor the hour, but the Father in heaven. So even Jesus didn't know the day or the hour. Um, God can delay it as he sees fit. So that's what the Bible teaches. <sighs>
Paul's yes. gospel. I'm here because God sent me. I, I just say God the Bible told me says. to go and preach the gospel to every creature. The Bible says Jesus came to death for every man. That's what the Bible says. Every man. That's what it says. God says for the people. Who are you? Yeah, if he died for everyone, that includes his people. If he died for everyone, that includes believers. So yes, he died for You won't answer the question, do you? I'll tell you this much. I know you don't like it because Acts chapter 4 says that the cross is part of God's predeterminate plan. Of course it was. I already admitted it was. Okay, so then God God predetermined so do you think the it's crucifixion evil? of Christ. So do you think it's evil he could have done it many ways. Christ? Yeah, I think it was an evil thing that they did. And yet God can, and God God can get good God things it. out of evil. And God, oh, okay, so then you... God can get good things out of evil. What does it say? To do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Speaking specifically of the acts of Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel. They were doing what God predestined to occur. Not he's trying to get something good out of some instances of man's evil. All right. Uh, actually, that's exactly what you see. What Herod and Pilate did was evil, and God got good out of it uh, in the sacrifice of Christ, and that was for the salvation of the world. And so this is a prime example of God getting good out of evil. Uh, again, the problem is that the Calvinist thinks that if God has any plans for the future, that those plans means that God is causing everyone to do what they did who was involved, that he can't just incorporate their free will choices into his plans, that he must be causing them to do it. Um, but that's not, that's not necessary at all, which we already talked about that. So it doesn't mean just because God um, planned the crucifixion of Christ and that involved the free will choices of men who did evil things, it doesn't mean that all sin was God's plan from the beginning. That's the actual point that's been uh, brought up multiple times, which they've never addressed. The logical disconnect between the atonement, which involved the sins of men, and God somehow predetermining all sins from eternity past, uh, the, there's no logical connection there. Uh, the atonement of Christ does not mean that abortion is God's secret will, uh, which is what Emilio is trying to argue and what James White believes. Um, what we've already agreed on is that it was determined to happen. The cross was determined to happen. There's no dispute there. They keep trying to go back to this, oh, it was predetermined, it was predetermined. We agree it was predetermined. What we don't agree on is that that proves that all sin is predetermined or that predeterminations necessarily involve a, uh, a causation um, which is, you know, vi a violation of a man's free will. So the dispute is really whether God planned all sin from the beginning and their argument on the atonement does not prove it. So they're lacking proof for their assertions. Again, slain from the foundation of the world is the Greek word apo and not pro, and it means away from. Same word used to mean cleanse us from our sins. Uh, it signifies a separation. Uh, with the foundation of the world, it means after the foundation of the world, since the foundation of the world, from the foundation of the world. So the Calvinist argument that the cross was God's plan from eternity, uh, and therefore sin, that made the cross necessary was God's plan from eternity. It's just a blatantly false argument uh, built upon uh, eisegesis and it has no actual biblical support. So it doesn't say that the cross was God's plan before the foundation of the world, but after the foundation of the world. And that's when the first sin happened, was at the foundation of the world when Adam and Eve sinned. Um, they're never consistent because... It, how in the world could an open theist... See, an open theist does not believe that God has any purpose that he can predestine to occur. Wow. Talk about ignorance and an exaggerated straw man. He says an open theist doesn't believe that God has any purpose that he can predestine to occur. I mean, seriously, James, what are you talking about? You're just pulling these things out of thin air. You're obviously not a scholar. You haven't studied open theism. You're talking about things you know nothing of. You can't find a single open theist theologian who would say or ever has said uh, such a thing. Now, 
a quick side point about open theist theologians. Um, people think this open theism, uh, you know, is started like in the 1990s with some liberal theologians. It, it, there's actually a history throughout the um, the Arminian. Uh, Reformation. Um, in fact, the first, uh, you know, real theologian to write extensively on an open view of the future was L.D. McCabe, and he was a Methodist theologian. So it's interesting that James White will say that Calvinists and Arminians are the, you know, the the realm of orthodoxy, but things like open theism are outside the realm the realm of orthodoxy. When the open view of the future was taught by Arminians. Um, of course, John Miley was another great Arminian uh, theologian. Um, he taught the uh, governmental view of the atonement. Um, but, you know, Calvinists try to make penal substitution, like the standard view of the atonement. Um, Adam Clark was an Arminian, had uh, some great commentaries, but he had an uh, s uh, open theistic view of uh, limited foreknowledge. Um, so if you're going to say that Arminians are orthodox, you can't say that uh, open theism is outside of orthodoxy because really open theism is what he says, just consistent Arminianism. And so if open theism is consistent Arminianism, you should call open theists brethren, brethren or brothers because you've already said that open theism is orthodox. That I mean, you've already said that Arminians are orthodox, Arminians are brothers, but you're inconsistent by then classifying open theists as outside of orthodoxy. But anyways, go back to this. Oh, an open theist doesn't believe God has any purpose that he can predestine to occur. Uh, that's, just, that's just an outright lie. Uh, that's just a James White original. You can't find any theologian who holds the open view who's ever said such a thing. It's a straw man. It's putting words in your mouth. God predetermined the creation of the world, and then he brought it to pass. God predetermined the sacrifice of Christ, and he brought it to pass. God has predetermined Judgment Day, and he will bring it to pass. Only in the open view is God free to predetermine anything because the future is open to him. If God is in a realm of possibilities where he can choose between alternative courses, he can then make decisions and uh, execute actions to bring about the possibilities that he wants to happen. So only in open theism is God free to predetermine anything. See, um, if God from eternity simply knows everything that's going to happen, he has no chance to decide anything because it's already settled. He has no opportunity to choose anything because it's already eternally settled, but not in the case of the open uh, view. So if God has an eternal exhaustive foreknowledge, he couldn't predetermine anything because he would have no chance to do so. It was already eternally settled in his mind, and so his will would not be free to decide any future event. Uh, White says, an open theist doesn't believe that God has any purpose that he can predetermine to occur. Uh, he's, he's either lying, or he's completely ignorant, uh, or it's both. Uh, maybe he just really didn't know what to say, because I am an open theist, and I already admitted in this video clip that the cross was predetermined by God. And so he's just baffled and confused, and he doesn't really know what to say because he really doesn't know what he's talking about. He hasn't really studied the open view. He doesn't know it. And so he's just like baffled and confused saying, well, the, you, you can't have God predetermining anything in open theism. Um, he, just, he just sounds stupid. So there's no theological foundation for the actual divine act within their theological system. So it makes sense why they can't even begin to handle the text in a meaningful fashion. But notice the subtle twisting. Look, the subtle twisting is coming from James White. He said God can't predestine anything in open theism. I mean, seriously, James, read a book. Read a book. This is, I mean, I don't care too much for the author Gregory Boyd. Uh, he's too liberal on many things, um, but God of the Possible. Yeah, this is a, a pretty standard open theist book, and the whole premise of the book is that the future is partly determined and partly open. And so he's saying these things about, oh, the future in open theism can't be predestined. You have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, just seriously, if you're going to claim to be a scholar, claim to be a theologian, read a book. Uh, it seems you haven't really thought it through. 
uh, doctor. It f seems like, uh, you know, uh, a fool speaks about a matter before he hears it, and that's exactly what you're doing. Uh, only in the open theistic worldview is God able to predetermine anything. I've already hammered that point. But think about it. If God foreknew from eternity that you're going to die in a car accident tomorrow, then it's already settled in his mind, and he's not free to decide or change it. If, if God knows you're going to die tomorrow in a car accident, can God intervene and save you? If he intervenes and saves you, then his eternal foreknowledge uh, would be wrong. And so if it's already in his mind a certainty, then he's not free to determine it and he's not free to change it. And so God would have no control over the course of history at all if God has eternal exhaustive foreknowledge. Only if God is dynamic, if the future is an ongoing development, if there's open possibilities, is God free to, to determine and to decide uh, the course of events. So this is why open theism is superior to Calvinism, especially when it comes to the issue of foreknowledge, because only in open theism is God free to be the potter and history to be the clay. Uh, with eternal exhaustive foreknowledge, the future is already cement in his mind, and therefore he can't determine anything. So it is eternal foreknowledge and not open theism that says God cannot predetermine anything because he's bound by his eternal foreknowledge. See, White says uh, in open theism, God can't predetermine anything. No, in eternal exhaustive foreknowledge, God cannot predetermine anything. Uh, in typical Calvinist fashion, he has it completely backwards. If everything is settled from eternity, then God is not free to decide a single thing. Not to mention, I mean, Calvinism says God decreed everything for his glory. So that means God decreed open theism and uh, open theism glorifies him according to Calvinism. So uh, what is he so upset about? You, you basically have a you basically have a, a, a heckler. A heckler does an evil thing, so and I can a use I can use a heckler you for good. You just affirmed I already sovereignty. To you. you said you believe a God predestined all sin. That's the heresy. Heresy is taking oh, so truth you, too okay. far. So you believe you're taking truth like the cross was predestined. So you believe and you take God, it too far. Okay, so you to believe all God sin was predestined. Predestined or ordained so some sin, and that gets says, you off the hook. The Bible says when God saw the wickedness of man, it repented the Lord that He made man. Genesis six five to six. That means God that, didn't Jesse. want the world to sin. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, one of the many texts that we can we can look at the term Nacham, when it says repented, that does not mean God went, oh man, I blew it. Now, for an open theist, I guess they they actually have a view of God where God is so reckless and so foolish that he could create creatures that all of a sudden start spewing out all this evil, and God just goes, oh, no, never saw this coming. Oh, goodness, what, what am I going to do? Oh, it, it repents me that I made man. First, these uh, terms like, oh, God blew it, or he was so reckless and so foolish, that's not anything an open theist would say. That's just a Calvinist straw man. See, whenever the Calvinists frame the debate, they just ruin it. Uh, what the text does say is that when God saw the wickedness of man, it repented the Lord that he made man, and it grieved him in his heart. And that's why he sent the flood to destroy man, because God didn't create man to sin. So the implication of the text is that had God known that they were going to become so wicked, he never would have created them in the first place. And that's why he sent the flood, because that's not what they were created for. So men were created to be holy. Uh, that's God's purpose for man. Man chose to become sinful. And therefore, God repented of making man, and he sent the flood to destroy them. That's what the Bible says, but it destroys Calvinism. So Calvinism can't do justice to this text at all. They can't properly explain it or perceive it or understand it because they're pre-committed to this uh, hardcore determinism. As uh, Calvinist says, basically, God created man to sin. God knew man was going to sin because he decreed man to sin. He created man to go to hell because he decreed man to sin and go to hell. And so their whole view is that God creates people to sin and to go to hell. The majority of mankind, because only a few are on the narrow road. So God creates the majority of mankind to sin and go to hell, where the Bible in Genesis 6 says God didn't create man to sin. 
and that destroys their theology. So man's sin, in their view, is God's idea. Uh, God thought of sin, he planned their sin, he created man to sin, uh, but in this case, uh, in Genesis 6, it's, it's not what you see. So why would God then repent and grieve when he sees their sin if that's what he created them for? Why is God grieving over their sin if he decreed their sin for his glory? Why is God repenting of creating them when he sees their sin if he created them to sin? It makes no sense in Calvinism. So Calvinism doesn't mesh with the Bible because Calvinism doesn't come out of the Bible. It's inserted into the text that's not really there. Um, so that would mean that the cross was an afterthought, all of redemption was an afterthought, we are an afterthought. There. All right, look, uh, the cross was plan B. Plan A was to create men who would choose to overcome uh, temptation. That's why God put Adam and Eve in the garden with the tree. Uh, he wanted men to obey him. See, the Calvinist thinks, oh, why did God put Adam and Eve in the garden with the tree? It's because he wanted them to sin. No, it's because he wanted them to face temptation and to overcome it to choose to be good like God is good. Uh, the cross was plan B. He was slain from the foundation of the world, which means after the foundation of the world. Uh, plan A was a sinless universe. The Bible says uh, to obey is better than sacrifice. God would have preferred a sinless universe that needed no atonement at all than to have this sinful universe uh, that we live in, uh, which needs an atonement. And so, uh, plan B, which is the cross, was in, implemented to get back to plan A, which is a holy universe full of holy people, uh, to have heaven full of holy beings. Uh, salvation is God's salvage plan for his creation, uh, which he created for holiness. Uh, to obey is better than sacrifice. Christ was slain after the foundation of the world. God did not know for sure that man was going to sin when he created them. That's what you. That's the implication of Genesis 6, 5 to 6. God did not know with absolute certainty man was going to sin when he created man. Uh, otherwise, he created man to sin, and it would make no sense for him to repent of making man when he sees them sinning. Man was not created to sin and go to hell. Uh, man was not in God's mind when he created hell. The Bible says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. Uh, but if God created man to sin and to go to hell, then how could he say that hell wasn't created for man? How could he say that hell was created for the devil and his angels? So these are uh, biblical conclusions. And White, who thinks it's okay to say that abortion is God's secret will, uh, finds these conclusions just unacceptable and, and horrible. And, and, and realize what the cost is. is. We sing about how my name was written on his hand. No open theist can sing that song. Okay, think about the cost. The cost is our, is our hymns. There's Calvinist hymns that we can't sing if this theology that comes from the Bible is true. Oh, that's the great cost. Oh my goodness. Look, open theists can't sing a song. Oh my, so what? Uh, you know, Calvinists can't sing a song either. Like, I have decided to follow Jesus because they deny uh, that uh, salvation is decisional. They deny man's free will in salvation. And so they can't sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Um, look, Isaiah 49, 16 says uh, that, um, I have engraven you on my hands. Uh, but that is actually talking about the name Zion in verse 14. So the name Zion is on his hand. Not your individual name, not the name of James White. James White's name is not on his hand. It's the name Zion. So talk about uh, Isa Jesus. Uh, he's going by a hymn rather than what the actual scripture says. Uh, the Bible says that your name can be blotted out of the book of life by sinning. So uh, how does that mesh uh, with this idea that God from eternity has predestined certain people to be saved? And then look, it's proof that is, your name is written on his hand. Uh, 
Zion is written on his hand, but your name is written in the book of life, and that can be blotted out. So the fact that your name can be blotted out of the book of life shows that the future can be changed, uh, that uh, not only that salvation can be lost, but that it's, uh, the future is an ongoing development, and the book of life can be edited. So the book of life is still being written and edited. It shows a changeable future, which just destroys unconditional election. Again, this word apo is used, the names that were written from the foundation of the world. And the word is apo and not pro, where pro would mean before. The names were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. The names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world, after the foundation of the world, since the foundation of the world. So from Genesis to Revelation, the Book of Life has been being written and being edited with names being blotted out. So it shows an ongoing development. So uh, salvation itself is open theistic because salvation is a change of future. You were going to hell, you were under his wrath, and then you got saved. Saved from what? Saved from sin, death, and hell. And so that's a change of future. So open theism is, uh, or salvation is open theistic by its uh, very nature of uh, rescuing you from uh, a future punishment. So James does what a lot of Calvinists do, and that's confuse uh, hymns with Scripture. Uh, this isn't the first time that a Calvinist has confused a hymn with Scripture. They do the same thing with, uh, oh, the Father turned his face away, uh, or the wrath of God was satisfied. Uh, that's a hymn, not a, not a scripture. Uh, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Uh, or say the word foreknowledge. They insert into this word foreknowledge uh, ideas of eternal or exhaustive, but that doesn't mesh because the word prognosco is also applied to man. Uh, for example, uh, Peter, I think it was Peter who said uh, in one of his epistles, you knew before these things. You knew these things before, talking about his doctrine. And he uses that same word prognosco. Or Paul giving his defense to the um, Israelites and he says, you knew before how I lived as a strict Pharisee. And again, the same word prognosco, uh, which is how, what we uh, translate as uh, foreknew or um, foreknow. And so the same word that is applied to God is also applied to man. And it simply means to know beforehand. So you knew beforehand that I was a Pharisee. That's what, that's what Paul was saying. And so they insert unbiblical ideas into these words. Like foreknowledge is eternal foreknowledge, exhaustive foreknowledge, uh, when the word itself doesn't have those connotations. Uh, Calvinism is whole, the whole, system of Calvinism is built on eisegesis. They read the scriptures with Calvinist glasses on. They read the entire Bible uh, over and over again with these Calvinist glasses on and they think, oh look how biblical Calvinism is. Did you know when I was a new convert, I read the Bible cover to cover many, many times before I ever met a Calvinist and when I met uh, a Calvinist and they explained to me their interpretation of scripture. It was so foreign and so alien. I thought this is wild nonsense where I can't believe they're interpreting the Bible this way. I was very familiar with the Bible. My Bible was all marked up and underlined and I, I mean I read it cover to cover every um, every year multiple times. I read it every single day and yet the concepts of Calvinism were foreign to my mind. It's interesting a lot of Calvinists I know say that they used to be Arminians, and now they've become Calvinists. They were Arminians for years. Well, they read their Bible those years. It, it shows that Calvinism is an interpretation of the Bible, an eisegetical interpretation, and you have to be exposed to other Calvinists to uh, get this secret knowledge like the Gnostics had. You have to go to your Bible college or your seminary or uh, you know, sit under some Calvinist teacher, read a Calvinist book in order to get that interpretation of the Bible. But hey, if these guys who are Calvinists now used to be Arminians, you ask them, well, were you saved? And they will a lot of times admit, yeah, they were saved when they were Arminians. And yet now they're so hardcore Calvinists, they call Arminianism a false gospel or they call it heresy. Uh, it's totally inconsistent. It makes no sense. Uh, they'll say Calvinism is the gospel. But then they admit that they got saved um, and were Arminians when they first got saved, even for years. 
well, how can Calvinism be the gospel if uh, you were saved when you were an Arminian? That quote, that Calvinism is the gospel, comes from uh, Charles Spurgeon. And the ironic thing is that Charles Spurgeon got saved listening to an Arminian Methodist preacher. And so he got saved listening to an Arminian preacher, and yet then he goes on to say, oh, Calvinism is the gospel. Well, that's not the gospel that Spurgeon got saved under. Spurgeon didn't get saved under Calvinism listening to an Arminian Methodist preacher. They're, they're, they're riddled with contradictions and inconsistencies. Of course, I, most open theists don't believe in, in uh, substitutionary atonement or penal substitutionary atonement or anything like that anyways, but... All right. Like I said, James White's whole mode of operation is to just go on these rabbit trails. I mean, he can't stay on topic. So now he's bringing up the penal substitution. Fine. All right, let's bounce around. Let's talk about some random topics. Let's talk about uh, the atonement. Now, he says uh, substitutionary atonement. Did you know, actually, all three major atonement views are substitutionary. Now, the penal view obviously says that Christ was our substitute in penalty. And uh, they try and make an exclusive claim to this term substitutionary atonement, as if the penal theory is the only view that is uh, a substitutionary atonement. Now, in penal substitution, Christ is our substitute in penalty, but in the governmental view, which is what I hold to, and a lot of our uh, Minions have held to, uh, teaches that the atonement is a substitute for penalty. See, that's the difference. They say Jesus took our penalty. I say our penalty is eternal hell and that Jesus didn't take our exact and literal penalty. That's like what even Albert Barnes uh, taught or Jonathan Edwards Jr. also taught the governmental view of the atonement and he was a Calvinist. Uh, but our penalty is hell. Jesus didn't take our literal penalty and our penalty is eternal, eternal torment in hell. Jesus didn't take that. What he did suffer for our sins is a substitute for our actual penalty. So that now that our actual penalty has a substitute, our actual penalty can be remitted, which is what Jesus said. He shed his blood for the remission of sins. So rather than having a substitute in penalty, which is the penal view, you have a substitute for penalty, which is, I think, the more biblical view. Um, but even in the ransom view, the idea that, um, and a lot of the early church fathers, even Augustine taught the ransom view. Now that's an interesting point because people like White are implying that penal substitution is like a standard orthodox doctrine, like an essential doctrine. But their great hero, Augustine, didn't even believe in penal substitution because that theory didn't exist yet. That theory came about a thousand years ago from Anselm. And the penal view wasn't even a concept in the minds of the early church. And so Augustine held to what's called the ransom theory. Now in the ransom theory, uh, we were held captive by the devil and the devil had us like a, a legitimate claim upon us and a ransom needed to be paid by God to the devil. If you saw like um, C.S. Lewis, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, when uh, the Aslan sacrifices himself to redeem uh, Edmund and he sacrifices himself to the witch. Uh, that's uh, an example of the ransom uh, view, an analogy of the ransom view that, that Jesus was a ransom paid to the devil. That's what Augustine believed. But even in that view, that's substitutionary, one, Christ is given in exchange for the captives. So a ransom is a substitute. So all three atonement views are substitutionary. The penal view is substitutionary, a substitute in penalty. The governmental view is substitutionary. It's a substitute for penalty. And the ransom view is substitutionary because uh, the atonement, Christ is given in exchange uh, for the captives who are being held by the devil. So this exclusive claim of substitutionary atonement that the Calvinists try to uh, stamp on their penal theory uh, is, is once again just bogus theology coming out of the Calvinist camp. Um, Calvinists just ignorantly think their view is the only substitutionary view. Now, I'm actually writing a book called The Vicarious Atonement of Christ. How the Atonement of Christ substitutes the eternal penalty of sinners. Uh, but, I mean, I reject penal substitution, but I fully embrace 
a vicarious atonement, a substitutionary atonement. Um, so there you go. Also, um, penal substitution destroys evangelism. Because in penal substitution, those Jesus died for cannot be punished. Because that would be double punishment. First, their sins were punished in Christ. And then if their sins are punished in them, that would be a double jeopardy. And that's why the Calvinist limits the atonement. Um, or that's why the Universalist uh, believes everyone is saved. Uh, they have the uh, Universalist has the same atonement theory as a Calvinist which is penal substitution. But it destroys evangelism. Because if those Jesus died for cannot be justly punished, then everyone Jesus died for is technically already saved because there's no threat of punishment, no threat of danger. In other words, if penal substitution is true, then everyone Jesus died for is already safe because there's no threat of punishment, which means there's really no need for evangelism. But as a street preacher, I see the world that Jesus died for as going to hell. And so this penal view is totally inconsistent with my evangelism. I see that they're going to hell, yet they don't have to go to hell. They can change their future because Jesus died for them. So I go out to the streets to preach to them, to tell them Jesus died for them, in the hopes that they might repent and thereby change their future and to be spared the punishment that they're currently heading towards. I mean, that's evangelism. So getting saved implies that there's a threat of danger. So in the Calvinist system of penal substitution, nobody really gets saved. You got saved at the cross. The cross is what saved you. You were saved at Calvary, not when you believed, not when you had faith. And so penal substitution would thereby destroy justification by faith because you're not really getting saved when you put your faith in Christ because even when you're in your unbelief, it would be unjust for God to punish you because God already punished Christ even for the sins of your unbelief. So there would be no getting saved if penal substitution is true. So Calvinists like James White, they prefer inconsistent Arminians who believe in penal substitution and uh, would you know and believe in unlimited atonement and yet somehow deny universalism and that is inconsistent but they don't understand that penal substitution automatically and unconditionally saves uh, because there's a double jeopardy there uh, what white doesn't realize is that calvinism is just as inconsistent because bb warfield one of their theologians said that the elect are born under the wrath of god even after the atonement that the elect are born under the wrath of God and abide under his wrath until they're justified by faith. So talk about double jeopardy. How can you be born under the wrath of God if Christ satisfied the wrath of God for your sins before you were born? And so Calvinist is in, Calvinism is just as inconsistent as Arminianism when they embrace penal substitution. Um, cal consistent Calvinism would say that those Jesus died for are saved from penalty whether they believe or not. The same reasons that Calvinists limit the atonement is actually the same reasons why the Calvinists should reject penal substitution because it logically destroys justification by faith. So the governmental atonement view is the only view that is consistent and solves this dilemma. Uh, that's why even Calvinists like Jonathan Edwards Jr believed in the governmental view and rejected the penal view because, uh, well, he wrote his sermon called uh, Atonement Consistent with Grace. And uh, only in the governmental view is there actual grace where there's a remission of penalty. Because in the penal view, all, all sin is punished. There is no forgiveness of sin. All sin is punished. So the governmental view alone solves uh, the consistency problem. It alone renders penalty remittable and makes pardon possible, but not automatically so. So the Calvinist has the dilemma in that uh, if they hold to penal substitution, everyone should be everyone Jesus died for should be born saved. The Arminian has a dilemma in penal substitution because everyone Jesus died for uh, must be spared from hell. Nobody Jesus died for could possibly go to hell. But both the Calvinist and the Arminian who embraces uh, penal substitution are equally inconsistent. The truly consistent Arminian and the truly consistent Calvinist 
should accept the governmental view of the atonement because the governmental view makes forgiveness available but not automatic. It becomes actual when you believe. And then the Calvinist says, well, did Jesus die to make salvation possible or did he die to actually save us? It's both. The atonement makes salvation available to unbelievers and actual to believers. Just like the public school makes education available to the public, but actual to the students that enroll, the atonement makes salvation available to unbelievers, but actual to those who believe. So the Bible says he's the savior of all men, especially them that believe. And even the Calvinist believes this. The Calvinist believes that you're unsaved at, when you're in your unbelief and that you get saved when you have faith. So that should that all that's only compatible with the governmental view of the atonement which makes salvation available to all but actual to those who believe so there you go hey just think about what it's like for a, an open theist cannot sing that song because god jesus the father and the son and the spirit together did not know you would exist when jesus died and so there can be no union of the elect with Christ. It becomes an impersonal class act. It's an act in behalf of a class that is then defined and filled up by our actions, by creatures that God does not at the time of the crucifixion even know will ever exist. That's what open theism is left with. That, that's a very different faith. Very different faith. It's, it's amazing to me how many people will sing those songs, and then when you present open theism to them, is it, well, okay, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's all that bad a thing. So you talk about inconsistent. He says, uh, oh, that's a very different faith. So open theists have a different faith than them, and yet he says that Arminians are, you know, are, are inconsistent brethren. Um, but he says that consistent Arminians are open theists. Open theists are just consistent Arminians. Well, which is it? You can't have it both ways. You, can, you can't have... Arminians, um, who are open theists, being outside of orthodoxy, and then say that Arminians are brethren that are inside of orthodoxy. Uh, you say that we have different faiths, and then you're like baffled when I call you a heretic, and I say Calvinism is heresy. Calvinism is a cult. Well, you already admit we have different faiths, so why do you uh, act all shocked and surprised when I recognize the distinction that you yourself are making? Anyways, we already saw that White uh, sings these songs about, uh, oh, our names are written on his hand. I don't even know what song he's talking about. I didn't care to look it up. It, it's, I think it's a Lutheran song, probably written by Martin Luther, about our names written in his hand. I, I don't know. There's lots of hymns I'm not familiar with. Uh, but the Bible actually says that the name Zion is written in his hand, and that is very different from what White is, is saying. He thinks that his name, James White, is on the hand of Christ. Uh, when the Bible simply says the name Zion, uh, Zion is on his hand. So, again, while we're talking about written names, the book of life is being written from the foundation of the world. Uh, it won't be completed until the book of Revelation. Names can be blotted out, and so the book is being edited. Uh, the Bible says um, in Revelation 17, 18, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And uh, that word from is apo, um, which is after, since. It signifies a separation. Uh, the names written after the foundation of the world or since the foundation of the world, these names were written sometime after uh, or since the beginning, not before the foundation of the world. And that is exactly what Calvinism would require, that the names written in the Lamb's Book of Life were written before the foundation of the world, before he created anything, because that's when he unconditionally elected some for heaven and uh, some for hell. Uh, so the fact is that the Book of Life is still being written, still being edited. It shows that God does not know from eternity who will and who will not be saved. It's an ongoing development. The future is open and changeable and contingent, uh, not fixed. So it's not unconditional eternal election. Otherwise, it would say the names that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. So once again, when you look at proper uh, hermeneutics and uh, an exegetical uh, examination of the text, open theism wins again and uh, Calvinism horribly loses.
doesn't want people to be homosexuals. You say he does. So God doesn't, God's God's God doesn't control, want so do babies to be him? aborted. So do you believe you in say that he does. God or not? The Bible says when they when they did you catch it again? God wants babies to be aborted. So see, just just start marking down. Let's let's not turn this into a drinking game uh, unless you're doing diet coke or something. Okay, um, <laughs> because it's gonna get really bad by the end. But. All right, let's not turn this into a drinking game, he says. The idea of doing a drinking game never even comes into my mind. Okay, I, I, when I got saved, I repented of alcohol. That was uh, 19 years ago. Uh, I've had uh, sobriety for 19 years. Uh, I think, uh, you know, James White needs to uh, lay off the Smirnoff that he's drinking every night. And now apparently he's talking about drinking games. Is that what... Him and Apologia Church are into drinking games. Uh, James White Church, I already mentioned, will do these tattoo fundraisers, these cigar smoking Bible studies, these beer party reformation conferences. Uh, again, no wonder they don't like holiness preachers. White takes Smirnoff every night uh, to help him sleep, and I think it's affecting his brain. Uh, I've said already before, he needs some melatonin and not some Smirnoff. But uh, seriously, James, the, the thought of doing a drinking game never entered my mind, but he doesn't like me saying in Calvinism, God wants babies to be aborted. He doesn't like that word want. But their teaching is that uh, abortion is God's sovereign will, his secret will. So if it is his will, that is what he wants. See, they like to pretty up their doctrine to paint it as... Uh, uh, acceptable as possible, not to speak it out plainly, uh, what they actually mean. And uh, people get deceived and confused, like, oh, sovereign will, that sounds right. But what do they mean? They mean that abortion is something that God wants to happen. So just speak it like you mean it. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call it out. I know what you mean when you say sovereign will. I know what you mean when you say secret will. It means God wants babies to be aborted. It means God wants people to sin and go to hell. It means God wants people to be homosexuals and drunkards and liars and thieves and child molesters. You believe all sin is what God wants and that if he didn't want it, it wouldn't happen. If he didn't want it, it wouldn't happen. You, you believe if God wanted a sinless universe, he would have one because God gets everything that he wants. And it's not the God of the Bible. It's the God of your imagination. Every time Jesse ignores the distinction between the biblically taught mandatory distinction between God's prescriptive will, his revelation of his law, and God's sometimes called decree, secret will that we do not have access to. All right, look, I say that in Calvinism, God wants babies to be aborted because that is what Calvinism says. It's his secret will. I am not ignoring this distinction that Calvinists make. They say God's revealed will is that he doesn't want babies to be murdered, but his secret will is that he wants babies to be aborted. So I'm not ignoring the distinction. I'm fully recognizing it, and I'm using it against them. Calvinism says God secretly wants babies to be aborted. Now, this isn't biblical, and it's not what White calls a mandatory distinction. It's just, it's just heresy. Heresy by any other name is just as putrid and horrid. Uh, to the contrary, God said that when they sacrificed their babies, that he commanded not, so that would be revealed will, neither came it into his mind, so that would cover his secret will. It's funny that he says God's secret will, while we don't have access to it, yet Calvinism says, uh, that God has a secret will, but it's not really a secret if they know it. So he says, we don't have access to it. But your view is that everything that happens is God's secret will. Everything. Everything that happens is what he secretly, from eternity past, decreed to happen. If, it, if he didn't decree it, it wouldn't happen. So we do have access to God's secret will, in your view. A history book. Read about the Holocaust. That was God's secret will. Read about... Um, I mean, the Titanic, that was God's secret will. Read it. Nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens by man's free will alone. Everything is just God's secret will. It's not, it's not biblical. It's Calvinism. You have to get that from a systematic theology of a Calvinist because you can't get that from the Bible. But if God had a secret will, uh, we know what it is. It's everything that happens. 
Uh, this is what Calvinism says. So listen, James, I understand your distinction between secret and revealed will. I'm not ignoring it. I'm simply speaking in plain language what you mean by secret will, that God wants babies to be aborted. That's Calvinism. Why don't, just put it on a t-shirt. When you guys go out and protest abortion in front of the pro-life, uh, or in your, in your, try, you're trying to be all pro-life, and you go and protest in front of the abortion clinic, just put your actual theology on your shirt if you're not ashamed of your doctrine, and if Calvinism is the gospel, just have a shirt that says God wants babies to be aborted. See how that works. And then protest abortion. And then the whole world can see how foolish and contradictory you are for being pro-life when you believe God secretly is pro-abortion. Which would explain and give you the basis of understanding God says you shall not kill. He says to Abraham, sacrifice your son. You shall not kill, but he decrees, predestines by his own hand, the death of his son. Look, you can understand all of those scenarios without concluding that all sin is God's secret will. It's not mandatory. And you can understand all those scenarios without uh, thinking that God is causing people or usurping their free will. Uh, that God in his wisdom can extrapolate what people will do in the future and incorporate those free will decisions into his plans so that he brings about events that he predetermined in a way that does not violate man's free moral agency. Just give it some deeper thought. And then you don't have to malign uh, the character of God and slander the character of God and say that all sin is God's secret will. So you can understand those instances as God at times incorporating the sinful acts of men into his plans just like you might do uh, yourself. It doesn't necessitate this heretical conclusion that sin was God's plan from the beginning, that all sin is God's secret will. Again, that's a false and illogical uh, conclusion uh, that causes way more problems than it supposedly solves. You could never trust God's word of what he says if he, ha if he publicly says one thing but secretly wants or wills or decrees another. He might publicly say one thing but secretly will another. He publicly says unless you repent you'll perish but secretly uh, you can be impenitent and live. He might publicly say you need to believe the gospel, but secretly unbelievers are saved. He might publicly say uh, he doesn't want um, you to sin, but secretly he wants you to. Oh wait, that, <laughs> that is what Calvinism says. So in Calvinism, uh, everything that happens is exactly what God wants to happen, exactly how he wants it to happen. He says to love your neighbor, but he actually wants you to hate your neighbor any time that you actually hate your neighbor. Uh, he secretly wills it. So you can never trust what God actually says. So how do you trust any uh, portion of the Bible? How do you trust? Because, I mean, the Bible is God's revealed will. The how It's all revealed what God has done, what God has said, what God plans. How can you trust the Bible at all? if Calvinism is true. So admit Calvinism is true. Say, oh yeah, Calvinism is true. This is a mandatory distinction. God has a revealed will and a secret will. And then you're left uh, with no Bible at all that you can actually trust and have faith in. Way to go, uh, Calvinists. You've destroyed the Bible. Um, says you should not kill. Sends Syria to whip, whip up on Israel, etc., etc., etc. The Bible becomes a mishmash of fantastic contradiction in Jesse Morrell's world because he doesn't believe all of it. He does not believe scripture. He doesn't believe it. Yeah, sure. I don't believe the scripture. I've dedicated the past 19 years of my life to serving God, doing good, saving souls because I don't believe in the scriptures. I believe in the scriptures. I study the scriptures. That's why I don't believe in Calvinism. I don't believe that the atonement is limited because the Bible teaches me otherwise. I don't believe God predestined all sin because the Bible teaches me otherwise. I don't believe that babies are born hell deserving sinners because the Bible teaches me otherwise. It's the Bible that I'm getting my theology from, not from your seminaries and your Bible colleges and your, your theologians. 
but the Bible. So give me a break. I mean, these radical and unfounded accusations just only make you look bad, not me. Justin Murrell doesn't believe the Bible. Have you seen my YouTube channel? I travel the country preaching on the streets, being assaulted, being punched, being spit on, being falsely arrested, being imprisoned, being hated, being rejected, just to proclaim uh, the truth of the Bible. And, and oh yeah, Justin Murrell doesn't believe in the scriptures. No, I don't believe in Calvinism at all because of the scriptures. So I fully embrace all of the scriptures. Uh, how many times do I really have to say it? God predestined the cross. God used sinful acts like uh, the Joseph's brothers. Uh, God uses the sinful acts of people like the Assyrians. I fully embrace all of the scriptures, even the ones that say um, God uh, repented or it never came into his mind or that God changed the future or God canceled his own prophecies. I believe all of the scriptures. What I cannot embrace is this unbiblical and illogical assumption, this distinction that the Calvinists make of uh, secret will versus uh, revealed will. If you embrace that false distinction between revealed and secret will, then you cannot understand the Bible. You can't understand what it means to pray, thy will be done. Are you praying for his revealed will to be done? Why pray for that? It's impossible. Are you praying for his secret will to be done? Why pray for that? It's inevitable. You can't understand what it means, he that does the will of my Father will enter into the kingdom of heaven. What do you mean, does the will of the Father? Does his revealed will? Calvinism says that's impossible. God decreed for us to sin every day in word, thought, and deed. If it's talking about his secret will, uh, everybody does that. So that would mean everyone enters the kingdom of heaven because everyone does his secret will. You can't understand the Bible when it says this is the will of God, even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication. But in Calvinism, God, if you fornicate, that was God's secret will for you. So you can't understand any verse that talks about the will of God if you have this false distinction between revealed will and secret will. So it's James White, who doesn't believe all of the scriptures, who's rejecting the scriptures. We, we'll see that he does. He just outright rejects entire chunks of the Bible as though just anthropomorphic uh, instead of, uh, you know, revelations of what God is like, um, you'll see that coming up. He has su any person who can look at himself and go, yeah, I'm sinlessly perfect, obviously has some serious spiritual problems. Uh, again, with the false accusations, because he's speaking out of ignorance, he's never talked to me, he's never called me, never emailed me, never asked me what I believe. He's going by just the slander he hears from other Calvinists. I have never said, I am sinlessly perfect. That's not even in my vocabulary. I don't use those words, sinlessly perfect. That's nonsense. That's Calvinist vocabulary to disparage holiness living. Uh, sinless perfection, it's not in my vocabulary. It's not a biblical term. Biblical terms is things like holy, sanctified, free from sin, cleansed from all unrighteousness, or free indeed. Uh, all I claim for my life is what the Bible describes the Christian life to be. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Having been made free from sin, we've become the servants of righteousness. All I claim is what the Bible claims for the Christian life. Uh, that's it. The Apostle Paul himself said that he had a, quote, conscience void of offense. That means Paul was not aware of any sin in his life. He had a conscience void of offense. And, and that's what I can testify, that as a Christian, I walk in habitual obedience, that I'm not aware of any deliberate disobedience in my life right now. I have deliberately disobeyed God in the past, even in the past 19 years since I first converted to Christ. I didn't have to do it. I take full responsibility. I don't blame God for decreeing it. I don't blame my nature for how I was born. I blame my free will. I say I sinned and I didn't have to sin. And I was quick to repent, lest I perish. But the habitual conduct of my life as a Christian has been one of faith, faithfulness, walking by faith, overcoming sin by faith, overcoming temptation by faith, living holy by faith. I mean, that's the Christian life. So obedience has been my daily practice. Obedience has been my daily rule. Sin is not my lifestyle. Calvinists say, oh yeah, we, we don't practice sin. Well, if you're sinning every day, you are. They say, oh, sin's not our lifestyle. If you sin every day, it is. 
They say, oh, we fall into sin. We, we don't live in sin. Well, if you fall into sin every day of your life, then you are living in sin. See, Cal uh, no Calvinist will say they ever go a single day without sinning. Because, uh, well, God decreed for them to sin every day in word, thought, and deed. That's what they think. That every day you sin somehow, some way, and, and you never have a sinless day, never go a day without sinning. And, uh, I mean, talk about defeatism. Uh, you don't really have saving faith if you're not overcoming temptation. Anyways, the man who has a spiritual problem is the Calvinist who sins every day, who can look in the mirror and say, I sin every day, but I'm right with God. The Bible says, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So the Calvinist looks in the mirror and says, I don't keep God's commandments, but I know God. No, you don't. You know the figment of your imagination, which is the God of Calvinism. Calvinism says you can't even keep God's commandments. The Bible says that's the test of your salvation, not your statement of faith, not the systematic theology that you uh, prescribe to. The test of your salvation is whether you keep his commandments or not. By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Calvinism says you can't keep his commandments. That's because the Calvinists don't keep his commandments because they're not saved. So the Bible says, he that says I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar. So James White has serious spiritual problems. The nightly Smirnoff should have showed you that. James White thinks you can sin every day of your life and still have a relationship with God. I mean, that's... So he's saying, if you live holy, you have spiritual problems. But if you sin every day, what, you're spiritually healthy? This is why I say Calvinism is demonic. They, they twist everything. They have everything backwards. In the mind of a Calvinist, in the mind of James White, if you don't sin, you're spiritually unhealthy. If you sin every day, you're spiritually healthy. Nonsense. So you're going to hear that over and over and over again in this conversation. I'm going to create a straw man based upon ignoring the distinction that you make and that you can defend over and over and over and over and over and over again in Scripture. No, you can't. No, you can't. You can't defend it. You can't explain God's secret will in light of thy will be done, in light of he that does the will of the Father abideth forever. You can't explain any of that. And as I think I've shown you, it's James White who over and over and over and over and over again is creating a straw man. Oh, Pelagian, uh, sinless perfectionist. Uh, God can't predestine anything in open theism. Uh, talk about straw men over and over and over and over and over again. Um, it's not a straw man for me to say, in Calvinism, God wants babies to be aborted. That's not a straw man. It's, I, 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 and I, I know your distinction. I accept it as what you believe. So you believe God secretly wants babies to be aborted. Like that solves the problem. Like that makes it better. That's not a straw man for me to say you believe God secretly wants babies to be aborted. God secretly wills the abortion of babies. God secretly, sovereignly wills all of the abortion that happens in this country. Now, the reason I asked Emilio if abortion was God's plan was because I fully knew that Calvinism, te Calvinism teaches sin is God's secret plan. So it's no straw man, and it's no ignorance, and it's not ignoring your distinction. It's just recognizing it and speaking it in plain language and taking your doctrine to its logical, heretical conclusion. So it's just heretical Calvinism that's just being refuted over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Their babies so, to Bale. So that they to did that the which Isaiah, God said they did that which that I commanded not. He said, thwarted. neither did it come into my mind. That okay, now here's another standard open theist perspective. And again, who brought this up in the last Radio Free Geneva? I'm not sure if we played it, but Leighton Flowers. It never entered into my mind as if God is sitting there. Now this makes, this is why I go, Leighton, are you, you sure you're not an open theist? You sure you're not into, because, because Molinism would really have a problem with that. You throw Molinism out as a, as an orthodox possibility. Um, but an open theist is basically saying God looks at the horrific evil that the people of Israel do. And he goes, Oh my, I, I, I never could imagine that my creatures would do such a thing. That's, that's literally what they're saying. 
All right, that's literally what the Bible is saying. It says, neither came it into my mind that they would do such a thing. I mean, can you imagine the pathos in which God is speaking? Never came it into my mind that they would do such a thing, sacrificing their children to Baal. So that's what the verse is saying. It never came into God's mind. It doesn't mean that God doesn't know that they were capable of such a thing. He created them with uh, capability by giving them a free will. And he knows they're fully capable of horrific evil. But it means that God didn't know that they would do such a thing. Knowing what a person could do and knowing what a person would do uh, are two different things. But that's literally what the Bible is saying. Neither came it into my mind that they would do such a thing. So what Calvinism is literally saying is that, oh, of course God knew that they would sacrifice their babies to Baal. That was God's idea. That was God's decree from eternity. I mean, that's literally what James White believes, and it totally contradicts the scripture. Now, the obvious, consistent, biblical interpretation is, I never commanded you to do these things. This is, n there is nothing in my revealed will to you that would give you even the slightest foundation for blaming me for what you yourselves have done. That's what it never entered into my mind. That means it has nothing to do with the holy will that I have revealed to you. What a bunch of nonsense. God is saying, oh, I can't believe you did this. It's not, it, I gave you a revealed will not to do this even though I secretly willed for you to do it. How could you do such a thing when I secretly willed that you would do it? Uh, that's the obvious, consistent, biblical answer. I mean, does anybody really take James White seriously as a, as a theologian, as a scholar? I mean, this is how he interprets the Bible. This is his, 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 his uh, professional, doctorate, uh, exegetical explanation of this passage. This is, this is spiritual malpractice, doctor. Uh, saying neither came it into my mind means, oh, it wasn't God's revealed will, but it is his secret will. That's not obvious. That's not consistent. That's not biblical. It's just pure eisegesis. Uh, the text doesn't say any of that. I mean, nice try, but uh, yet another epic failure on the part of the Reformed Calvinist camp. If it's God's secret will, then they could, in fact, blame God because God irresistibly decreed that they would do it. But what God is doing in this text is distancing himself from their actions, actions which Calvinism says was God's idea, which he irresistibly decreed. So the scenario makes no sense in Calvinism. The Calvinist uh, mess that White just explained is not obvious, consistent, or biblical. It's, give me a break. That's consistent with all the scripture. You don't have to tear out entire books of the Bible like Jesse Morrell has to do. Again, with the false accusations, I mean, what a weak argument. Tear out books of the Bible. I'm taking the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I can prove my doctrine uh, through multiple uh, books of the Bible. Open theism, I just, I mean, I listed so many. Uh, Jonah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Abraham. I mean, entire books of the Bible. Um, salvation itself is open theistic. So it's just false accusations. It's a weak argument. Uh, you can find free will, open theism, literally in every book of the Bible. Uh, I read the Bible over and over and over again. And Calvinism, I'm telling you, is nowhere to be found. I've been reading the Bible cover to cover for 19 years. And Calvinism, um, properly uh, understood, is not in the Bible at all. If you properly exegete, uh, or exegete the, uh, the Bible, using sound uh, principles of hermeneutics. Uh, nowhere do you see that all sin is God's secret plan. Uh, you literally have to rip out entire books of the Bible to believe that, starting with Genesis, where God repented of making man. Uh, you have to rip out entire books of the Bible to believe, um, you know, the, 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 the atonement is limited, that uh, uh, God doesn't want everyone to repent and to be saved. Um, it's just ridiculous. So I believe in exhaustive foreknowledge, uh, or I believed in exhaustive foreknowledge as just a default position. I didn't give it much thought. It was just an ungrounded 
assumption until I read the Bible on the uh, matter. It was the Bible that made me an open theist. I wasn't an open theist until I read the Bible. Uh, exhaustive eternal foreknowledge would have just been like a default uh, position uh, by uh, you know assumption. Um, it was the Bible that taught me that God experiences surprise. It was the Bible that taught me God experiences disappointment. It was God who, or the Bible that teaches God experiences a uh, heartache. And uh, open theism is about the future. It affects his foreknowledge. Uh, the foreknowledge of the future changes whenever the future changes, like it did with Nineveh. Uh, God foreknew Nineveh would be destroyed in 40 days, otherwise he lied. Uh, but he foreknew they would be destroyed in 40 days because that's what he was planning. So he foreknew his future plans, uh, he foreknew the future because of his plans. Then when he repented of destroying Nineveh, he changed his plans. So then his foreknowledge of what their future would be changed. So God's foreknowledge of the future changes whenever the future changes. That's what I see in the Bible. But in James White's view, God is a liar. God said something would happen that he knew wouldn't happen. He lied to Nineveh. He knew they weren't going to be overthrown in 40 days. And Nineveh, at the time that he said that he was going to destroy them in 40 days, he, he knew that they weren't going to be destroyed, and so he just lied to them. He knew that it wouldn't happen. So Calvinism, and anyone who rejects open theism, really cannot escape the logical conclusion that in their view, God is a liar. And he lied to Nineveh, and he said he would over throw them in 40 days when he knew that he wouldn't. You say, well, oh, it's a conditional thing. Well, yeah, I mean, conditions or contingencies only exist in an open theistic view, uh, but the prophecy stated no con contingency. He just said in 40 days you will be overthrown. And then it says when God saw that they repented, he changed his mind. It doesn't say anything like I'm going to tell them they'll be destroyed in 40 days with the implication that if they repent, they won't be, uh, and that I'm not really going to change my mind because I was planning on not destroying them from the beginning. I mean, that's the eisegetical uh, theological gymnastics that these guys have to do to explain just a simple scenario where God gave a prophecy, then he changed his mind, and he canceled his prophecy, and he didn't lie. Anyways, it was the Bible that turned me into an open theist, specifically the book of Jonah. And so for him to stand there and be like, Jesse Morrell doesn't believe the scriptures. Jesse Morrell has to rip entire books out of the Bible. It's just... Um, it's just demonic false accusations. The devil's the father of lies. I mean, the foolishness of this God. Why in the world would you worship a God like this? Why in the world would you worship a God who didn't want babies to be aborted? That's what he's saying. Why in the world would you worship a God who didn't want babies to be aborted? Why would you worship a pro-life God? What? What are you talking about? Why would you worship a pro-abortion God? That's the question. Why would you worship a God who wanted babies to be brutally slaughtered and ripped apart, to be mutilated and slaughtered like cattle? Why would you worship a God like that, Dr. White? Why would you worship a God who secretly wanted babies to be murdered? Hey, why is God so secret about it? Why doesn't he just come out and say it? Why doesn't he just say, I want babies to be aborted? Why is, he, why, why is your God doing these things in secret? Why doesn't he just reveal it? Look, it's your God who lies, your God who's insincere, who says one thing but wants another. It's your God who plots the murder of innocent babies. So why would you worship a God like that? He has no love. He has no holiness. He has no justice. He has no grace. He's a monster. A monster of child sacrifice. A monster of iniquity and wickedness and sin, like Molech or the Juggernaut. Why would you worship a God like that? Made such potentiality of such horrific evil. And then goes, whoops, oh my, I never thought of that. That's the God you worship? No wonder it's a man-centered gospel. You don't have a, you don't have a God. You just, got a, you just got a man who messed up. And went, whoops, that's all you got. That's all you got. It's just disgusting. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Started preaching there. Yeah. He, he claims that I have, a, I have a man for a God, but he has a God who is less than a man, who can't uh, plan the future without causing and controlling what people will do. When we ourselves as mere men plan our future all the time, 
in a way that incorporates the free will choices of others. So he claims that I have a, a man for a god, but he has a god who is less than a man. But again, it doesn't say that God didn't think that they could do it. He knew he created them with the potential. When he created man with free will, all sorts of evil is capable. Uh, but it says, neither came it into my mind that they would do it. Knowing what they could do and knowing what they would do is totally different things. So notice James White at this point is literally mocking the God of the Bible. God is distancing himself from child sacrifice, saying, neither came it into my mind. And White is mocking God and then says, oh no, God knew sin was God's plan. Uh, abortion was his secret will. I mean, this is heretical blasphemy. It's a denial of the scriptures. It's slander upon God. It's really not me that White is mocking at all. He's mocking the God of the Bible. So he says, so he says, you don't have a God. I mean, talk about the logic of a Calvinist. It's literally unbelievable. Literally unbelievable. Unless God wanted babies to be sacrificed to idols, you don't have a God. That's what James White is saying. If it truly never came into God's mind that they would do such a thing, as, as the Bible says, well, then you don't have a God. So the Bible doesn't have a God. It's not like I wrote this scripture. I didn't write this. It's simply, I simply read it and I believed it. It's not that the Bible doesn't have a God. It's that the Bible doesn't have your God. And White's basically just admitting here uh, that the God of the Bible is not the God that he worships. Uh, he worships a God who secretly wants babies to be sacrificed to idols. And he goes so far to defend that position to say, if you don't believe God wants babies to be aborted, then you don't have a God. And then he says, it's disgusting. It's disgusting to say God didn't know that they would sacrifice their babies, but it's not disgusting in your view to say that God secretly wanted them to sacrifice their babies. James White has the most perverted, twisted, carnal, unregenerate mind imaginable. I mean, this guy is sick. He's a sick puppy. Sick in the head, sick in the heart, sick in the soul. He lacks reason and logic. He lacks proper sound uh, hermeneutics. I mean, this guy is a real stain on Christianity, uh, promoting demonic doctrines of devils is what he's doing. So, so, right. So, you so, think, so right. abortion is not God's plan. Yeah, You're a heretic. That's meaning you're a heretic. Jesse, that means that God Calvinism is saying that what the false. You're a heretic. You're a heretic. Calvinists are heretics. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's advancing the that's advancing yeah 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 that's <laughs> we should should go up with a yeah 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 um, the sound clip here. Yeah, this is what Calvinists do. They just oh, open theists are heretics. Arminians are heretics. Uh, oh, pa Pelagians, sinless perfectionists, heretics, heretics, heretics. I mean, this is what they do. Uh, you can tell when my comments get under his skin and really hit a raw nerve. Uh, he appears that he really uh, can. He can give it, but he can't take it. Uh, people sometimes resort to uh, mockery uh, when uh, you're getting the better of them and uh, maybe their feelings are getting a bit hurt. Uh, I hope that Calvinists, you know, learn what it feels like to be called a heretic because they do it to people all the time. And uh, the fact is they need to look in the mirror at their own uh, unbiblical, uh, heretical doctrine. Uh, yes, Calvinism, uh, Calvinism is heresy, heresy, heresy. And I don't mind saying it after dealing with these people for 19 years, after encountering them for 19 years, uh, I'm fully persuaded that Calvinism is a cult. Calvinists are heretics, that it is, it is a demonic deception. It's, uh, it's the antichrist spirit that First John said would be in the world. And I have no problem saying what I fully mean. I'm not the one that tries to pretty up my doctrine to be prettier than it really is. I just tell you plainly, it's the Calvinist who uh, doesn't come out with uh, the blunt honesty of what they believe. Uh, God said it wasn't his idea that they would sacrifice babies. Uh, God, uh, Calvinism says it was God's idea. Uh, so the Bible is true and Calvinism is heresy.
offense were doing was not in keeping with his revealed will, and it wasn't you're, part of his plan in terms of that, those aren't the things it says, that neither God came into my mind. Right. You're saying sin was He's God's idea. About whether or not you're he saying them all to do sin it. was God's idea before ever before a sinner existed. Explain to me how your in position. eternity past you say sin was God's idea. He planned it. He thought of it. So it came from his mind. God ordains all the things that come to pass. The Bible says neither cross. came it into my mind. Yes, neither so came evil. it into my mind. You think it's evil for so people your God to is not crucify the, God of the, the Son of God? Your God's not. Your God is not the God of the Bible, because I'm going to take this text, I'm going to ignore everything else the Bible says about this, I'm going to make this my definitional text, and I'm going to present the idea of a God who never, ever dreamt of any of this stuff, had no decree, and just blundered into it, and now I'm going to say, worship him. All right, look, James White is blind to his own hypocrisy. Uh, he says things like, oh, Justin Morrell doesn't believe in the scriptures or you don't have a God. When in fact, I simply take the full counsel of God's word and I get my idea of God from the scripture. Uh, but he literally rejects the God of the Bible. He instead wants to hold to his false God of Calvinism, even when the Bible repeatedly refutes his heretical theology. Uh, because James White is just more comfortable with the God of his imagination uh, than the God of the Bible that makes him uncomfortable. He's more comfortable thinking that sin was God's plan than to be comfortable thinking uh, sin wasn't God's plan at all. He's more comfortable thinking it's God's plan for babies to be aborted than to think uh, it's not God's plan at all. And so what James White has already admitted is that we don't worship the same God. I mean, so why is he upset when I say that? That we are worshiping different gods, that he's a heretic, that uh, he's, he's not, he doesn't believe in the God of the Bible. Uh, he says that I reject entire books of the Bible uh, that I don't, because I don't understand the God of the Bible the way he does, that I don't interpret the scriptures the way he does. But then he gets upset when I say that he, and I, that he doesn't worship the same God I do, that he's not worshiping the God of the Bible, that he doesn't um, believe the scriptures. So he's just, he can't, you can't have it both ways. Uh, if, if you're going to have it for one, you got to have it for the other. If you say that uh, we worship a different God, don't get upset when I say we worship a different God. If you're going to call me a heretic, don't get upset when I say you're a heretic. You can't have it both ways. So you're blind to your own hypocrisy with your double standards. And I'm not just, um, I mean, I'm really, I'm just saying the same things that he's already admitting. There you go. And that's, that's... It. I, what do you do with all the texts of scripture that say otherwise? You don't worry about them. You just, that's the very essence of heresy is taking only portions. This is why we emphasize sola scriptura and tota scriptura. Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith and all of scripture, not just uh, portions of that scripture. Again, he's he's totally blind to his own hypocrisy. Calvinism is based off cherry picking Bible verses and inserting your own views into the scriptures. What I'm doing is taking the full counsel of God's word. I'm getting my understanding of God from that. White wants to look at these isolated instances like the cross, the Assyrians, and then just ignore all the other parts of the Bible that clearly say sin was not God's plan. I mean, I just brought up the issue of sacrificing babies to Baal, uh, where God said neither came it into my mind, and they're cherry picking and bringing in things that aren't even related, like the atonement, which we're not even talking about the atonement. We're talking about babies being sacrificed to, to idols. That's what we're talking about. So White is just repeatedly guilty of what he falsely accuses me of, and this is what he does over and over and over again. Uh, Calvinism is the king of taking verses out of context even taking chapters out of context and ignoring other passages. They will take 1 John 1.8 and ignore 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.8 says if we say that we have no sin, uh, then we're a liar and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1.9 says, but if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So they stop in verse 8 and say, look, we all sin. We all have sin in our life. But verse 9 promises to be cleansed from sin. Again, again that word is apo. It means to be uh, away from, to be separated from. So he, he doesn't just forgive us. It says he forgives us and cleanses us from all sin. They will take Romans 9 and ignore Romans 10 and 11. Even in Romans 9, he says, what's the conclusion of the matter? Like, how, what do we conclude? That the Gentiles, which sought not after righteousness, have attained unto righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. 
And so the whole point of Paul in Romans 9 is that God is now offering salvation uh, to the Gentiles. Gentiles are part of the chosen people, and uh, Israel, who were the chosen people, are being cut off. If you take Romans 9, 10, and 11, you'll see that context. They take it out of context and read Romans 9 to mean, oh, God picks and chooses individuals when the context is about the Gentile nations and uh, the nation of Israel. That's, so they're king of taking entire chapters out of context. When I read Romans 9 as a new convert, I never ever saw Calvinism in it. It wasn't until a Calvinist it showed me their interpretation of Romans 9, and I was just, uh, I was horrified. I was shocked. I couldn't believe that was what they believed. It just grieved my, grieved the Holy Spirit within me. Uh, I thought it was just uh, so alien and foreign. They will take Romans 7, which uh, they think is the Christian life, ignoring Romans 6 and Romans 8. Romans 7 describes uh, Paul's salvation testimony, uh, the struggles that he had as a Pharisee, knowing the law but not uh, really keeping the law, and that he, uh, you know, obviously he persecuted uh, the church and blasphemed, um, but the law was insufficient to deliver him from the um, sin. And it's not the Christian life, because he said as a Christian he had a conscience void of offense. And the man in Romans 7 doesn't have a conscience void of offense. Romans 6 says the Christian life is being free from sin. Uh, Romans 8 says that uh, we walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And that's why we have no condemnation. The man in Romans 7 is under condemnation. They take Romans 7, isolate it from Romans 6 and Romans 8, and say, look, Romans 7 is the Christian life. But it's totally inconsistent with the Christian life described through Romans 6 and Romans 8. You have to read it in its entirety. I think that's why Peter said Paul would be the ones that uh, the Gnostics would take out of context and twist to their own um, destruction because he's hard to understand in the sense that Paul uh, didn't write so much in one-liners like the Apostle John or James. You know, faith without works is dead. He that sins is of the devil. Uh, these are, you know, short and to the point. Paul sometimes wrote elaborate um, thoughts through like, you know, chapters. Romans 9, 10, and 11. Romans 6, 7, and 8. And if you just isolate Paul's ideas uh, and you don't look at the overall picture, then you, you completely miss the point. And that's what Calvinism does. Uh, Calvinists will take Romans 5. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. But they uh, will completely ignore, say, Ezekiel uh, 18, uh, which says, uh, The son does not bear the iniquity of the father. And the way that you share in the sins of your father is by partaking in the sins of your father. That sin is spreading by imitation and not by imputation. And so Romans 5 needs to be understood in light of the totality of the scriptures, especially Ezekiel 18. Um, you know, of course, uh, they will take Romans 9 but ignore uh, Jeremiah 18, which is about the potter and the clay. Romans 9 talks about the potter and the clay, but you have to understand that in context of what Paul was referring to and where Paul got this uh, analogy from, which is Jeremiah 18, where the, the potter is it says, making a vessel unto one purpose, but the clay gets marred in his hands. So then he decides to remake the vessel unto another purpose since it got marred. And that's what God says, can I, can I not do this with you? And that's what you see in Romans 9. Here is Israel, God's chosen people, and they've marred themselves and fitted themselves for destruction. So now he makes them unto vessels of wrath. And is there injustice with God? I mean, these are the chosen people. No, there's no injustice with God because he chose Jacob over Esau uh, before he had done any work at all, before they had done any good or evil. So if God is now cutting off the nation of Israel and grafting in the Gentiles, there's no injustice with God. So Romans 9 needs to be taken in context of Jeremiah 18, but that would be open theism, where he's making the vessel for one thing, and then it mars in his hands, so he makes it for another. God had the nation of Israel as his chosen people, but they rejected him and didn't believe him. So now he makes them vessels of wrath, and he grafts in the uh, Gentiles. So it's a dynamic, changing uh, future. They will take John 1.13, 
about uh, which are born not by the will of uh, or not by blood or by the will of uh, uh, flesh or the will of man, but of God. But they will ignore, uh, you know, verse 12 or, or uh, verse uh, 11 that says, "As many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become the children of God." And that word "received," we'll talk about it and debate it. It does mean to choose. Uh, Labano, and it's in contrast to Paralabano, which is in verse 11, where it says that uh, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And there's a strong emphasis there on choice in the Greek. And we'll talk about that later. They will take like Acts uh, 13, 48, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And, and that's a, a, a Calvinistic slanted translation, really, uh, of ordained. It could um, be translated as disposed. It refers to the people's disposition. It doesn't mean preordained. That's a different Greek word. Um, it just means at the, at the time they were disposed by the preaching to eternal life, and so they believed. But it's in contrast to verses uh, 13, uh, 45. Verse 45 talks about those who uh, judged themselves unworthy of eternal life and had a totally different disposition. And so they will isolate a verse like Acts 13:48 and not look at Acts 13, 45. Of course, they will take John 6, 44, and ignore verse 45 that says, They shall all be taught of God, and uh, everyone who has heard and has learned of the Father comes unto me. So the drawing that God uses to bring people unto himself is teaching them. And if they ha and they have an active role there, because it's used in the active sense in the Greek, uh, everyone that has heard and has learned, and learned is active. So there's, there's not an irresistible grace, but they will take... John 6.44 and try and teach irresistible grace. They'll take Lydia in the book of Acts as an example of monergistic regeneration that God opened up her heart to attend unto the things the apostles were preaching. But Lydia, they'll never tell you, was already a believer in the Father. Lydia already was a worshiper of God. So she had a relationship with God where God didn't need to usurp her will to monergistically regenerate her uh, to attend to the things the apostles preached. Um, God was just leading her um, because she was already a follower of God, a believer in God. And that's really what John 6, 44 is about, is those who already belong to the Father are being given to the Son or being drawn to the Son. People like Cornelius or Apollos, uh, Apollos or uh, Simeon or Lydia. Anyways, uh, so they will use Acts the example of Lydia and Acts is somehow God monergistically regenerating her when that's not what it's about at all. Uh, Calvinists will like to quote things like uh, Romans 3.10. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. But they ignore 1 Peter 4.18 that says, If the righteous are scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Calvinists like to quote Mark 10.18. Jesus said unto him, Why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But they ignore Luke 23.50. It says, Behold, there's a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and just. And uh, they'll quote uh, Ecclesiastes 7.20. Uh, it says, There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. But they ignore 1 John 5.18. For we know whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And that whosoever is born of God, because he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one touches him not. So Calvinism is king of uh, ignoring uh, context, of taking verses out of context, and, and yet James White uh, claims that I'm the one doing that? Uh, it's to the contrary. Out of the Bible, you probably listen to more Piper and Washer and James White than you actually read the Bible. If you believe the Bible, you would say sin did not originate in God's mind. Uh -huh, sure. So let me ask but you. Let your me ask theology you teaches you, you that sin was God's Just idea. for the record, you did affirm. Now I forgot to ask Emilio. I think Emilio is listening, and Emilio, you can text me if you want. But I don't get the feeling this is your first encounter uh, with with Jesse. Uh, I get the feeling that, that this has happened uh, before. I, I could be wrong. Uh, yes, you are wrong, yet again. Not a big surprise there, but yes, you're, you're wrong again. I've never met Emilio before. He's never talked to me, never called me, never emailed me. Never. The first time I ever uh, met him was when he rolls up on me at this uh, event while I'm street preaching with his cameras rolling, trying to confront me. 
Of course, I've never met James White either. James White's never called me, never emailed me, never asked me about my theology. And both Emilio and James White make these public videos about me, having never actually met me before, having never actually talked to me before, never uh, inquired about what I actually believe. So yeah, uh, James White is uh, yet wrong again. I've never met these people before. And he just tried to uh, come out, make a Facebook Live video, tried to embarrass me, but it just backfired on him. That you did affirm that the cross is part of God's let me say it again. Plan, let me say it again. And that sin God took might, place at the cross, God right? God can incorporate sin into his plan. And how are you consistent? That doesn't mean sin was God's plan from the beginning, oh, and it so. doesn't mean all sin was well, God's plan. You don't okay, so that, that was the Leighton Flowers argument right there. That was the Leighton Flowers argument right there. That's exactly what Leighton was saying. Uh, almost identically. Great, who cares? I mean, Leighton Flowers, I've never met him, never talked to him, never watched any of his stuff. Um, it just means we must read the same Bible. Uh, great minds think alike. I've never heard Leighton Flowers before, and I don't uh, think that he got it from me. I don't recall uh, saying it publicly before. I've just thought it for many, many uh, years. Uh, it might be in my free will book, which by the way, this is my free will book. It's called The Natural Ability of Man, uh, a study on free will and human nature. 690 pages uh, defending the historical, biblical, uh, Christian doctrine of free will, also known as man's natural ability, and uh, refutes the idea that free will was lost, a total refutation to Augustine and Luther. Um, uh, also has a 100-page appendix dealing with this uh, issue of original sin and sinful nature, uh, Gnostic heresies. And uh, anyways, it's on Amazon and on my bookstore. But uh, maybe Light and Flowers has read my book, um, but I don't care that you keep comparing what I say to what Light and Flowers says. It just means that we're reading the same Bible. Well, maybe God is trying to speak to you, James. You know, if you're hearing the same thing from multiple sources who are not cooperating together, maybe God's trying to speak to you. Um, just because he foreordained, now he didn't say foreordained. He doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to say predestined. He doesn't want to do any of that. Because as a, he can't predestine things in an open theist universe. God doesn't predestine anything in an open theist universe. Again, what? God doesn't predestine anything in the open theist universe? It's only in the open theist universe is God free to predestine anything because only in the open theistic worldview does God have alternative possibilities to choose between. God can decide to create man and then do it. God can decide to send the flood and then do it. God can decide to have a judgment day and then bring it to pass. So again, he's either lying or he's ignorant and I think I don't know which one it is. I've already explained many times uh, this issue. God has predestined many things. God plans many things. He's predestined many things. Uh, once God saw the wickedness of man, he predestined the flood. Uh, once God saw Nineveh repent, uh, he uh, changed his predetermined plans to destroy them. When uh, Hezekiah prayed, uh, God predetermined that he would live another 15 years. So over and over and over again, we see God making plans and changing plans which requires an open theist view, a dynamic future, an open future. The God of open theism is dynamic and not static because uh, he's the God of scriptures. God predestined the cross. God predestined judgment day. God predestined the end of the world. God makes future plans all the time in open theism and God then acts in time to bring them to pass. So seriously, I mean, read a book. I hate to beat a dead horse. Just pick up God of the Possible. I don't care much for the author, but read this book. Um, it's a great, simple introduction to the open view. And you'll stop saying these stupid things like God doesn't predestine anything in the open view. It's, it's re re retarded. And, I mean, especially if you're going to debate theology, know what you're talking about. If you're going to claim to be some type of theological scholar, how about you read some theology? So he's only revealing the fact that he hasn't really read up on these topics. I mean, don't talk about open theism if you don't care to study it. Uh, I talk about Calvinism because I've been studying it for like 19 years now. Uh, I, I read their theologians. I can, When I make a point about Calvinism, I can quote a Calvinist theologian. I challenge you to show me one open theist theologian who says God can't predestine anything in open theism. That's nonsense. 
So it's just speaking out of ignorance. It's a straw man, and it's it's not helping anything. Not helping anything at all. Because he doesn't know what's going to be happening. He's got to be able to interact with free creatures. He doesn't know what free creatures are going to do, so he doesn't predestinate anything. Okay, here's a, here's a great clip from, again, my friend Chris Fisher dealing with this. These people are low, low mental stability. You see that in their arguments. They argue, if God does not control all things, God can't do anything. He can't say anything about the future if he doesn't control everything. You're, you're a fanatic. Uh, that's not the way the real world works. That's not the way we normally think and operate and behave. And normal people like me can regularly accomplish my will, although not being very powerful. And you're a fanatic, nonsensical, rambling lunatic to think that God can't accomplish things unless he has complete, total power over all things, controlling the most minute dust speck. You guys are lunatics. We're dealing with lunatics. When you're dealing with Calvinists, you're dealing with cultists. All right, so he says uh, God can't predestine anything in open theism because he'd have to interact with free will people. Uh, James White, again, is speaking out of his ignorance. He's making God less than a man. We plan our future all the time, which involves the free will choices of others. I plan to get married on a certain day. Well, how, could I have, how could I plan to get married on a certain day when that involves the free will of my wife and our, our, our you know, groomsmen and, and the, the man who married us and the, man, the people who rented us the, the facility and, and then we had all our guests and oh, that's a lot of free will. I mean, all the, all the guests that came and how, how could we possibly plan a wedding if it involves so many free wills? And, and they, they, he thinks God can't plan anything if it involves free will. Uh, as I've already said, like every seminary in the country promises future classes to future students and these future plans involve the free will choices of others like the professors and yet the seminaries are still able to bring these predetermined plans to pass. We pre-plan to buy groceries at the store involving the free will of others and then we bring it to pass. So he's saying God can't do that? Well, of course he can. The Bible says he does. Here's open theism. Isaiah 46.10 declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and i will do all my pleasure and so this is a total refutation to the calvinist argument that in open theism god can't predestine anything uh, it's funny because Calvinists try to use this as some refutation to open theism, but it's actually teaching open theism that uh, God is able to foretell future events that he foreplans because he then in time brings them to pass. Uh, it's just a classic open theist understanding. Uh, we talk about this verse uh, a little bit more, but um, if God is in time and his time is without beginning and without end, God can say 2,000 years ahead of time that he's going to do something in 2,000 years. So he can foretell it, and then because he's in time and he's able in 2,000 years, he will bring it to pass. Uh, of course, if God is outside of time, he can't bring anything to pass because all action must take place in time. All action requires a cause and effect. All action requires a before and an after. All action takes place in time. So God can't bring anything to pass unless God is in time. Hey, Tony Miano, dude, um, he, he pointed out that uh, Jesse Morrell denies original sin. All right, Tony Miano, uh, he's a staunch Calvinist. He once went and rebuked Brother Jed Smock on campus for living holy. He rebuked Brother Jed for not sinning. It was pretty ridiculous. Uh, he at one point went around lying about me, telling people that I don't go to church, that I'm not a member of a church. Uh, and even though I, we've never met, I've never met Tony Miano, he was going around telling people these lies. So I actually, I he was on staff with Ray Comfort at the time, and I made a video exposing Tony Miano as a liar. And then it was uh, no shorter than like a week later, um, he got fired by Ray Comfort. Um, supposedly for financial reasons, um, but I wondered if my video had anything to do with it because, I mean, you can't have an obvious blatant liar on your ministry staff. This guy is going around just slandering me, saying I'm not a member of a church, I don't go to church. I've been going to church, um, I mean, almost every Sunday since I got saved 19 years ago. Uh, I'm sure I, I missed a few when the kids were sick or I was sick, but I'm very faithful, 
to take my wife to church, my kids to church. Before I had a wife and kids, I was faithful to always go to church. I mean, just it's 19 years of church going, and some Calvinist just wants to slander you and decides it's okay for him to go around telling people you don't go to church when you've never met him, never talked to him. He has no idea. And then when I told him, you know, I do go to church, he says, well, what church? See, he want, the whole tactic was to find out what church I go to because he wants to slander me to the pastor and try and get me in trouble at my church because I'm not a Calvinist. And that's what Tony Miano did to some other brethren that I knew. So I wasn't going to tell Tony the church I go to because I know he was going to call up the pastor and, and create a controversy uh, for no good reason, which he's done before. And I said, I don't have to prove to you what church I go to. You can't just pull out of thin air that I don't go to church and then the, the burden is on me to prove that I do. Um, that's like me saying Tony Miano wears women's underwear. And then when Tony says, what are you talking about? I don't wear women's underwear. And I said, well, you have to prove it. You've never proved to me that you don't. That's what he's saying. He's, you'd never prove to me that you don't go to, or that you do go to church. Uh, so tell me the name of your pastor. Give me his phone number. And I'm like, get out of here. So Tony's a staunch Calvinist, a liar, an, in, an impenitent liar. He has yet to apologize. He's yet to repent. And the Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. I mean, these are the guys Tony Miano hangs out with. Guys like Emilio, who believes abortion is God's plan. Guys like Tony Miano, who's an impenitent liar. I mean, this is, uh, this is the James White gang. Anyways, so he, Tony Miano tells James White, I don't believe in original sin. Uh, Tony Miano denies original sin. Ask Tony if he believes that all sexual desire is sinful. Because if not, if he thinks God created us with sexual desires for reproduction, then he agrees with the Pelagians, and he actually disagrees with Augustine's doctrine of original sin. Uh, I actually do believe in what the Orthodox doctrine of original sin, um, like as the Greek Orthodox would teach it, that um, and the early church fathers teach it, that Adam committed the original sin, which brought death to all of us. And, uh, well, I certainly agree with Romans 5. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That... Uh, you know, what I disagree with is all of these theories that people add to Romans 5, like federal headship or seminal identity, uh, uh, traducianism, that sort of thing that Paul never even taught in Romans 5. Um, anyway, so I believe Adam committed the original sin, and his original sin brought death to all of us. What I deny would be heresies like infant damnation, or that we inherit a sinful nature. Uh, or that free will was lost by original sin. Uh, these are things that people have added uh, to the Bible that's not actually found in the Bible. If you read Genesis, read the list of consequences God declared on account of Adam's original sin, things like the loss of free will or, or nature being, being sinful, they're not mentioned or even hinted at. Uh, so, Tony Miano denies the... Augustinian doctrine of original sin, which is the historic doctrine of original sin. But is he King James only? Um, because I figured Tony will know, and let me know on Twitter, or you've got my, you've got, you can text me too. So again, James White, he's never talked to me, never asked me what I believe. He's just speaking out of ignorance. He says, is he, is he G King James only? He doesn't know what I believe. He doesn't know my theology. No. I do my daily devotions in Greek. I do my daily devotions in the Greek New Testament. So, uh, James White, again, he's critiquing my theology without really knowing what it is. Uh, he falsely called me a Pelagian. He falsely called me a sinless perfectionist. He falsely says I deny original sin. I only deny the uh, theories of original sin that the Calvinist uh, uh Require, you know, teach like federal headship, humanal identity. I don't deny that Adam committed the original sin that brought death to us all. And now he's falsely uh, implying or thinking that I'm a King James onlyist. Uh, King James is the only English translation that I read, but a true King James onlyist um, believes that you shouldn't even learn the Greek, shouldn't even read the Greek. Uh, I was talking to a King James onlyist. Uh, and uh, they saw that I had quoted some Greek on my blog and they were like, well, why do you need Greek when, when God gave us, uh, you know, the, the perfect English Bible, the King James Bible? And, the, and I said, they said, um, they said are, you, are you Greek? And I said, actually, I am Greek. I am Greek. My family's Greek. I, in fact, I inherited uh, the family Greek Bible. I have a Greek New Testament that belonged to my grandfather's aunt. 
uh, and uh, they were all Greek Orthodox. And so, like, yeah, it is, I mean, because he, their view, King James only people think English people should read the English Bible. Well, Greek people should read the Greek Bible. That we have the King James Bible, and the, the Greeks have the Textus Receptus, and you shouldn't be reading the Greek unless you are Greek. It, but it threw a wrench in his gears when I told him I, am, I actually am Greek. Anyways, I'm not, a, I'm not a King James onlyist in the sense that I only read the King James. I only read the King James for my English studies, but I read the Greek New Testament. Um, I read the Textus Receptus. I read the majority text. Uh, I am not a fan of the Alexandrian text. I believe in the Byzantine family, um, but that's another issue. Anyways, if James White wanted to know what I believed, he could just ask me. Even now, he made this video publicly. It's got like over 10,000 views. And he's got all these questions about what I believe. He's never called me, never emailed me. My, my phone number is on my website. My email's on the website. He's never reached out to me to ask me, hey, Jesse, are you King James only? Nope, because he doesn't care to represent my beliefs accurately. He just wants to advance his Calvinistic heresies, and he doesn't care who he slanders in the process. He's just a typical Calvinist. You can let me know one way or the other because he's going to make the argument that the phrase free will occurs a certain number of times in the King James Bible, but the term sovereign never does, as if that's an argument. Yeah, I said, I said the word free will occurs 17 times in the King James Bible. The word sovereignty doesn't occur once. Listen, I admit, I kind of said that to troll you guys to get under your skin a little bit, but it is true. Uh, free will is used 17 times in the King James Bible, and the word sovereignty isn't used once. So it is ironic that people, Calvinists uh, reject free will but teach uh, their view of sovereignty, and they say free will is a myth, but, oh, God is sovereign. Uh, you can tell they get their theology from systematic uh, textbooks rather than from the actual Bible. Uh, the Bible does teach free will in a lot of places, in a lot of ways, uh, besides the term free will. I mean, every time God is disappointed in the Bible, every time God is surprised in the Bible, all of that implies uh, free will. All the passages that teach that believers can fall away from the faith, that you can lose your salvation, all of that implies free will. Uh, I should make it. I had, in fact, I have another video coming about the, a, a good Bible study on how you can lose your salvation, which is, is yet another Bible study that destroys Calvinism. But if you can't look at any translation of the Bible and see that God is king, that he rules, that he reigns, that he accomplishes his purpose, those are all found in the King James Version of the Bible. And if you can't see it, the vast majority of times that free will occurs in the uh, King James Version of the Bible, it's about offerings. It's about offerings that are not demanded for sin, but are given freely by the person, has nothing to do with whether the person's will is free. All right, look, nobody is denying that God is the king. Uh, God, he's king of kings and lord of lords. That doesn't mean that he gets everything that he wants, that there's no rebellion in his kingdom. To the contrary, he says, bring those enemies of mine that would not have me to reign over them and slay them before me. We don't deny that God is a king. We don't deny that God reigns. We don't deny that God brings things to pass. What we're simply saying is that sin is a rebellion against his reign. Bring those enemies of mine that would not have me to reign over them and slay them before me. And not all of the times that the King James Bible uses the word free will is it referring to just free will offerings. Uh, Ezra 7.13 says that the king decreed that anyone uh, could go up to Jerusalem out of their own free will. Uh, that's interesting because you can see how free will and decrees can be compatible. Uh, he decreed that you can go up to Jerusalem by your own free will. So just like the God of the Bible who, uh, who decrees uh, uh, your use of your, your let's, he decrees you to have free will. He says, I've set before you life and death, choose life. Anyways, but a free will offering is still a free will offering. The fact that it's referring to an offering by no means makes it less free will. It's just as much free will as if it was a free will sin or free will holiness. Free will is free will. Free will offerings are free will. It's the King James that likewise says no man is able. It's the King James that says in Romans 8 that those who are in the flesh cannot do what is pleasing to God. Those are the things that Jesse Morrell cannot believe and does not believe. This is the Calvinist eisegesis. It says, those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, who's in the flesh? 
the context is the carnal mind, which is minding the flesh. It's a volitional state of mind, a voluntary state of mind. Those who are minding the flesh cannot please God because they are carnally minded and God cannot be pleased with carnality. It's not saying that those who are minding the flesh cannot change their mind. It's not saying they can't repent and mind the spirit. Uh, the Bible actually says, set your affections on things above and not things beneath. And it's using the same Greek word. It shows free will that you have a choice to set your affections or set your mind on things above and not things beneath. So the carnal mind is a voluntary state of mind. And to say that those who are carnally minded cannot be pleasing to God while they're in a carnal state of mind says absolutely nothing about whether or not they can change their mind. Simply that while they're in the flesh, they cannot be pleasing to God. Um, and in fact, I dealt with that pretty extensively in my book on the natural ability of man. Uh, but since the Bible doesn't actually teach their doctrine of inability, they have to overlay it and insert it into verses like the one he just did with eisegesis. Just like they read into things like, oh, dead in your trespasses and sins. Oh, that means no free will. Dead men, have, uh, dead men can't do anything. No, dead in your trespasses and sins is talking about no relationship. Dead in your relationship to God, like the prodigal son, who was dead in his relationship to God and yet had the ability to return to the Father. Um, but dead in your trespasses and sins does not mean you, uh, you know, free will was lost because of Adam and now we inherit um, inability from Adam. It says dead in your trespasses and it's plural, and in your sins. So it's personal and it's plural. It's by no means an argument that because of Adam, free will was lost, and now we inherit a, a sinful nature from Adam that has no free will. They, they read these things into the Bible. So the Bible doesn't teach that we're born incapable of good because of Adam's original sin. That's a completely uh, false man-made theology. It's man-centered theology. It's a sin-accommodating uh, theology. And that's what James White is doing. God so is it's, you're not being logical. You God learns. You're not being logical. You're committing many fallacies. You're an open theist. You, don't, you believe God takes open in knowledge. Open theism is what the Bible teaches. <laughs> if you were really sure. sola scriptura, sure, sure. you would believe the Bible that neither uh -huh. came into my mind that they would do such a right, thing. Right. If you were really sola scriptura, yeah, God says he knows the listen, beginning and the end. He declares the beginning and the end. Every Calvinist is an open theist when they pray. Now, let's two things. Uh, sola Scriptura without Tota Scriptura results in that mess. That's why you have to have both. All right. Tota Scriptura. Uh, you know, I don't even know why uh, sometimes they, they, they try and speak Latin like it, like it somehow adds weight to their, to their argument. Um, the Latin Vulgate's not even a good translation. Uh, you should read the Greek, but for, there's this tradition uh, amongst the uh, reformers speaking in Latin, and that's because they came from the Roman Catholic Church, and the Roman Catholic Church did their Mass in Latin, and so they have this Tota Scriptura, Sola Scriptura, uh, Simul Justice Ec Peccator, all that stuff, because the, the Calvinists are just modified Catholics. Anyway, Sola Scriptura and Tota Scriptura um, actually results in open theism. Uh, you see the truth of open theism from Genesis to Revelation. God repented of making man. Uh, God shortened the days for the sake of the elect. Jesus could pray for 12 legions of angels. Jesus said, pray that your flight not be in winter. God added 15 years to Hezekiah's life. God canceled his destruction, uh, his prophecy to Nineveh. Uh, God was going to make a nation out of Moses, and then Moses interceded. God sought for a man to stand in the gap that he would not destroy them, but he found none. Um, and so the mess, James, is, is in your head. I mean, literally, like, your, your mind is the devil's outhouse, just full of heresies and blasphemies and slanders upon the character and heart of God, saying that uh, a, it's God's plan for babies to be aborted. It's God's will for babies to be aborted. You literally have to reject the God of the Bible because uh, the Bible teaches uh, open theism. The Bible contradicts Calvinism over and over and over again. And every Calvinist is an open theist and they pray is a lie. Okay, it's either abject ignorance on a stunning level or it's a lie. Completely and totally. Um... I do a lot of praying in public, 
and <laughs> you have you, good luck finding any evidence of me ever praying as an open theist in any context whatsoever. Um, not not possible. Actually, you you already did. You said you hope and pray light and flowers does not go this way. I think go the way of open theism. So you already prayed like an open theist. Praying for the future implies the future is either not determined yet or changeable. But if it's already eternally fixed, praying for the future now would make no difference. Uh, but saying, oh, I'm a Calvinist and I pray and I'm not an open theist, that doesn't address the actual point that I'm making. Praying for something assumes it isn't decided yet or that it's changeable. Pray that your flight not be in winter implies that it's not yet settled whether your flight will be in winter or not. Praying for a good day. Praying that your food will be blessed to your body. Praying for safe travels. Praying for someone's salvation. It all assumes an open view of the future in which prayer is presented to God and presented to his mind as a determining factor in him deciding the course of the future, as a contributing factor for him to consider. Already in this video, he admitted that he was praying for the future and praying that light and flowers, hoping and praying light and flowers doesn't become an open theist. So he's already praying like an open theist. So there, I found you doing it right in this video. Anytime you see James White praying for the future, he's praying like an open theist. Anytime you pray for a future event to happen or to not to hap not happen, you're praying like an open theist. Because if it was already predetermined, praying or not praying would make no difference as to whether it happened or not. But James White just completely missed the point, went right over his head, and all he could say was, well, I'm a Calvinist and I pray and I'm not an open theist. You miss the point that the nature of prayer is open theistic itself. Whenever you pray, you assume it's not decided yet. Pray according to God's will. Now, catch that. Whenever you pray, you assume it's not decided yet. N O. I know that my God knows the beginning from the end. Your God doesn't. My God does. That's the, that's the God of Isaiah. That's the God Jesus taught. Knows the end from the beginning. He can explain why everything in, in, in the past has happened. Your God can't do that. You do not have a biblical God, Jesse. Not even close. Not even close. Okay, did you catch his argument? He said, N-O, no. <laughs> Whenever you pray, you assume it's not decided yet. No. N-O, no. That was the substance of his argument. Uh, White just completely dodges and bypasses the point, and instead, then he goes on to just make his own uh, counter-argument, and that's his whole mode of operation. Uh, he's just, you know, oh, God knows the end from the beginning. Uh, just bypass the point and, and make your own assertion and, and uh, argument. I'm always amazed when people use Isaiah 46.10 as some type of refutation to open theism, uh, the doctrine that says that the future has open alternative possibilities, that God is not predetermined to everything, that God's foreknowledge consists in open possibilities. Because read carefully again, Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. I right, think about what Isaiah 46.10 is actually saying. It says, God foretells certain future events that he has predetermined. Does it say that God foretells and foreplans all future events? Certainly not. Does it say that God foretells us all the details of the future? No. And therefore Isaiah 46.10 is saying that God foretells and consequently uh, foreplans some future events. So some future events are foretold because some future events are foreplanned. And that's perfectly compatible with an open system of future possibilities. The future is open for God to decide and he foretells us some of the things that he has planned. I mean, even I can foretell my wife today that I'm planning on going to the store tomorrow. It's an open system of possibilities that makes that type of planning even possible. So Isaiah 46.10 is by no means a refutation of open theism. It's only possible within 
open theism, but the argument that an open theist, uh, or the argument that a Calvinist is an open theist every time that he prays um, is an argument that James White actually has yet to refute. He thinks this scripture um, somehow was some encounter argument to that, uh, but by no means does it, does it do that. It, it completely falls short. Now, this is a good illustration, though, folks, of something important, because what this illustrates is that when we pray, we are not praying to make God better. We are not begging God to be better than God is. All right, look, again with the straw men putting words in our mouth, uh, whoever said that we pray to make God better? My argument is that if you're praying for a future event to happen or not to happen, then you are assuming that that future event is not yet determined or that it is changeable and that God will hear and consider your prayers in deciding and determining if it will happen or not. Saying, God, please keep us safe on our travels. It assumes that God's going to hear your prayers and then decide to keep you safe or not. If it's eternally predetermined, then it makes no point, uh, there's no point praying for it now. So White has created a straw man like, oh, we're praying to make God better than he is because he can't deal with the actual argument at hand. So, I mean, this guy's an epic failure uh, when it comes to theological debates. He can't deal with the actual arguments that are being presented. What? we are praying is that we would be changed so that we would be brought into harmony with God's will. All right, so he says that we pray that we will be changed, that we will be brought into harmony with God's will. All right, so you're praying that we would be changed, so you never pray for God to do something? You already prayed that light and flowers wouldn't go there, so you're praying for God to intervene or to contribute to that issue? Um, you never pray for God to do something? Yeah, right. I mean, you're not really fooling anybody. Uh, you pray for future events to happen or not to happen. You pray uh, for safe travels. You pray for safe trips. You pray for good days. You pray for people's salvation. Uh, you pray for future events, for God to act in causing future events or bringing to pass future events. So you assume that prayer affects the plans of God in determining the future, in the here and now, that the future is an ongoing development, which implies uh, openness. So he says, so we would be brought into harmony with God's will. Really? His revealed will or his secret will? Harmony with his secret will? Well, no point in praying for that. It's automatic. Harmony with his revealed will? Well, there's no point in praying for that. You believe God already secretly willed for you to daily violate his revealed will. So, that's impossible. So there's really no point in praying at all in Calvinism. It's already fixed and predetermined. Praying that uh, you would be changed and brought into conformity with his will makes no sense, given your distinction of revealed will and secret will. There's really no point in praying uh, at all to be brought into harmony with God's will in Calvinism. So it seems like James White hasn't really thought it through. Uh, his theology stinks. It's riddled with contradictions. It's riddled with inconsistencies. And I mean, honestly, we're only scratching the surface here. We're only at the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, but prayer can change God's mind. It happens no, it all cannot. the time in the Bible. No, it cannot. God said, leave me alone, prayer Moses. I'll God's make mind. a nation out of it, out have of you. you. Heard of the, uh, now, I love this one, too, because, again, this is another one of those places where you just have to, you have to expose open theism for the error that it is. When God works with Moses, and he works with Moses, he brings about situations where Moses has to stand as the intercessor for the people of Israel. Is God changing his course in light of Moses' intercession, or is God using that to change Moses himself, to make him much more of the leader that he needs to be for the people of Israel. Okay, is God changing his course, or is God making a better leader out of Moses? So that's a perfect example of eisegesis. Uh, he can't accept what the Bible says, that Moses interceded and changed God's mind. 
God said, leave me alone, Moses. Let me burn in my anger and wrath, and I will make a nation out of you instead. And God intercede, or Moses interceded with God, and the Bible says God repented. God repented. It doesn't say God was forming and shaping Moses to be this leader, that God was manipulating Moses to become the type of person that he wanted. It says God repented of destroying Israel and making a nation out of Moses. It was real intercession. That's what He was literally standing in the gap. God was going to destroy these people. Moses actually interceded for the people. But why can't see it that way. So it, it, he's not viewing it as God being changed. It's God was uh, making a, a leader out of Moses. So he can't accept what the Bible actually says. He has to insert into the text something that isn't there, that God was just pulling Moses' leg to make Moses a better leader. It's a perfect example, I mean perfect, of eisegesis. It's malpractice, doctor of theology. This is malpractice. And then he adds this straw man argument about teaching God. No open theist says that. There's not a, I mean, it's a Calvinist straw man. It's propaganda. Uh, we simply believe that God takes our prayers into consideration in determining future events. That's it. God generally wanted uh, to hear, God generally wants to hear from his people uh, that prayer really matters. It's not anything about teaching God, or making God better than he is. It's a system of prayer that God has established whereby God takes our prayers into consideration uh, when actively determining uh, the course of the future. Moses, anthropomorphic it's language. It's called intercession. He sought for a man the Bible also who says would stand, Jesse, up the, Jesse, stand in the gap the Bible and make also up says the God has wings that he would not destroy them. Enjoy this stuff, guys. Yeah. The, the Bible says God has wings and feathers. Do you believe that, Jesse? So the future Jesse? could have been and different. Do you, you believe God's a bird? That's anthropomorphic. That's anthropomorphic. That's anthropomorphic. So when God uses anthropomorphic language to When the Bible says God repents, no, that's not anthropomorphic No, that's anthropopathic. No, sir. No, it's called anthropopathic when it's but emotions. It's still a, anthropomorphic it's still has to do with the shape. But it's still a anthropopathic has to do with feelings. Yeah, so you don't even still, have your terms right because you're being fed by Calvinist propaganda. It's still uh, you're being fed by Calvinist propaganda. Uh, yeah, you can you can tell when my comments really uh, hit a, a raw nerve or got under his skin because he just starts the, that type of mockery. Uh, it appears again that he can give it; he just can't take it. Uh, he resorts to mockery because he. He, well, he knows he's losing the argument. Uh, Calvinists often miscategorize God's emotions as anthropomorphic, when the proper category, if you were to do that, would be anthropopathic. Uh, it shows that they're just being fed the same Calvinist propaganda uh, when they all make the same mistake. The reality is, Mr. Morell, that there is an entire category of discussion of anthropomorphic language that is not limited to spatial realities. You're the one that doesn't know your categories. Okay, just just thought I'd throw that in there. Now again, uh, oh, you don't know your categories. You can see I, I hit a nerve. Look, m the categories I said there are completely true. Just look it up. Uh, I mean, make friends with a dictionary, Dr. White. Uh, spatial reality? I mean, who talks like that? We're trying, some people will try and use like overbearing vocabulary sometimes to appear smarter than they really are, uh, to try and like intellectually bully their opponent. Um, oh, spatial reality. Look, uh, anthropomorphic language does re re refer to uh, form, to shape. Uh, it, it's Greek, it's anthropos. Anthropos is man, and uh, morphe means shape or form. So anthropomorphic means man's form, man's shape. Uh, that's literally what anthropomorphic means. Again, uh, anthropos is man, and pathos is Greek for feeling. And so anthropopathic refers to man's feelings. And so if you're going to talk about God's feelings, you're not talking about anthropomorphic, which is man's shape. You're talking about anthropopathic, which is man's feelings. And it's not that um, when God has feelings that this is anthropopathic, that we're projecting upon God human emotions and feelings that he doesn't really have. It's that we were made in God's image. 
we are made in God's likeness. Uh, we get angry at injustice and sin because God gets angry at injustice and sin. Um, we enjoy uh, happiness and love and you know those things because God enjoys happiness and love and those things. And so we were made in God's image. So God having feelings and emotions is not anthropopathic. Anyways, James White is categorically wrong. They, they do this error a lot. They just define God's feelings as anthropomorphic. And he dodged the point. He said it, it means more than spatial reality, but he never says what it means. So he's just dodging the point. God repented. What does that mean? Oh, it, it's just uh, anthropomorphic, anthropopathic. Anthropomorphic language always uh, communicates a literal truth. So what does it mean? So now there's a trend amongst modern Calvinists, even like Wayne Grudem, who actually says God's emotions are real. Uh, they don't dismiss them as anthropopathic, uh, but uh, this is actually inconsistent with Calvinism, which denies um, that God is able to change in any way whatsoever. Uh, they teach immutability, they teach timelessness, and uh, if God has changing feelings, if God can be provoked to wrath, provoked to jealousy, if God can repent, then, uh, then these, are, these are changes that are taking place in time. So it would totally contradict timelessness. It would totally contradict the uh, doctrine of immutability. If God is outside of time, then he can't change in any way. So if God is outside of time, he cannot have feelings. He cannot have emotions. <clears throat> so I wonder, does James White think that God's emotions are real? Some Calvinists like Wayne Grudem think God has real emotions. So when Calvinists say that Jesus pacified the anger of God, is that just merely anthropopathic language? Uh, Calvinism is just full of contradictions and inconsistencies like that, uh, that any you know, thinking mind can, can see very blatantly. They talk about Jesus pacifying the anger of God, but then they also say God has no actual anger, no actual feeling and emotions at all. So back to Emilio's weak argument, which is a common tactic, again, amongst in this Calvinist cult, when, when the Bible describes God in a way that doesn't fit their preconceived notions of him, they just label that anthropomorphic, and they think that settles the matter. They forget, or at least don't know, that anthropomorphic language always has a literal meaning. So Psalm 711 says, uh, God is angry with the wicked every day. Well, in the Hebrew, that word angry means foaming at the mouth. God is foaming at the mouth every day. Uh, so the foaming at the mouth is figurative language, anthropomorphic language. But the literal truth is that God is angry. Okay, the, sh the Bible talks about being in the shadow of his wings. Again, that's anthropomorphic language with the literal meaning to talk about his provision, to talk about his protection. Uh, anthropomorphic language conveys the quality of something. And so what's the quality of, uh, of, of wings? It's, it's protection and provision. Um, so when the Bible says in like Genesis 6 that God repents and they say, oh, that's just anthropomorphic language and they just dismiss the matter. But okay, what's the literal meaning? If, anthropomorphic, if, if repenting is anthropomorphic, what is the quality that that anthropomorphic language is trying to convey? What, what does what quality does repentance uh, convey? Well, when you repent of something, it means you, you wished uh, it, you didn't do it. You wish something hadn't happened. And so in the case of Genesis, God repented of making man. It means he wished he didn't do it. He had regret that he created man. Uh, that's, if it's, even if it's anthropomorphic language, that's what it's conveying. Anthropomorphic language is figurative language that communicates a literal truth. It conveys the quality of something. So the word repent in Genesis actually means to sigh deeply, to sigh like with deep grief. Now is God actually breathing heavily? No, I don't think so. I think that is the anthropomorphic language. But the literal truth is that God didn't uh, want man to sin, that he didn't create man to sin, that he is sorry that he made man now that he is seeing sin. Uh, that Hebrew word that means to sigh deeply, God repented, uh, I think that's anthropomorphic. It's a word picture. Hebrew has a lot of word pictures. And so the anthropomorphic language is there, but the literal truth is also there because that's the whole point of, of anthropomorphic language. So Calvinists claim that anthropomorphic language is like part of their hermeneutics, but in fact they use it to avoid 
proper hermeneutics and exegesis on certain passages just all together. It's a big cop-out for them when they think it somehow gives them a way to deal with the text and it really just gives them a way out from dealing with it. They never explain what the literal truth being communicated is when the Bible is using these anthropomorphic languages or word pictures. So the whole point of anthropomorphism, anthropomorphisms isn't that you can just outright dismiss a passage but so that you can understand their literal meaning. It's a communication technique that is supposed to help you understand a literal truth about God. So anytime a Calvinist uses, oh, anthropomorphic to just dismiss and completely outright reject a description of God, they're using it in an abusive way. Uh, they're abusing this literary technique to completely dismiss the whole point. And that's what James White and Emilio are doing. This is what the Bible says. Sin was not God's plan. Jesus died for everyone. God wants everyone to be saved. So and you're supposed to love your neighbor as so yourself. What does Matthew you don't even mean want everyone says, to be saved. So what does Matthew mean? So you're not a loving person. That means people. you're a false convert. You're not a real Christian. Who are his if you were a real Christian, you would want everyone to be saved. Who, who are his but people? you're a heretical Calvinist who only wants when the Paul elect says, to be saved. When Paul says, I so do you're all a false convert. Sake of the elect. So you're, you're, you're a false about. convert. Listen. When Meanwhile, and see, I, I only listened to this over lunch on my headphones while I was eating. Um, and I noticed something here. Look past uh, Jesse's camera over there on the right-hand side. And that looks like a Muslim woman. And, which they would say Muslimah. Uh, talking to somebody. I hope she's talking to someone who understands grace. And not one of Jesse's people. Uh, because that's the last thing a Muslim would need would be to be talking to someone who is a who claims to be a Christian and is actually a heretic. That would be uh, unfortunate, but who knows? Um, he probably has a fair number of, uh, of folks there, so who knows? All right, yeah. Let's just completely just ignore every point that I was just making and just uh, point out some random person in the crowd. Just ignore everything I just said. Uh, ignore all those points that you can't address, that you don't know how to refute, and then just point out some Muslim lady in the crowd in the back who has nothing to do with anything. So again, notice that he just totally dodges the point and instead just points out some, some Muslim in the back. Uh, oh, if you were... Um, look, the point I made is to, to Emilio, which White just dodged, is if you were a real Christian, you would want everyone to be saved because that's what true love demands. But he just, he didn't even address that. He dodged it by pointing out some random Muslim lady in the crowd. So this allowed him to then uh, to continue on the video without commenting on that point that was made. It's, you know, he's being a tricky little devil. Uh, I think that's really what's going on here is that, I mean, Calvinism is just being torn up uh, and destroyed and he doesn't really know how to deal with it. So he just doesn't deal with it. How do you deal with the fact that um, you don't want everyone to be saved because your God doesn't want everyone to be saved. And if you were a real loving Christian, you would want everyone to be saved. Deal with that. Don't ignore it. Don't point out some random Muslim in the crowd. Just deal with the argument. I'm, says I do everything the, for the elect are God's who's special Paul's people. I'm, so who's I'm, that? I'm the elect. I'm God's uh -huh. special. Okay. So Anyone now you that believe in election. Only. Calvinists are not elect because you live a I, sinful I, life. I, Every day of your life you I sin. Thought, so you're not elect. Yeah, Jesse, I thought you were. You're not elect. You know what the Bible says? He laid his life down for his friends. So if, words in his mouth. if the atonement was limited, Jesus didn't die. Out of his mouth. Jesus didn't mouth. die for Calvinists because the Bible says he died for his friends. He just said, I'm the elect. And he said, You are my friend if you do whatever you heard it here first, folks. Jesse believes Jesus that he's said, elect, thus I'm he is elect. a Calvinist. I'm, I'm, I'm a God. But he just I'm said Calvinism is false. People. So he just refuted his own position. God wants everyone this is to be why elect. this guy's a heretic God and I don't associate God with wants this guy. Everyone to be All right, look at this is the poor reasoning skills of this guy, Emilio, and he's he's a supposed to be a pastor. It's it's sad. I have a different understanding of what elect means. The word eklektos means uh, chosen, uh, which is the Calvinist preferred uh, definition. But it could also mean choice or best of its kind, excellent or favorite, like the choiced flowers. And that's why the Bible says like in 1 Peter 2, 6, that Jesus Christ is elect uh, and precious. Uh, it also says that holy angels are elect 
in 1 Timothy 5.21. Now, Jesus was never lost and uh, never redeemed. The holy angels were never lost and were never redeemed. So they were not like chosen out of sin uh, to be saved. They are elect, electos, in the sense that they are holy and the best of their kind. The holy angels are uh, the best type of angels there are. It's better than the fallen angels because they're holy. Um, so Paul addresses the church in the Bible as holy brethren or as saints, as Paul calls them. And therefore, he refers to the church as the elect. But again, Calvinists have to insert their theology into the Bible. So they take little phrases like, you know, elect, just like they did with the word foreknew, and they attach eternal, exhaustive foreknowledge, even though that same word is applied to the, ma the man's foreknowledge. Uh, they apply, the, they, they take that little word elect, and they say, oh, see, that means uh, unconditionally elected from eternity. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, it just means that God, Paul is addressing the, the church, the holy church, as, as elect, as the choice or the best of its kind, just like the holy angels are elect. So saints are holy, and, uh, and the word um, saint and holy is the same Greek word. It's hagios. So when the Bible says be holy, it's saying be a saint. When the Bible says that to the to the holy saint or to the, that you know to the saints in Ephesus, it's saying to the holy ones in Ephesus. Uh, the word holy and saint is the same word. So a being who lives holy, by definition, is elect. And I'm elect because I live holy because I've been born again. Uh, Calvinists don't live holy; they sin every day, so they're not elect. So, anyways, Emilio is reasoning. Look, oh, Jesse believes uh, he's elect, and so therefore he's a Calvinist. But he just said Calvinism is false. So he just refuted his own position. And that's why this guy is a heretic. I mean, talk about an ignoramus. Talk about lacking skills and reason and logic. You don't comprehend what I am saying. And that's why you're not able to adequately address and refute what I just said. Uh, I do think it's funny that he said, oh, G Jesse is a Calvinist. But then he said Jesse is a heretic in the same breath. So he's basically just, uh, you know, contradicting himself. Uh, he's the one refuting himself. Uh, it's really no wonder that, I mean, Emilio seems to like James White and that Emilio's a James White fan because Emilio lacks uh, skills in reasoning and in logic. I preach here every week a true gospel, no, and he's here false preaching gospel. a false you don't gospel. Even love these these people. people, tell them you that some of them are determined people. to go to hell. Hey, tell these people Jesus said, you are my friend if you... Now, what was that guy saying? I, t t tell these people that you want them to go to hell, I think is what he was saying. No, he said, tell these people, tell them that some of them are destined to go to hell. In other words, Emilio claims that he comes out and he preaches the true gospel, but he isn't even publicly honest with the crowd with what his theology is. I mean, no Calvinist street preacher ever preaches Calvinism in the open air. Uh, yet you have Calvinists saying, oh, Calvinism is the gospel. If Calvinism is the gospel, then preach Calvinism in the open air and see how well that works. Tell the people that God predestined who would be saved and who would not be saved and that they can't do anything about it and that it doesn't depend upon them at all. So you never find an honest Calvinist street preacher. They all preach like Arminians as if salvation is open and available to everyone and that it needs to be received by choice. So he's saying, you know, tell these people uh, that you believe uh, that some of them are are destined to go to hell, that they can't do anything about it because that's not what they, they're not honest. I'm not sure. I mean, there, there is, you know, we have Trump derangement syndrome. We have Doug Wilson derangement syndrome. But very clearly, there is Calvinist derangement syndrome. Yes, Calvinism is a derangement syndrome. Calvinism is a deranged view of God. I mean, think of their reasoning skills. God predetermined the atonement. Therefore, God predetermined abortion. I mean, this is the reasoning skills Emilio and James White are putting out. Their whole view of God is insanity. I mean, Calvinism is systematic madness. 
I mean, sinning every day is madness. Why would you want to sin every day? I mean, violate God's law every day. God's law tends for your good. God's law tends for your happiness. Sin tends to misery and destruction. So if you're sinning every day, you are morally insane. And that's what Calvinism teaches. Not only that God predestined you to sin, but that he predestined you to sin every day of your life until you die. And so Calvinism is systematic insanity. Whatever I command you, yeah. do you do everything God commands, or do you sin every day? I sin every every day and thought, you sin word, every and day, so thought word and deed. You sin every day, so Jesus. So if the atonement's limited, so you don't then sin, he didn't Jesse? die for you. You don't sin. Listen, Jesse? Jesus said, "I lay my life down Jesse, you don't for sin? my friends." Jesse, you don't sin. I don't sin every day. You don't. Now, did you are you catching the argument? Let me let me lay the argument out because there's, there's, there's chanting stirring in the background. Here's his argument. Um, Jesus dies for his friends. He calls it, if, if you're my friends, you'll keep my commandments. If you sin, then you're not Jesus' friend, therefore Jesus didn't die for you if you believe in limited atonement. Calvinists will take a verse like, I lay my life down for my friends as proof of a limited atonement. See, look, he died only for his friends. He said, I lay my life down for my friends. That's, that's their reasoning skills. Uh, but they ignore the context because uh, Jesus goes on to say, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. It's John 15, 13. I lay my life down for my friends. The very next verse, verse 14. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So this is a very logical argument. If, there's an internal critique, like presuppositional apologetics, internal critiquing. If the atonement really is limited, then Jesus didn't die for Calvinists because they sin every day. They never stop sinning. They never get to the point where they do whatsoever Jesus commands. So fine, if I lay my life down for my friends as a statement of limiting the atonement, then you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you is the qualifier of who his friends are that the atonement is limited to, and Calvinists are not his friends because Calvinists don't do whatsoever he commands. So fine. If you Calvinists want your limited atonement, then you can have it. But that means Jesus didn't die for you. So, talk about incredible illustration of how to twist Scripture. I mean, twisting Scripture? Anytime a Bible verse is used to teach limited atonement, then the Bible is being twisted. So he's right in the sense that it is twisting Scripture. To, to say, I lay my life down for my friends is a statement of a limited atonement. No, if he died for everyone, that includes his friends. So he laid his life down for his friends. Okay, Paul said that Jesus gave himself for me. And he, so does that mean that Jesus only died for the Apostle Paul? See, Calvinists will take these statements like he laid his life down for his friends or a good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. And they say, see, look, he died for his friends, so he didn't die for his enemies. He died for his sheep, so he didn't die for, for goats. Well, then if you take what Jesus or what Paul said, that he redeemed me and gave his life for me, then Jesus only died for the Apostle Paul because Paul said he died for me. And so that anytime the Bible is used to teach a limited atonement, it is being twisted. So I agree with James White, but all I'm doing is taking their premise which is based on twisting scripture and then taking that to its logical conclusion based upon the context of this verse. Judas went out and hanged himself. Go to another text of scripture. Go ye and do likewise. <laughs> okay? Oh, and what you do, do quickly. So now you've got three different... Hey, it's biblical, right? Biblical texts, you string them together and ta-da! You just proved something. I'm not sure what you proved. Um, All right, so he's talking about taking verses out of context and stringing them together as if that's what I just did. This isn't cherry-picking verses, it's taking them in context. It's tota scriptura on this subject of his friends. John 15, 13, I lay my life down for my friends. John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. I think James White didn't realize that this is the context. He's comparing it to, oh, Jesus, or Judas hung himself, go do likewise, what you do, do quickly, as if I'm just mashing together and stringing together all these verses that don't belong together. So James is either ignorant 
uh, that I'm that these this is verse 13 and verse uh, 14 in context, or he's just being deceptive, uh, or both. But either way, doctor, this is malpractice, spiritual malpractice, theological malpractice to say that I'm taking the Bible and stringing together uh, a bunch of different verses like I'm cherry picking them. Uh, saying that I am piecing these unrelated scriptures together when I'm actually taking just two verses in context, it's that's unbelievable. But I mean, that's how Calvinists roll. Uh, I'm just taking Calvinist to its logical Calvinism to its logical conclusion that, uh, well, Jesus didn't die for for Calvinists. That's here's a great illustration of that. So you ignore Jesus's plain statements that. God the Father sovereignly determines the identity of the elect that he gives to the Son. The Son saves them perfectly. Um, does not lose a single one of them. You can't believe any of that if you're Jesse Morrell because you're an open theist, so, you, so, so God couldn't do any of that type of stuff. All right. Look, this is how, this is James White's whole technique throughout this whole thing. Just ignore the point that I just made. He never actually refuted the point that if the atonement is limited, Jesus didn't die for Calvinists. He never actually refuted that. He just said what I, he just claimed that I was taking verses out of context, which I didn't. Just look up the verse. That is the context. But once again, he fails to actually refute my argument. And then he goes on to make his own argument. He gets off the topic here, uh, accusing me of just ignoring verses that we haven't even been talking about. And I'm, uh, I'm supposedly ignoring verses that we haven't even been talking about. And he's referring to John 6. I actually have a Greek exegesis of John 6 on my blog, a pretty thorough, exhaustive one. I'm not ignoring anything here. And so uh, White does, doesn't know what he's talking about. He's speaking out of his ignorance. He's just falsely accusing me. He's just ignoring the arguments that I am presenting. Uh, I'm actually uh, properly explaining um, these verses. Um, but they, they, they have their own preconceived uh, ideas and notions that they read out of scriptures that aren't really there. Um, anyways, I explain John chapter 6, which he accuses me of uh, ignoring. I explain that a little later on in this video. It's not hard to do. Again, I have a pretty exhaustive uh, ex explanation on my blog about John 6.44, untwisting this um, Calvinist uh, proof text. Um, but he's blind to his own hypocrisy, guilty of what he accuses me of. And so you now you start throwing in the sinless perfection. So if you sin, then you're not the friend of Jesus. And so the only people that are actually the friends of Jesus are not those who desire to do his will, but those who do so perfectly. All right, at this point, he's doing two things. One, he's criticizing Jesus' teaching, not mine. He's criticizing the idea that you are Jesus' friends if you keep his commandments. That's what Jesus said, not me. Uh, then he's adding to the word of God and practicing again, eisegesis. He's saying that you are Jesus's friend, not if you keep his commandments, but if you desire to keep his commandments and yet don't actually keep them. Uh, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. He didn't say you are my friends if you desire to keep my commandments, but fail to do so uh, every day in word, thought, and deed. So he has to twist and rewrite the scriptures because of his false theology that tells him that, well, nobody can keep God's commandments. God's commandments are impossible. And uh, so, it, you know, that's that. So he, he doesn't blame his own free will for his sin. He blames the commandments of God for his sin. He blames God's law for sin by claiming God's law is impossible. Uh, Calvinists say, oh, it's not that we deliberately sin every day. It's just that God's standard is so high. God's standard is just so impossible that nobody can keep it. And so they blame God's law rather than blaming their own selves or blaming their own free will for their sin. Also, uh, James White talks about, quote, desiring to do God's will, but that's meaningless. Uh, desire to do his will perfectly? His secret will or his revealed will? If it's his secret will, well, it can't help but to be done. Uh, that's done perfectly all the time. If it's his revealed will, that can't be done. According to them, uh, not even for one second. You can't go a single day without sinning. So nobody can do his revealed will. 
So desiring to do God's will really makes no sense in Calvinism because in Calvinism, everything is already God's will. Talk about man-centeredness. Again, this is, this is why there's no assurance. This isn't good news. Uh, this, is, this is the worst news that a struggling sinner could ever, could ever get, is that, do you want Jesus to be your friend? Then you've got to do, do, do. Do, do, do until the end of your days. Again, he's, his objection is with Jesus. When Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Jesus is the one who said, you are my friend if you do. That's what Jesus said. You are my friend if you do whatsoever I command you. And here's why, mocking the teaching of Jesus, oh, do you want to be his friend? Then you've got to do, 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 do until the end of your days. So he's literally, he's not even mocking me at this point. He's mocking the Bible. He's mocking the scriptures. He's mocking Jesus. Uh, that's who he's really criticizing. He said, oh, it's not good news. See, to James White, good news is that you can sin every day of your life, in word, thought, and deed, and still be saved. He thinks that's good news, that you can sin every day and still be a friend of God. That's not good news. Uh, that's not good news at all. And that's not something you want to tell to a struggling sinner. To a struggling sinner, you want to tell them that they need to stop it, that they can overcome, that there's deliverance and freedom. That's the good news that a struggling sinner needs to hear. Not that, oh, you can break God's law and still be his friend. You can sin every day and still be saved. That's not what a struggling sinner needs to hear. Um, so that's the good news that Jesus Christ came to deliver us from sin, to save us from sin, that through faith in Christ, we can actually live a righteous life of keeping God's commandments. Keeping God's commandments is seen as a blessing to those who love God. It's a burden to those who are unregenerate in their heart and minds. I mean, so James White is just revealing his heart here when he uh, seems to present keeping God's commandments and doing whatsoever God commands as some burden. And it's not a burden, it's a blessing. So Calvinists have it backwards. It's not God's commandments that are a burden. Sin is a burden. The Bible says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5, 3. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Proverbs 13, 5. So it's not God's commandments that are grievous, it's the way of the sinner that is hard. It's sin that's the burden, not his law. So they have it backwards, I think. I mean, because they have unregenerate minds. They have a wicked heart. They think God commands things that are impossible and God's commandments are a burden. Uh, the worst thing to tell a struggling sinner is, oh, you can't stop sinning. You're, you're right with God just the way that you are. Uh, but this is how you just, just grab text, cobble them together, ignore their context, and come up with an argument. All right, seriously, James White doesn't realize at this point, you can tell, he doesn't realize that these two verses that I'm talking about are right next to each other. John 15, 13, John 15, 14. Verses 13 and 14. He's acting like these are two unrelated verses that I strung together that have no, uh, you know, there's no legitimacy to putting these two verses together. This is the way Jesus said it. This is the way John recorded it. These are two verses that are right next to each other. I didn't string anything together. Jesus said, I lay my life down for my friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. This is not uh, uh, cherry picking. This is, the this is the continuation of what Jesus said. It is the context. I didn't cobble anything together. I didn't ignore any context. This is the context. Let's read it one more time. John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Well, what's the context? Let's not cobble anything together. Let's read the next verse. Verse 14, you are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Well, there you go. So those are the verses, that's the context. No cobbling, no stringing together, no ignoring of the context. It's James White who's ignoring the context here. It's simply James White not realizing that these two verses are right next to each other. He doesn't know his Bible very well. Uh, he's just a typical Calvinist.
no. So you're without sin. I pray, deliver me from evil. I pray, so keep me from temptation. So, do I. so your God fails you? No. Then does he no. keep you from so, sin every day? No, it's so your God's a failure. Your God is no. imperfect. To the your Bible. God's not Im omnipotent. No, your to God the... can't pur purify you in this life. Your God has to wait until you die. God doesn't answer your prayer. Alright, so Emilio prays, deliver me from evil, but his God predestined him to sin. His God prefers sin over holiness. His God could have decreed entire sanctification, but didn't. And they believe that God decreed for them to desire perfect holiness, but not to actually attain it, but to actually sin every day. And thus they believe God decreed for them to be miserable in the conviction of sin without any actual deliverance. I mean, what a horrible God to serve. Whenever a Calvinist prays, deliver me from evil, they're actually praying for God's will not to be done because they believe it's God's secret, sovereign will for them to sin every day in word, thought, and deed. So the Bible says that, it's the will, that this is the will of God, even your sanctification. But they think that's only God's revealed will and that his secret will is that you would be unsanctified every day of your life in word, thought, and deed. I mean, this is how Calvinism literally destroys the Bible. It confuses everything. The distinction between revealed and secret will uh, creates more problems than it supposedly solves. So when, we, so when he came back the next day, I thought it was interesting, Amelia told the crowd, uh, oh, Jesse Morell rejects the doctrine of sanctification. Uh, what? Because he, he already accused me of teaching what he called sinless perfection. So how can that be? How can I reject the doctrine of sanctification if I'm teaching the doctrine of entire sanctification? That doesn't make any sense. So the problem is that Emilio thinks that sanctification is this. Oh, sanctification is a process. You see, Christians still sin every day. Every single day, we still sin. So we are being sanctified very slowly throughout our life. So that his doctrine of sanctification is that Christians are unsanctified. And that's a demonic perversion. Uh, that's not being sanctified, that's being unsanctified. The doctrine of progressive sanctification is actually the doctrine that Christians are not sanctified. That you cannot be sanctified in this life. Hey. What's going on? You want to take a nap? No, you can't sit on my lap. I'm making a video for YouTube. No. All right, go upstairs and I'll give you candy later. Okay. Do you want candy? Then you go upstairs and I'll give you candy later. And if you don't, come down here. Where's my phone? I gave it to you. Want me to go put some TV on for you? See, the problem is that Emilio thinks the doctrine of sanctification is this. Oh, sanctification is a, is a process, a slow process. Uh, Christians still sin. They, they sin every day, but uh, they're, they're slowly being sanctified. Uh, so his doctrine of sanctification is literally that Christians are unsanctified. That's what he thinks the doctrine of sanctification is, that Christians are unsanctified. They're, they're maybe partially sanctified, but mostly unsanctified. And so, I mean, what a demonic perversion when the doctrine of sanctification literally becomes Christians are unsanctified. I mean, that's not being sanctified. That's being unsanctified. The doctrine of progressive sanctification is actually the doctrine of Christians are unsanctified. Uh, you can never be sanctified in this life. I mean, talk about a demonic perversion. The Bible says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command. So if the atonement, if the atonement is limited, he didn't die for you. Because you don't do everything that he commands. First John says, so you say you're without sin, you're a liar. So you know, the Bible says if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You know, it's, it's chapter 1, verse 9. First, now, now watch. Now, so, instead of this being the experience of the Christian, what Morel's going to do is he's going to try to make that, well, that was my past, and it's not anymore. That's, that's, that's going to be the argument here, as you'll see here in a moment. All right, well, look, first of all, you'll notice that he cut the clip 
right as I was pointing out that Emilio got the text wrong. Emilio said, oh, uh, that's chapter two. I said, no, actually that was uh, chapter one, verse nine. It was actually the, the following verse because he didn't know the context. He quotes 1 John 1, 8, like the typical Calvinist, not including at all the context of verse nine. I, I then quote the context with this verse nine and he says, oh, oh yeah, well that's, that's chapter two. So uh, Emilio just looked really bad um, and didn't, didn't really know what he was talking about, uh, obviously taking a verse out of context. Uh, but anyways, the man described in 1 John 1, 8 is the man who hasn't yet been cleansed from all sin as promised in 1 John 1, 9. The problem is that Calvinists will misapply verse 8 to everyone, ignoring the context of verse 9 which is actually the solution to the problem, which promises cleansing from all sin. Uh, 1 John 1, 8 is just a prime example, again, of how Calvinists will take verses out of context. They ignore the rest of the epistle, which is about living free from sin. He said, I write these things unto you that you sin not. He that sins is of the devil. Uh, Christ was uh, manifested to destroy the work of the devil. Whosoever is born of God sinneth not. I mean, the whole epistle is about not sinning. And all they harp on and focus on is verse 8. And uh, verse 8 was actually a refutation to the Gnostics, where the Gnostics said, well, I could fornicate with my body and still be pure in my spirit. And so they would deny that they were sinning when they, in fact, were. And so that's what First uh, John is about, is, is confessing your sin when it is in fact sin so that you could be cleansed from sin and go on to live a holy life. But Calvinism, being the demonic perversion that it is, just completely ignores the context, uh, historically uh, the context and um, just the immediate passages, isolates one little verse, verse 8, and then uses that to teach everyone sins. You can't stop sinning when the purpose of the entire epistle well, he said in verse uh, chapter 2, verse 1, I write these things unto you that you sin not. The whole point of that epistle was to get you to stop sinning. And Calvinists use verse 8 to teach that you can't stop sinning. So, oh, it's horrible. Anyways, so yeah, 1 John 1, 8 was written to the Gnostics that thought it was okay to sin. And in 1 John is actually a refutation to the Gnostics. This demonic idea that you can't stop sinning actually comes from Gnosticism. Um, it's the opposite of what John was trying to communicate. Chapter 1, verse 9. You only stick to verse 8, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and you ignore verse 9. <laughs> no, I take, you're, you I don't, take them both in You context. take it out of context. Okay, so what is, Chapter 2 so what is says, John? I write these things unto you that you sin not. Uh -huh. And if anyone sins, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sure. then we have an advocate with the Father. It okay. says if. You say when. So what when? Does John you, mean? Say, you say we what sin does John, every day. What does John mean when he says if? So you say, it says if, and you say when. As if there's somehow a difference between the two. Okay, wow, talk about abusing language. There's no difference between the two. Again, look at the poor reasoning skills and skill. No wonder these guys are Calvinists. They lack common logic. There's no difference between if and when. So if you commit adultery on your wife is no different from when you commit adultery on your wife. You're telling me there's no difference? Saying that it might happen and saying that it will happen. That's a, a, a very important difference. So. Uh, Calvinism says there is no if when it comes to sinning. Uh, the Bible says there is an if. Uh, the, that's a huge difference. So how big is the difference? Uh, well, it's, it's the difference between heaven and hell. Jesus said if, you're, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It's better to go through life without a hand than to be cast into hell with both. In other words, you have to do something about your sin to escape damnation. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better to go through life without an eye than to be cast into hell with both. So again, you have to do something about your sin. Um, get rid of your sin. Stop your sin. Or else you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. So how big is If you sin is very different from when you sin. And the difference is, uh, well, the difference is heaven and hell. So, but if you're a sinless perfectionist, then why say if? Because there is no when. That doesn't make any sense. No, because it doesn't make sense because I'm not a sinless perfectionist. Because you're going by the slander that Calvinists have been spreading for years. Because you never cared to inquire about my actual beliefs. You've never asked me what I believe about holiness. I believe it's possible to sin. It's possible not to sin. I don't believe it's impossible to sin. Just like I don't believe it's impossible to live holy. You guys believe that. 
you think it's impossible to live holy in this life and that it's impossible to sin in the next life. I don't believe that. I believe in free will. You have a choice when you're tempted to say yes or no. It's possible to live holy. It's possible to sin. Every moment of every day of your life, you make a choice. Every temptation, you make a choice. So I'm not a sinless perfectionist, which is uh, this idea that it's impossible to sin. Uh, Calvinists have just been lying about me. Calvinists, uh, you know, slander me, which is their mode of operation. Sinless perfection says it's impossible to sin. You cannot sin. The Bible uh, says the opposite. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that when you are tempted, God provides a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. In other words, you don't have to sin. There's a way of escape. It says you are able. Now that contradicts the Westminster Catechism that says no man is able. No man is able, either of himself or by any grace received in this life, to perfectly keep the commandments, but does daily break them in word, thought, and deed. That's what the Westminster Catechism says. It says no man is able, but 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, uh, God never allows you to be tempted above that ye are able. So it says ye are able. And it says in 1 John 2, 1, I write these things unto you that you sin not. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so it says you have a choice. You could, you could not sin or you could sin. You have a choice. That's free will. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 22 says, We keep his commandments, that whatsoever things we ask we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So how is it possible for 1 John to say we keep his commandments if, like Calvinism claims, his commandments are impossible, you can't stop sinning, you can't avoid sin, there's no if, ands, or buts about it, you will sin, but yet 1 John 3.22 says we keep his commandments. That's the Christian life. I don't teach that it's impossible for Christians to sin, I simply teach that a true Christian will habitually obey God. And that's what the Bible says in 1 John 3.22, we keep his commandments. So I believe a true Christian lives holy, that obedience is their habit, that if he sins in the sense of deliberate disobedience, that it should be the exception and not the rule, uh, that if we sin, we need to repent or perish. And I fully affirm that a believer can backslide into sin, that he can forfeit his salvation, that he can die in sin and go to hell. So by definition, I'm not a sinless perfectionist that says it's impossible for you to, to sin, and that would mean it's impossible for you to backslide, which means it's impossible for you to lose your salvation. Calvinists are more sinless perfectionists than I am, because they teach that it's impossible to backslide, it's impossible to lose your salvation, and they even say it's impossible to sin when you get to heaven. So they're more sinless perfectionists than I am. So the Bible says, if we sin. It means we're capable of sinning, capable of not sinning. It's free will. It's a daily choice. So White, at this point, is obviously not even critiquing my theology because he doesn't know my theology. He's speaking out of his ignorance. He doesn't care to represent my theology accurately. He never inquired about my theology. He's just speaking out of ignorance. So the real question is, why does the Bible say, if we sin, if, in fact, we can't help but to sin every day in word, thought, and deed? Why does the Bible say, if we sin, if God secretly decreed for everyone to sin every second of every day? Why would it say if? That's the real question. If we say we have no sin, we're a liar. The truth is I have dinner. sin. I used to be a drug dealer. No, no, no. I, to, no, no, no. I have sin in my Greek, record. No, I have Greek sin that I've done, no, but it's been blotted out. No, sir. No, sir. Yeah. John didn't write it like that. He didn't say He didn't say that you have had no sin. He says if you no. say you have no, no sin. No, he uses the present tense Correct. To, to describe past sins. No, no, not Yeah, not he there. said, not I used there, to persecute not. the church, and that's why I am the chief of sinners. He said. No, no. Well, so, you, so you went from a past tense to a future tense. He's talking about past events to describe himself in the present tense. That's what he did. So I'm saying, yeah, I, I'm not saying I have no sin. Right. There, I, 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 grammar saying is that I, I've, I've lied, no point in time, I've stolen, no. but no what point I'm not time, doing, you say I'm, you not, I'm not lying every day. There's not a I'm single not, point in time. I'm not committing sin every day. What sins do you do every day? What sins? Oh, I'm sure that I, I fall in my motives. I know one sin. How about, how about not loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Greatest commandment? Yeah, see, Calvinists think that it's impossible to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. They think that God commands that we love Him, you know, publicly, but secretly decreed that we would not, and therefore it's impossible to keep that commandment. 
because his secret will is that you don't love him every day in word, thought, and deed. His secret will is that you don't love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So Calvinists think that God commands that we love him, but that it's impossible to actually keep that commandment. But the question is, why would God make it impossible for us to love him? That doesn't make any sense. It, I mean, it kind of makes sense in Calvinism, because in Calvinism, God wants you to sin, and that's why he would make it impossible for you to love him, so that you know, they would say so that you, you trust in his imputed righteousness and not in your own and so that you would need uh, his, the atonement type of a thing. So, so God made it impossible for us to avoid sin so that we wouldn't rely on ourselves for salvation, that type of a, uh, argument. But I mean, it, in reality, it doesn't make any sense because in the real world, God wants you to love him. So why would he make it impossible for you to love him? Also, the command is that you love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It says, with all thy. In other words, the obligation is perfectly matched to your ability. It's with all thy. You're supposed to love him with all that you have. Not with more than you have, and certainly not with less than you have, but with all that you have. With all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. So no matter how big your obligation is, uh, or no matter how, how, how small your ability is, uh, your obligation and your ability are always perfectly proportionate. Uh, because if you love, if, if this is how much ability you have, that's how much ability you're obligated to love God with. If this is how much ability you have, that's how much you're obligated to love God. With all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. So no matter how big or small your ability is, your obligation perfectly corresponds in proportion uh, to it. And so that's that. So loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength is by no means an impossible commandment. Uh, otherwise, it would be an unjust commandment. But also, again, 1 John 3.22 says, we keep his commandments. Well, if, if loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is an impossible command, why does the Bible say we keep his commandments? I don't expect James White to like ever answer any of these points because he just he'll probably point to some Muslim in the background instead. How, how can anybody even begin to understand who they are, what their motivations are, who God is, what would be required of that, and then sit there and say, oh yeah, every moment, every day, I've got it down perfectly. Okay, how could anyone know if they're sinning or not? Um, Dr. White, it's, it's called a conscience. The, the Bible speaks of this conscience. For example, in Romans chapter 2, it says the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These not having the law are a law unto themselves, which their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So God implanted in you this thing called a conscience. And that conscience tells you whether you're sinning or not. That conscience tells you whether you're obeying God or not. Now the Apostle Paul said he had a conscience void of offense. That means Paul was not aware of any sin in his life at all. If he was aware of sin in his life, his conscience wouldn't be void of offense. Do you understand what void of offense means? It's like an empty void. It means there's nothing there. So when his conscience is void of offense, it means he has no guilty conscience at all. Nothing that he's doing that he knows is wrong. So Calvinists will sometimes argue that they're not deliberately sinning every day, but they're unknowingly sinning. So the real question isn't, well, how do you know if you're sinning or not? That's what James White's asking, and the simple answer is conscience. The question is, if you're sinning ignorantly every day, like Calvinists claim, how do you know that? If you are sinning unknowingly every day, how do you know that you're sinning unknowingly every day? That is what doesn't make any sense. They say, oh yeah, every second of every day, somehow, some way, we're all sinning even when we don't know it. Well, then how do you know that? By definition, you wouldn't know that. So how can you make a claim that everybody sins unknowingly every second of every day if by definition these sins are not done knowingly? How do you know it? So that doesn't make any sense. I don't want everyone to be saved. So, so he wants to prove sin 
here's your sin, is you don't want everybody to be saved, which is not true. I said it's a sin for you not to want everyone to be saved. He says, oh, that's not true. All right, that's not true. Well, which one's not true? It, is it not true that it's not a sin? That if, if, if you don't want everyone to be saved, you're not loving. Are you saying that's not a sin? Or is it not true that Emilio doesn't want everyone to be saved? Now, it is true that it's a sin not to want everyone to be saved because that would be unloving and God's law is love. But it's also true that Emilio doesn't want everyone to be saved because he, I already asked him if he wanted everyone to be saved. And he said, no, sir. No, sir. I want what God wants. That's what he said. In other words, Emilio does not want everyone to be saved because he doesn't believe God wants everyone to be saved. And you become like the God that you worship. And Emilio is a perfect example of that. So, so James White says, oh, that's not true. What's not true? That not loving your neighbor is, is a sin? That's not true? Or Amelia doesn't want everyone to be saved? That's, that's not true? Now, James White tries to say that he, well, he prays for everyone to be saved or he preaches to everyone to be saved or whatever because um, he doesn't know the identity of the elect. Uh, but we're not talking about James White here. We're talking about Emilio. And Emilio says he doesn't want everyone to be saved, and that's a sin. That's unloving. So I rejoice that James White apparently is an inconsistent Calvinist who somehow wants everyone to be saved even though his God doesn't, if, if that's what James White's trying to say. Uh, it's more loving than the God that he worships, but, I mean, Emilio here is being consistent. Emilio doesn't want everyone to be saved because his God doesn't. So who's really a consistent Calvinist? A hyper-Calvinist. Emilio is a good example of how you become like the God that you worship. He doesn't want everyone to be saved. He doesn't want everyone to repent because his God doesn't. He's unloving because his God is unloving. I mean, if I had a friend of mine who used to come out street preaching with me, he even he brought he bought me a Bible. He used to carry my soapbox. Even one time we were street preaching in the rain and he made sure he was holding the umbrella while I preached. I mean, super nice guy. And then it was Calvinism that came and literally ruined him. He became harsh. He became just mean-spirited. He became divisive, started attacking us, calling us names. I mean, Calvinism just ruined this gentle-spirited brother. And so I suspect that it's usually sin that attracts people to Calvinism. Uh, that's usually the case. Uh, Calvinism gives them a theology that tells them they're saved even though they sin every day, that they're elect even though they sin every day, that they're sanctified even though they're unsanctified every day. And so um, I think that's, that's often the case. Again, our command is to deliver the message to all men everywhere, repent and believe. We're just not the ones, it's not my wanting somebody that changes anything. All right, he said, we are to deliver the message to all. But, I mean, that's the thing. We are to preach the gospel to every creature because there is a gospel for every creature. Uh, in Calvinism, there is no gospel to preach to every creature because Jesus didn't die for everyone. And uh, urging everyone to believe that Jesus died for them, if the atonement was limited, would be urging them to believe a lie. And being damned for not believing the gospel when in fact there is no gospel for them to believe, would be being damned for not believing a lie. Now, so God does offer salvation to every creature, which is why we need to preach the gospel to every creature, but in Calvinism, it doesn't make any sense. It makes God insincere. First, they make God insincere by commanding publicly what he secretly decrees you to violate, and then they make him insincere. Secondly, by offering salvation to all men through the gospel, when in fact there is no gospel for all men to believe, because in their view, Jesus didn't die for everyone. Uh, and of course, the Calvinist is just as insincere as the God that they worship. I heard a Calvinist street preacher, actually that Tony Miano guy, he told a crowd on the street once, uh, Jesus Christ died for you. Well, how do you know that? In Calvinism, that might not be true. In your theology, he might not have died for everyone that was there. So how do you know that? How can you say when you're street preaching, Jesus died for you? I, I mean, I heard a Calvinist street preacher say, oh, here's a trick, you know, uh, since they know that this is a difficult issue. They say, oh, when you preach, just tell people uh, Jesus Christ died for sinners like you. Don't tell them Jesus died for you because we don't know if they're elect or not. So just tell them Jesus died for sinners like you. Uh, that way they're not telling them 
specifically Jesus died for them, uh, but yet giving them the impression that maybe he did. Uh, but that's how Calvinism actually hinders the Great Commission. Uh, they can't honestly and confidently tell every sinner they witness to, Jesus Christ died for you. I mean, they literally can't preach the gospel to anybody. They can't tell anybody Jesus died for you. So Calvinism has no gospel to preach to any creature. And the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. How can you expect them to repent and believe unless you tell them Jesus Christ died for you? So limited atonement is one of the devil's tools and tactics to just destroy the power of the gospel. And of course, in his perspective, it has to totally be the person's wanting because God wants everybody, but he can't save anybody without their cooperation. That's the essence of synergism, and this is the worst form. All right, again, notice how he frames the debate. When you allow a Calvinist to frame the debate, they, they just attach all their straw men exaggerations into it. He said, God wants everyone, but he can't save anybody without their cooperation. Uh, listen, it's not a question of what God is able to do, uh, but what God is willing to do. See, God doesn't want to save everyone unconditionally by means that violate their free will. God wants men to have a free will so that they can form their own moral character. Without free will, there can be no virtue, no vice, no moral government, no love. And love is the meaning of life. So God has decided to let men to uh, decide. It's not a matter of what God can or cannot do. It's not a question of God's ability. Again, the Calvinist makes salvation a matter of brute force. God, if God wants everyone to be saved, everyone will be saved. And uh, if, if God wants everyone to be saved, but not everyone is saved, then, then God lacks power. God is lacking ability. It has nothing to do with power and ability. Salvation is beyond just brute force. So, I mean, I could force my child to give his mother a hug just by picking him up and wrapping his arms around her, uh, but that's not real love. I want him to do it of his own free will. So it's not hard to understand. Uh, I mean, the Calvinist view of salvation is merely a view of brute force, of God's omnipotent power. So when the Bible says, look, in I, I, uh, Hosea 5.15, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Uh, the fact that God lets people in Israel go whoring around after other gods, even making God jealous, shows that God uh, grants us a free will choice to love him or not, to know him or not, to be in a relationship with him or not. So a loving relationship, by definition, cannot be forced. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and stones them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her ch chickens under her wings, and you would not. So notice, God's will alone was not all that was required. Their choice was required. Relationships require, um, you know, you need to have reciprocation. They need to reciprocate your love. And if you don't have that reciprocation, you don't have a relationship. So that's why Paul said, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5.20. God is beseeching man to be reconciled. So man's choice is required. It's not a matter of God lacks power, God lacks ability. That's how the Calvinist frames the synergism argument. It has nothing to do with God's power and ability. It has to do with the fact that God has decided to let men decide. God has given man a choice, and man has responsibility and a role to play. So God does want everyone to be saved, but that doesn't mean that everyone will be saved, because man's will is involved in the matter and man's choice is required. Now synergism comes from 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, for we are laborers together with God. Uh, Sunergos. Uh, Sunergos is Greek for that word uh, laborers together or co-laborers. So uh, synergism literally comes from the Bible. Now who changes the human heart? Uh, biblically, the circumcision of the heart is always a synergistic 
activity between God and man. Uh, the Bible says uh, uh, in well, a few passages, like Deuteronomy 36, that God is the one who does it. The Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart. Uh, Ezekiel 11.19 also says, And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them. I will take away your stony heart out of flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh. Um, I will take their stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. So here, God is the one who is said to, to do it. Also, Ezekiel 36.26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put in you. Uh, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. But there's other verses that say man is the one who has to circumcise his heart. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Ezekiel 18, 31 says, Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die? O house of Israel. James 4 8 says, Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. So it's God and man. That's synergism. Man's resistance is to blame if his heart is not changed. Acts 7 51 says, You stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did so do you. And again, Romans 5, uh, or Romans 2, 5, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So God gets the credit for man's circumcision. Man is responsible to be circumcised. Man is to blame if he's not circumcised in heart. Uh, the Bible says man controls the state of his heart. In 1 uh, Kings 8.61 says, Let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord your God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments. Proverbs 7.25 says, Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. And Hebrews 3.12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from the living God. So salvation, like all relationships, is synergistic. The consent of both parties is required in order to have a loving relationship. So you don't want everyone to be, to be saved. I'm more loving than your God is. Your God's pathetic. I'm more loving than your God is. Your God is pathetic. Well, there you go. Um, that's deep. All right, look, doctor, uh, repeating my argument is not actually refuting it uh, so he just he dodges my points he points out muslims in the crowd to bypass uh, commenting on what i said now he's just repeating what i said i mean is he ever going to try to actually refute anything that i'm saying um, so once again he just just tries to bypass it i am more loving than the god of calvinism because i want everyone to be saved so here's the problem the bible says god is love so there's no way that I'm more loving than the God of the Bible. But if Calvinism is true, then I am. Therefore, Calvinism cannot be true. Any theology that makes me more loving than God cannot be a biblical theology. So Calvinism is not a biblical theology. It's a perversion. It's a, it's a demonic counterfeit. Of course you would say that because I want everyone to be saved. I'm more loving than your God is because your your God is a false God. Right, so your God's your, your God is not omnipotent. Your God's not all loving. Your God's not all loving. Who cares if your God? Who cares if your God knows all the future? Who cares if He has all power? Your God's not all loving, so He's pathetic. So according to you, your God is pathetic. What? Again, with the omnibenevolence argument. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's an undi undifferentiated omnibenevolence argument. Yeah. It's very, very man-centered. I, I mean, that's... that's. All right. Man-centered. You know, this is this guy's mode of operation. Just just call everything man-centered. I mean, this is obvious. That's all he, he does. He just accuses everything that's not his theology is just man-centered. Okay. Uh, God is love. I said God is love, and that's man-centered. God wants everyone to be saved, and that's man-centered. God is love is man-centered theology. For God so loved the world, that's man-centered theology. Not willing that any should perish, that's man-centered theology. Uh, it's like 
you know, you keep using that word, I don't think it means what you think it means. Uh, God loving man is not man centered, it's actually God glorifying. God is love. That's God centered. Again, this is just this taking it all to its end. My hope is that if you're a synergist watching this, that you'll recoil from this and go, oh, wow. Okay, how do I keep from going there consistently? I, I mean, literally, I hope Jesse Morell helps you to see where the problem is. Recoil from this? Recoil from what? Recoil from God is love? That's what I said. God is love. God wants everyone to repent. God wants everyone to be saved. I'm more loving than the God of Calvinism because he doesn't want everyone to repent and doesn't want everyone to be saved. So what are you supposed to recoil from? The concept that God is love? What's repulsive is the idea that God doesn't want everyone to repent and be saved. That God picks and chooses arbitrarily who repents and who doesn't. That God creates men with the intention of damning them, damning them for the sins that he created them to commit. That's what needs to be recoiled from, not the idea that God is love. This just goes to show how backwards the mind of a Calvinist is because their theology is literally the opposite of the truth. They have it all backwards because Calvinism is a demonic theology. That's what the devil does. He perverts, he twists, good is called evil and evil is called good. And that's precisely what Calvinism does. According to you, Psalm 115, you're saying God can't give us free will. You're saying God can't. Of course not. It's not taught in the Bible. God, you know, the Bible says, I set before you life and death. Choose life. Does that means God is giving you free will. So, I, I, very, very shallow. I quote a Bible verse and he says shallow. Oh, that's so shallow. That's a shallow Bible verse? Oh, shallow, shallow Bible verse. Well, if it's so shallow, why can't he explain it? He doesn't even try to explain it. I set before you life and death, choose life. So there's alternative options, alternative possibilities, life and death, and you have a choice between the two. If it's so shallow, doctor, why can't you explain it? Give us your professional uh, hermeneutical exegesis of this passage that you, uh, you know, should be able to so easily do since it's so shallow. Uh, so watch how he just totally fails to explain the verse. And again, he just bypasses the point. He ignores the point. So I, I'm, I'm not sure who did worse in this whole uh, encounter. Was it Emilio who did horrible or was it Dr. James White who just embarrassed himself even worse than Emilio. I mean, leave a comment. Who do you think did worse, Emilio or Dr. White? Um, because God holds men accountable and says, choose life or death, that means that you have autonomous free will. Autonomous free will? N nobody used that word, Dr. James White. Uh, nobody used that word except for you. Uh, this is, again, the Calvinist tactic. They try to frame the debate in their favor by putting words in your mouth and creating a straw man. Autonomous free will would be like an atheist who thinks he has free will. Free will independent of God. Saying that God gave us free will, by definition, is not autonomous free will. Just read my book on free will. I wrote this like 10 years ago. And I specifically said that our free will is not autonomous from God because uh, our free will actually came from God. So by definition, it's not autonomous. But yes, yeah, saying I set before you life and death means that you have a free will choice between life and death. It means there's alternative options. There's alternative choices, alternative possibilities, alternative futures. Free will is defined as the power of contrary choice. If you choose death, you could have chosen life. If you chose life, you could have chosen death. The free will that was granted to Adam was not lost. Look at Cain. God said to Cain, um, sin lies at the door and his desire is to have you, but you must rule over him. He says, why are you downcast? If you do well, will it not be accepted of you? So Cain didn't lose the ability to do well. Cain didn't lose the ability to rule over sin. God spoke to Cain as a free moral agent. He did the same thing here with Israel. I set before you life and death, choose life. Man's free will was not lost by original sin. It's eisegesis to say that free will was lost. It's eisegesis to say dead in sin means no free will. That's not true with the prodigal son. And so again, 
Calvinists just can't deal honestly with all of these verses that contradict their theology, and Dr. White doesn't even attempt to explain them. Uh, James White never actually explained that verse at all. Uh, he just dodged it and never explained it. Okay, it could be creaturely free will, but I'm not going to go there because that messes up all my, all my theology. And okay, so he says, well, it could be creature free will, but it, he won't go there because it messes up all of his theology. So he won't go there? Does he mean that he won't go there because it would destroy his own theology? Or does he think that I won't go there because that would destroy my theology? Uh, I'm, I, I am going there. I think it is creaturely free will. God created us with free will. Uh, but if it's talking about himself, that he won't go there because it would destroy his theology, I mean, don't be afraid of a Bible verse, Mr. Ph.D., Doctor of Theology. I mean, that's what cults do. Uh, it's, if it's, it's not shallow, it's tota scriptura. Uh, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. Deuteronomy 30.19 Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Jeremiah 21.8 Choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua 24, 15. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 28. This is tota scriptura. Uh, Tertullian said, you will find that when he sets before man good and evil, life and death, that the entire course of this discipline uh, is arranged in precepts by God's calling men from sin, threatening and exhorting them, and this on no other ground than that man is free with a will either for obedience or resistance. Uh, John had a disciple named Polycarp who had a disciple named Irenaeus, and he said, this expression, how often would I have gathered thy children together, and thou wouldest not, set forth the ancient law of human liberty, because God made man a free agent from the beginning, possessing of his own soul, or possessing his own soul to obey the behest of God voluntarily, and not by the compulsion of God. Now, Methodius who was a Christian martyr who lived near the end of the third century, he said those pagans who decide that man does not have free will, a.k.a. Calvinists, but say that he is governed by the unavoidable necessities of fate, or substitute fate for the word decree, are guilty of impiety towards God himself, making him out to be the cause and the author of human evil. The first Christian apologist, also a martyr, Justin Martyr, I already quoted him earlier, he said, We have learned from the prophets, and we hold it to be true, that punishment and chastisement and rewards are when rendered according to the merits of each man's actions. Otherwise, if all things happen by fate, then nothing is in our own power. For it is, if it is predestined that one man be good and another man evil, then the first is not deserving of praise and the other to be blamed. Unless humans have the power of avoiding evil and choosing good by free choice, they are not accountable for their actions, whatever they might be. For neither would a man be worthy of praise if he did not of himself choose the good, but was merely created for that end. Likewise, if a man were created evil, he would not deserve punishment, since he was not evil of himself, being unable to do anything else than what he was made for. And the first historian, Eusebius, he said the creator of all things was impressed, or has impressed, a natural law upon the soul of every man. As an assistant and ally in his conduct, pointing out to him the right way by his law, but by uh, the free liberty with which he is endowed making the choice of what is best worthy of praise and acceptance because he has acted rightly, not by force, but by his own free will, when he had it in his power to act otherwise. As, again, making him who chooses what is worst deserving of blame and punishment, 
as having by his own motion neglected the law, or the natural law, and becoming the origin and fountain of wickedness, and misusing himself, not from any extraneous necessity, but from free will and judgment. The fault is in him who chooses, not in God. For God has not made nature or the substance of the soul bad. For he, he who is good can make nothing but what is good. Everything is good which is according to nature. Every rational soul has naturally a good free will formed for the choice of what is good. But when a man acts wrongly, nature is not to be blamed for what is wrong takes place according, not according to nature, but contrary to nature, it being the work of choice and not of nature. So here's Eusebius very plainly refuting the Gnostics who said man has no free will, man sins by necessity of a sinful nature. And Eusebius says, no, no, no. God created nature good. Everything is good that's according to nature. Man has a free will, and if man sins, he's the origin and fountain of sin, not God. So, Eusebius, and of course the, the Calvinists are spiritual descendants of the Gnostics, and that's why these quotes that are refuting the Gnostics, you would think, are direct refutations to the Calvinists. Besides that, I can't go there. You have to have autonomous free will because I've already denied that to my God by denying him knowledge of future events. So somebody's got to have it, and since God doesn't have it, I guess mankind has to have it. Wow. <laughs> what a mess. Uh, yeah, the mess is just completely in your head, Dr. White. Uh, did you catch his reasoning? It, I mean, it's a little bit difficult because it was just so absurd, but, but if you listen to it a few times, you can catch what he's trying to say. He's saying that in open theism, God doesn't have autonomous free will, because the future has open possibilities, which means there's uncertainty for God. And uh, actually, only if the future has open possibilities can God have a free will. Because if, if God has no possibilities to decide between, then God has no free will. So James White has it backwards. He said, uh, since, there's, since free will is denied to God, oh, man must have it because, well, somebody must have it. I mean, this is literally just incoherent jargon. It's absolute, total, mumbo-jumbo nonsense. Uh, maybe this is just the Smirnoff uh, uh, talking here. Um, it doesn't make any sense. I think uh, the mess, Dr. White, is just totally in your head. To a nation, unity showing to an entire nation, not just believers, not an about, entire yeah, nation. Free will is says, I said before concept. you, life and death, choose right. life. Yeah, sure. Free will is used 17 times in the King James Bible. The word sovereignty is not used once. Yeah, it's never talking the about word sovereignty, free will, The word sovereignty is not used in the King James Bible even once. Free will is used 17 times. You don't agree with Psalm 115. You don't agree with Psalm 115 that says God sits in heaven you know what and he you does are? whatever he wants. You are All right. So Emilio said God does whatever he wants. He says, you don't agree with Psalms 115 that says God sits in heaven and does whatever he wants. Again, notice they put words in your mouth. This is the only way Calvinists know how to debate. They can't refute your actual arguments. So instead they put words in your mouth that they think they can then refute your straw man. That's literally what they're doing. Just put words in your mouth and then refute a straw man because they can't refute your actual arguments. Um, Psalms 115.3 uh, says, uh, God does whatever he has pleased. Uh, first of all, that's not even the topic that we're discussing here. Um, and it's not whether or not uh, God does whatever he pleases that we're debating. It's whether men do everything that pleases God or not. Uh, it's whether or not men do whatsoever God has pleased. Uh, God does whatever he wants. God does whatever he pleased. It's men who don't always please him. So, I mean, just stay on topic, Emilio. Uh, stop twisting the scriptures to support your perverted view of God. God does all that he pleases, but it's men who don't do all that he pleases. Don't you see how Calvinists will twist the scripture? They say God does all that he pleases, therefore all men do the will of God. Everybody does what God pleases. Because God does what he pleases, therefore everyone does what he pleases. There's no logic there. Just because God does whatever he pleases does not mean everything man does pleases God. In fact, they I mean, remember, those that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's what, I mean, even White was quoting that earlier. 
those that are in the flesh cannot please God. So not everything man does is uh, pleasing to God because not everything man does is God's will. So Calvinists just twist these scriptures. I think they, they can't understand even simple texts like this, like God sits in heaven and does whatever he pleases. They can't understand that because they have carnal, unregenerate minds. That's why they sin every day. You don't agree with you that? Are, you are a modern-day Gnostic. Sure. You, have, you have the spirit of Antichrist. Yeah, sure. Jesus died for everyone. You say, no, he didn't. Right. God wants everyone to repent. You say, no, he doesn't. What does God know? God wants everyone to be saved. You say, no, he doesn't. Jesse, what does you God know? You have the spirit does, of Antichrist. If God is not... All right. It's true. They have the spirit of Antichrist, which 1 John spoke about because they, 1 John was talking about the Gnostics. And uh, Calvinism came from the Gnostics, from the Gnostics, to the Manichaeans, to the Augustinians, to then the Lutherans, and the Calvinists, and there you have it. That's the spiritual history, uh, uh, the, the church uh, history of Calvinism. It goes back to Calvin, Luther, Augustine, Manichaeans, Gnostics. That's their spiritual uh, ancestry. Uh, the Gnostics were a group of people who would twist the Bible, and they would teach things like Number one, the Gnostics taught God created us to sin. Number two, Gnostics taught that man has no free will. Number three, Gnostics taught that nature is evil. Number four, Gnostics taught that the flesh is sinful. Number five, Gnostics taught that you cannot stop sinning. Number six, uh, Gnostics taught that you can't be free from sin until you die. And so, what is that? That is uh, the early, uh, those are the heresies of the Gnostics that the early church refuted time and time again, uh, but they, these views came into the church through Augustine, and then they spread in the Reformation through Luther and Calvin. And uh, so yeah, I mean, all, of, all six of those points that the Gnostics taught are exactly what the Calvinists teach. So Calvinism is the Antichrist spirit spoken of in 1 John, uh, because Calvinism is just Gnosticism by another name. I used to wonder, I mean, I've, I tried to get along with Calvinists. I used to think maybe they were Christians, and I was just out preaching and witnessing and sharing the faith and encouraging people to repent and to live holy. And these Calvinists would just come so harsh against me. Oh, you're a heretic. you got a false god. you got a false gospel. They were just so harsh, and I never understood why they were that way. And when I understood that they are the Gnostics, that are the counterfeit Christianity, the Antichrist spirit spoken of in 1 John, then it all made sense why they opposed my ministry so harshly over the past 19 years, because they're, they're the spirit of Antichrist. No wonder they opposed the preaching of the gospel so viciously. Not omniscient. What does he know then? Nothing. Oh, God knows. God's omniscient. God knows all. The open theist says God knows all things that can be known. Okay. Now catch that. I, I want to make sure because. All right. Yeah. In open theism, God is omniscient. God, omniscient means God knows all that can be known. Just like omnipotence means God can do all that can be done. Uh, what cannot be known is not an object of knowledge yet, and so God's nescience in different cases is by no means a denial of God's omniscience by any means. Open theists believe that God does not know future events because the future does not exist. He cannot know what does not exist. All right, he said that open theists believe that God does not know future events because the future doesn't exist. Uh, that's not an accurate or fair statement. In open theism, God can and does know the future through predeterminations and through extrapolations. Uh, in open theism, the future has open possibilities and alternatives and options that God, being omniscient, knows as such. So he knows future predeterminations as future predeterminations, and he knows future open possibilities as future open possibilities. If the future has alternative possibilities, yet God thinks that the future only has certainties, uh, then God would not be omniscient. So in open theism, God grants man free will, which means we have an alternative, open, uh, possible future. So the debate is not whether God is omniscient or not. The debate is what is the future that God knows. If the future is entirely predestined or whether the future has open possibilities. Because in both scenarios, we both agree God knows the future as it is. Now, free will by definition 
creates future uncertainties because such matters haven't been decided yet. And that's how we can account for all those times in the Bible that God is surprised or God is disappointed. So you can't deal honestly with those texts that express divine surprise or divine disappointment if you have this view that God has foreplanned and therefore foreknew with certainty all future events. And so there's a theory of time behind it. And of course, it makes time something outside the creative act of God. So there's all sorts of issues with it. But All right, this issue of time. The, the experience of succession is an attribute of existence. It's a necessary attribute of being. Uh, God has uncreated attributes. And God is a dynamic person. He, he, he has these uncreated attributes uh, so that he, you know, he's, he's all-knowing. He's, he's all-powerful. He's also eternal. And being eternal means he experiences time with no beginning and time with no end. Um, a being that is dynamic uh, has to experience moments which are necessary for thoughts, for feelings, for decisions, for actions. And so the issues are with the idea that God created time. That's where the real problems lie. James White thinks that God created time. But time defined is duration, sequence. It means you know one thing happening before another, one thing happening after another. Which means that creation, uh, the creation of time would involve a impossibility, a contradiction. It in, it's a self-contradiction. Uh, creating itself is a sequence. Cre creating itself is duration. It goes from non-existence to existence. That's time. So uh, time is actually a prerequisite to creating anything. Uh, not, to me not to mention, um, creating involves cause and effect. Cause and effect is a before and an after. The cause is before, the effect is after. That's time. And since creation or creating has a, a cause and effect, God created, that's cause and effect, that's time, before and after. I mean, ask, ask, a, ask a guy like James White who says God created time. Did God exist before he created time? Well, well yeah. Well, how did he exist before he created time? If before is a reference to a timeline. How could God exist before he created time if before is a timeline reference? If there was no time, God could not say, let there be time, because he would have no time to do so. Because saying, let there be time, is a sequence. Let there be time. One word comes before the other. But you can't have one thing before another if there's no time. So when a Calvinist says God created time, just ask him, well, how, where did he find the time necessary to do so? Where did God find the time to create anything? If God were timeless, which is actually Platonic philosophy, not biblical Christianity, if God created, or if God was timeless, then he couldn't be the creator of anything. He couldn't be the creator of heaven and earth. God created the measure of time when he created the seasons. He created... Um, the sun rise, the sun set, um, the different seasons. This is the measure of time, but he didn't create duration itself because duration is required to create anything. Now, our time is finite because it has a beginning, and God's time is eternal because it has no beginning and no end. The Bible says he's from everlasting to everlasting. Again, that's a timeline reference. From and to from everlasting to everlasting. So God is experiencing eternal time. So time's a necessary attribute of existence. God could not have thoughts or feelings or decisions or actions or experience anything if uh, time was not an attribute of his consciousness. They say, oh, well, God can go in and out of time. God goes in and out of time. Well, that would be a sequence. That itself would be a timeline going in and out. That's a before and an after. He's out of it, now he's in it, now he's out of it again. That's before and after. Those are sequences. So even saying that God goes in and out of time 
is assuming that God actually experiences at least his own divine timeline. So God is eternal. Uh, that's one of his uncreated attributes. It's part of his eternal nature that time has no beginning or end for him. Uh, not to mention the word foreknowledge actually implies a timeline. Because it's before, to know before, prognosco. So it's foreknowledge. He knows it before. So God is having this timeline. It says the word became flesh. How can God become flesh if he can't experience time? Because that would be change. And all change takes place in time. God is provoked to wrath. How can that happen if he's outside of time? Because being provoked to wrath is a change. And all change takes place in time. God is provoked to jealousy. Or God turns from his wrath. How could any of these things happen if God is outside of time? Because all changes, like being provoked to wrath, provoked to jealousy, turning from his wrath, those are all changes that have to take place in time. So eternity is not the absence of time, or what they would call timelessness. Eternity is time without end. Eternal life, or eternal damnation, has sequence of moments. The Bible says of the wicked, the smoke of their torment will rise up forever and they'll have no rest day or night. So there's time in eternity. It says beings in heaven will sing holy, 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 day and night. So again, you see that there is time in eternity. So yeah, open theism has a theory of time. Um, it's the only thing that actually makes sense. The idea that God is outside of time, that God created time. Uh, this is just um, mainstream, uh, incoherent nonsense that anybody who actually thinks what they're saying, it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, um, and so God, especially, God knows what he wants to do. And he can know that truly. And he knows the past truly. But he cannot know this is the whole reason it was developed is to completely defend the concept of autonomous free will uh creaturely free will uh he cannot know what free creatures will do that's why he could not know that you and i would exist because we are the result of thousands and thousands and thousands of free choices i will marry her i won't marry her blah 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 all right uh, he says, he says, God does in open theism, God doesn't know when you're going to die. Um, actually, the opposite is the case in open theism. In the case of Hezekiah, God added 15 years to his life. God said, you're going to die. You're not going to live. Hezekiah prayed. God changed his mind and said, you're going to live and not die. In fact, I'm adding 15 years to your life. So that's open theism, that God can lengthen or shorten your days. He can change the future. Uh, and that's a prime example with Hezekiah. The Bible says uh, in many places that God can lengthen or shorten your days. It says for the sake of the elect, the days of the tribulation have been shortened. Um, all of these are examples of God changing the future, which by definition is open theism. So White, in very typical Calvinist fashion, just attacks open theism out of his ignorance with his false accusations and his exaggerated uh, representations and his straw man arguments, um, it's, it's in open theism that God is free to decide how long you're going to live, when you're going to die. If it was an eternal fixity in his mind, then it's already an eternal certainty, which means he has no freedom to decide or to change it at all. But if the future can be changed by God, then he can plan it, he can change it, he can shorten your days, he can lengthen your days, and God then has the power over life and death in open theism. Uh, there's no basis for prophecy. I mean, open theism is just a foreign concept. No basis for prophecy? What is he talking about? We already said Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel will stand and I will do all of my pleasure. So the basis of prophecy in this verse is that God declares ahead of time what he himself will bring to pass, which he is able to foretell because he is foreplanning it. Uh, that uh, requires God to be in time for him to be in time to plan the future to then to be eternal so that in a thousand years he can bring to pass what he said he was going to do uh, so that all requires that God is in time which is open theism 
So, I mean, just like I tell my wife that I'm going to go on a preaching trip next week and I can then make it happen, God is able to do the same, except he transcends our limits of time because he never dies. And so his time is eternal and without end. So God's able to declare generations ahead of time what he plans on doing generations from now. But only in open theism can you truly understand prophecy. Like God canceling his prophecy to Hezekiah, God canceled his prophecy to Nineveh, or here in Jeremiah 18, 7 to 10, he says, at what instance I shall speak concerning a nation, in other words, that's prophecy, and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, then I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instance I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to build up and to plant it. So again, it's on prophecy. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I uh, said I should benefit uh, them. So only in open theism can you understand prophecy. Can you understand God canceling prophecy? Can you understand contingent prophecies? Can you understand prophecies that were given for the sake of changing the future? Like the prophet who tried to warn Paul not to go to Jerusalem. So you can only properly understand prophecy if you have an open view of the future. Uh, the Calvinist can't explain canceled prophecy or contingent prophecy or prophecy that was given to avoid a possible future. So the Bible teaches that and it demonstrate. So the Bible teaches that some prophecies are conditional and changeable, and that only makes sense in open theism. In fact, it is open theism. What's a foreign concept to the Bible is things like God is outside of time. God created time. God predestined everything. Uh, these are man-made philosophies. And it demonstrates once again how far people are willing to go to defend a tradition, the tradition being free will. All right, free will is a biblical tradition. It's a tradition in the sense that historical Christianity has always taught it. Like I just quoted Tertullian or Eusebius or Justin Martyr. Uh, these guys taught free will. The early church fathers all taught free will. It's biblical because, well, the Bible literally teaches it over and over and over again. I set before you life and death. Choose life. That's just one prime example. Uh, truth is always systematic. And since the Bible teaches free will, then it's no wonder that the Bible also teaches an open view of the future. In other words, that the future can be changed because they're really just two sides of the same coin. What is amazing is how far people will go to deny free will just to defend their uh, reformed tradition of Calvinism, even when it clearly uh, contradicts the Bible over and over and over again. Rather than recognizing the Bible says God has free will, we have creaturely will. Uh, when my will runs into God's will, I lose because I'm a creature. Wait a minute. He said God has free will? Then that means that the future is open to him. That means God has possibilities to choose between. That he can choose A, B, or C. If God can only choose A then and there is no B or C, then God doesn't have free will. So he says God has free will? He's free to decide between possibilities? That's open theism. He says man has creature free will? Really? Creature, God, can, can man choose between A and B? If God predestined man to choose A, is he free to choose B? If God foreknew from eternity that you were going to choose A, are you free to choose B? There's no free will in Calvinism. Creaturely free will, great. That means the same thing. Okay, when our will runs into God's will, he says, who will lose? Uh, not if it's God's will for you to have free will. Uh, the Calvinist idea is that if God's will is not done on earth, but man's will is being done, that is, if sin is not God's will, but, but man's will, then God is losing. That if oh man's will comes against God's will, uh, man loses, God wins. And so, therefore, everything that happens is, it's not the will of man being done on earth, as it, uh, it's, it's the will of, of God being done on earth in every instance. Uh, otherwise, God is losing. But if it's God's will for us to have free will, and if it's God's will for us to have 
the time and liberty to use that free will, even if the exercise of our will runs contrary uh, to his to his will or plans or purposes that he would have for us, uh, then there's really no, oh, man's will is stronger than God's will argument. There's no God's will is losing. Not if it's his will for us to have our own free moral agency and to make our own choices and to, you know, choose our own future. Do your homework. That can be known, right? Yeah, do your homework. Yeah. 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 Do your he homework. knows everything. Does God know that you're a monkey? Time. Does God know that you're a monkey? Uh, yeah. No, because no, it's not knows. true. No, he knows the truth. So God knows that we have free will. God knows God the God knows the future has alternatives. God some God sent Jeremiah to Israel. God sent Jeremiah to preach. He said maybe they will repent. God said maybe they will repent. Everything works there are, He said read life and death. I said before you life and death. That's an alternative. Ephesians chapter one says everything's working. He said I said before Is life and death an alternative? Will. He said, I said before you, cursing and blessing, that's an alternative. Yeah. Yeah. So you're the one saying yeah. God can't give us free will. I'm saying right. that God in his sovereignty gave us a free will. No, that's not talking And that's scripture. biblical. That's no words that talking scripture. Free will is a biblical term. Jesus said it. I love how Emilio just totally contradicted everything that James White just said. James White said that man has creaturely free will. But when I said... Uh, God in his sovereignty gave us free will, Emilio said, no, that's not taught in scripture. So Emilio just contradicted what James White admitted. You sin, you're a slave the, of sin, you're a slave. The psalmist says you come to the bondage. temple by your own Read free Romans will. Read chapter 3. Nobody hey. wills to come to God. The Bible says, says no seeks God. If your will's in bondage, hey, listen, it's because you hey, chose listen, to be in bondage. It's, will, it's called then, human then responsibility. The Bible says, if your will's in bondage, it's because you chose to be in bondage. All right, yeah. If you're a servant of sin, that's your choice. That's what the Bible says in Romans 6, 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. In other words, you have a choice between yielding yourself to sin or yielding your members as instruments of righteousness. That's alternative options, alternative possibilities. It's free will. So if you're a servant of sin, it's because you're yielding yourself as a servant of sin. If you're a servant of righteousness, it's because you're yielding yourself to serve righteousness. So, yeah, you're choosing who you will serve. That's what, hey, that's what he said, you know, I choose you this day whom you will serve. Anyways, uh, John 8, 34 says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So know ye not that you're the servant of the one that you obey? That's what Paul said. You are the servant of whom you obey. And so being a servant of sin is not like analogous to involuntary servitude. It's voluntary servitude. Sinners are not forced kicking and screaming into sin. They voluntarily choose to sin. So if you're a servant of sin, it's because you're choosing to be a servant of sin. If you actually you, you see in the Old Testament, you could be a voluntary slave, and described in Exodus 21. If a man wanted to serve his master and not be set free, uh, he would become a voluntary slave. Exodus 21. So if you choose to serve God, you're a servant of God. If you choose to serve sin, you're a servant of sin. Uh, therefore, uh, you are uh, you know choosing whom you will serve. Uh, Paul said you're a servant of whomever you choose to yield yourself to. In other words, there's no no belief in uh, a fallen nature, no belief in being an Adam, federal headship, original sin. Uh, again, full-on Pelagianism. He said no fallen nature, no in Adam, no federal headship. Uh, we already showed how Cain inherited a free will from Adam. God said, why are you downcast? If you do well, will it not be accepted of you? But uh, if you do not well, uh, sin lies at the door and his desire is to have you and you must rule over him. And so Cain inherited from Adam a free will that could do well and could rule over sin. Uh, Ezekiel 18 refutes the idea of federal headship. Um, now federal headship, for those of you, those of you who don't know, it, it's the new kid on the block that had come about 150 years ago uh, to replace the idea of seminal identity or traducianism, that the soul was hereditary and that we existed and acted in our ancestors. Um, so the traditional view 
of, of seminal identity like Augustine taught was that we existed in Adam. We existed in Adam. And it was based on a mistranslation found in the Latin Vulgate that says, uh, you know, in him, uh, says death passed upon all men for that um, all have sinned. Uh, but the Latin Vulgate says that for in him all have sinned. And so there's this concept that we existed and acted in Adam. So Adam's sin is our sin. Uh, the problem with that seminal identity traducianism view is um, that you would have acted in all your ancestors. All of their sins would be your sins. All the sins of your father would be yours. All the sins of your grandfather, uh, at least prior to your birth, uh, you know, would be yours or prior to your father's birth because you would have been, I guess, in your father. And so uh, you, would have, you would have obeyed God in Noah. So if you are guilty of Adam's sin because you existed and acted in Adam, you would also be, uh, you know, you would also be a partaker of Noah's obedience and righteousness because you existed and acted in Noah. But this contradicts Ezekiel 18, where God says, "All souls are mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. The father does not bear the iniquity of the son, and the son does not bear the iniquity of the father." So to escape this consequence of being guilty of all the sins of all your ancestors, they came up with the, this new theory, it's only 150 years old, called federal headship. That says, um, Adam was your federal represent, representative. Like we send um, people to you know, the, the House of Representatives to represent us as voters. Of course, representation is perfectly legitimate if it's, if it's consensual. If you're voting the person in as your representative, then there's, there's no problem with the House of Representatives. Um, the problem in Calvinism is they say Adam was our representative, but we, we had no say in the matter. That Adam acted on our behalf, even without our knowledge and without our consent. And that would be total injustice. And it also contradicts Ezekiel 18, that the soul that sins, it shall die. Everyone's accountable for their own sin. Uh, the Bible says we will give an account for the deeds done in our body, whether they were good or bad. Uh, the Bible says the son doesn't bear the iniquity of the father, and the father doesn't bear the iniquity of the son. So federal headship contradicts all of that. Um, and then he says, oh, it's full-on Pelagianism. So again, with these slanderous straw men uh, arguments. Well, fine. Uh, James White is a full-on Gnostic. And that's not a slander or an exaggeration. All of the early church fathers before Pelagius taught free will. It was the Gnostics who said we had no free will and that we had a nature that necessitated us to sin. So James White here is a full-on Gnostic. I'm Orthodox. I'm teaching historic Christianity, which is the doctrine of free will. He's teaching a necessitated uh, sin caused by your nature. Because I brought up how, you know, if, if you're a servant of sin, it's because you choose to be. And he's, he's saying, no, 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 you choose to sin because you're a servant of sin. You're not a servant of sin because you choose to sin. You're a ser you're, you, you choose to sin because you're a servant of sin. So that's the Gnostic view of a necessitated nature, uh, a will that's under necessity of your nature. And it's not free will. So that's just full-on Gnosticism. What I'm teaching is not Pelagianism, because free will existed long before Pelagius did. Yield yourself a servant of sin, or you yield yourself a servant of righteousness. It's your choice. Three, it it's, says that it's no one choice. seeks after God, not even one. Where's free will, Jesse? That's by if choice. If everyone has free will, why doesn't everybody problem. seek God? That's what I'm saying. You know what by their free will, they refuse to acknowledge God. No one seeks God. Yeah, by their free will, they need to acknowledge act of God. They need regeneration, which precedes faith, in order to have faith in God. Do you believe that regeneration? You're saying you're saying they don't seek God, and it's not their fault. They can't. That I'm saying they could see God and they refuse to do so, and that that's why they're accountable. That's why they're responsible. So the Bible says, as many as received him, and that Greek word means to, to choose, yeah. as many as received him. To now, that's one of the things I wanted to, to stop at um, to refute that, that assertion. Uh, I, I hate when people abuse the languages, and Jesse Morrell is definitely guilty of abuse of the language. Um, All right, he says, I'm abusing the Greek language. It's called a lexicon. Uh, a lexicon is abusing the Greek language. 
Uh, I mean, surely James White's either joking or, or he's, he's just a joker. Uh, probably both. Uh, because uh, you'll see later on here, he actually goes on to admit, according to the Greek lexicons, that the word lambano does mean or can mean to choose. So he actually admits uh, what he says, I am abusing the Greek language uh, for saying. So watch this. So what you what you have uh, in verse twelve of John one, um, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And so what he's saying is that lambano, hasoide uh, elaban auton. So as many as received him. Uh, to them, he gave authority, technatheu genocide, to become children of God. Uh, and then, in functioning positively, tois pistuusin aista anima autu, the ones believing in his name. Um, if you look up Lambano, uh, you will find a single entry that says to choose. All right. So, right there, he just admitted that the Greek lexicon has to choose as a definition for lambano. So boom, right there. He's accusing me of abusing the Greek language when all I did was quote from a Greek lexicon, and then he admits that it says what I said it said. So now come up, you'll, you'll watch, he's gonna come up with some just totally bogus explanation as to why that word uh, lambano, which can mean to choose, uh, but doesn't mean to choose in this case. Uh, li listen to this. Uh, the problem is that as Bauer, Donker, Arndt, and Gingrich, the standard current Greek lexicon, points out, there is only one passage in the New Testament where that is a possible meaning, and it's only a possible meaning, uh, and that is in Hebrews 5.1. All right, so he's talking about this right here. It's the BDAG, uh, which is the considered like the standard in, in Greek right now. Uh, again, he... I didn't know that I happen to have one here because I've read it and I've looked it up and it certainly does not say what he what, what he just alleges that the uh, lexicon teaches. It, he, it does list uh, Hebrews 5.1 under a, the definition of to choose. Uh, so it does define lambano uh, with the option of it means to choose. But what, what he said is not what this says. It doesn't say what James White alleged that it says, which is that it's it's only one instance in which it means that, or only one possible definition or one possible case for that. Uh, that's what White said. All this says is to choose, and then it gives Hebrews 5.1. It doesn't say this is the only case, and it doesn't say this is only one possible definition. That that was just what White um, added to it and uh, so talk about abusing the the Greek language uh, he's alleging that it says and implying that it says uh, something that it doesn't say at all that was that was only what James White said uh, which and of course Hebrews uses an exceptionally um, classical uh, vocabulary and syntax as well for every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God in order to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And there, it's not Elaban, it's, it's uh, uh, a participial form. <laughs> okay, I love how he says it's a participial form. Uh, in Greek parsing, it's a participle. A participle. Uh, not a participial. Uh, Participials are related to participles, but, but it's different. Uh, but, I mean, hey, who am I to correct a Greek, uh, you know, teacher at a seminary level uh, on his Greek parsing? Uh, but I, any anyone who parses the Greek might find that funny. Uh, it's a it's a participle, doctor, not a participial. Lamban nominos, um, and New American Standard translates it taken, um, but there are other translations that could say chosen from among men. Um, but it's obviously referring to the selection uh, of high priests by God based upon, you know, genealogy, etc., etc. There's no, there is no parallel 
to Elaban at, at John 1.12. Uh, there is no basis for saying that that's what the word means there. Um, that is an abuse of the language. And um, I would just simply suggest that, you know, when people encounter this man, uh, those of you who actually know the language, uh, call him on it uh, because he's abusing the, abusing the language. A lot, of, a lot of street preachers do that, um, but um, doesn't make it right. All right, finally, we are like one hour into this video of Dr. White, and we finally got to like some type of substance where he tries to actually refute one of my arguments. Uh, so we finally have a little bit of substance here to debate. Now, Elaban and Labamanos are actually the same word. Uh, Lambano is the stem word. Uh, one simply means have chosen, and one means being chosen. Uh, so it's, you know, second aorist active indicative versus the present passive participle. Uh, have chosen in Hebrews 5.1 is passive uh, because it's God who is choosing men. And so the men are passive. But as many as received him or chosen him, it's active because men are the ones who are actually doing something, uh, actively taking Christ to themselves. Uh, he points out that it's a... Uh, participle, uh, though he mispronounced it as a participial, uh, but the difference between an uh, indicative uh, versus a participle is the, is the difference in mood. Uh, it doesn't change the definition. Uh, definition is not determined by the mood, it's determined by the context. Uh, how is it being used? And so White is abusing the Greek language. He's, he's seems like he's playing word games for those who don't actually know the Greek, who don't actually know it, who might be in, impressed with his very poor parsing skills. But Hebrews 5.1 translates the word as chosen because that's one of its legitimate uh, meanings and usage in the New Testament. So you have to look at the context uh, which is written uh, to see uh, the definition and the context of John 1 uh, certainly allows and calls for it. So when you're talking about Greek scholars, um, you know, I do I do appreciate the Greek Orthodox, uh, at least for being Greek scholars. And I really like the Eastern Greek Orthodox New Testament, just at least uh, for its for its notes. Uh, it has some end notes and um, it gives you some great insights into the original Greek. Because after all, I mean, the Greeks, I mean, nobody reads the Greeks better than the Greeks. And they point out that in um, John 1.11, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. That When it says received him not, uh, that Greek conveys the idea of choosing or taking a hold of or taking advantage of. And uh, that Greek word in verse 11 is paralabano. Uh, so it's related to Lombano. And the contrast then is in verse 12 where it says, but as, but as many as received him. So he came unto his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him. And so there is, I mean, at least according to the Greek scholars, the Greek Orthodox, a strong emphasis on, on choice there. So the context of John 1.12 is these people who don't choose him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And it's in a contrast to that verse, in verse 11, that verse 12 is spoken. Uh, Kittle, I also have Kittle here. Uh, Kittle points out that in his Greek dictionary that lambano uh, can be used in the passive sense, which we do see in Hebrews 5.1, uh, but also in an active sense. Now, in the passive, it's like passively received. You know, like um, you receive uh, uh, taxes, um, but in the in the active sense, and that is uh, how it how it's used in First John. I mean, not not First John. John one twelve. Uh, it is active, so it's men actively receiving Christ, actively choosing Christ. So it's the active sense, taking hold of something uh, by your own initiation, by your own initiative, um, to to pull onto yourself. So he says that John 1.12 falls under the active category of to take to one's self. So notice that John 1.12 is active because they're the ones that are actually doing the choosing and the receiving. 
Whereas Hebrews uh, 5.1 is passive because God's the one who is choosing them. Uh, they're not passively re receiving Christ. They're actively receiving Christ. So the context of John 1.12, which is John 1.11, uh, certainly allows for uh, this word, which uh, well, in, the, in the way that it's used, elabon, uh, means to choose. So John 1.14 cannot exclude human volition in regeneration because that would contradict uh, what is taught in verse 12 just outright. So Calvinists just twist everything that they touch. Notice that White never actually explains what verse 12 means. He dodges it altogether. Uh, what it does mean is that to receive Christ comes prior to uh, becoming a son of God or a child of God. That's what it says. As many as received him, to them he became, uh, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. And so faith in receiving Christ comes before regeneration. That contradicts the Calvinists who say you have to be regenerated before you can receive Christ. Um, but he, White just bypasses this problem. Uh, he never explains what John 1.12 means when it says that we are actively receiving Christ and that that has to happen before you become a son of God. He never addresses it. He gave the power to become the sons of God. Why don't so you first reading? you need to keep reading the verse. Well, you're the one that takes it out of context. You say, no, no, not no. by the will of man, nor by the will. Yeah, that's right. That's talking about your yeah. parents. Their choice, not, their choice is not owing to the, the power context, of the will. It, that's what John just no, that's said. Talking about your first because birth. having been that's born. That's talking about the choice no, of your parents. No, he eliminates all that's three talking, That's why it mentions blood. No, sir. It's talking about your 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 He parents. eliminates all three kinds of It says, as many blood. as received no, him, no, the no. Greek word means to choose, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Uh -huh. So the choice comes before the regeneration. You have you have the you have the cart before the horse. You you have you have the cart. Okay, now now a serious a, a person who actually seriously wants to drive their theology from scripture. This is not how you do it. Okay, he says this is not how a serious person drives their theology from scripture. I am literally just looking at the definition of Greek words here, looking at the context in which they are used. And he's calling this, uh, um, you know, oh, no serious person would, would, would do this. It, this is exegetical. This is hermeneutical. And White says if you want to draw your theology from scriptures, this isn't the way to do it. I mean, again, it's just, it's, it's slander, it's false accusations. It's like he doesn't know what else to say. This is just what he's used to saying. Oh, man-centered and, you know, um, the heresy. I mean, this is just his, his fallback. Um you want to ask fundamental questions. Does the Bible specifically differentiate between, you know, can we be specific and talk about regeneration? Is regeneration the same as being saved? Yes, regeneration is the same thing as being saved. Regeneration is a change of your moral character. And salvation is primarily deliverance from the practice of sin, not merely from, you know, deliverance from the penalty of sin. The uh, Bible says he shall save his people from their sins. Regeneration is a transformation of your moral character so that you become a new person in Christ, going from being a sinner to being a saint. So the Calvinists think that regeneration is not the same thing as salvation, that you ha first you have to be regenerated, but you're still unsaved. Then, after you're regenerated, you get saved. So they view regeneration as like a change of your abilities, a change of your nature. It liberates your will from this necessity to sin so that now you are capable of choosing to repent and, and capable of believing, capable of converting. Uh, so they make a distinction between regeneration and conversion. They say, first you need to be regenerated, then you are capable of being converted. And they say that you have to be regenerated before you're converted. So this means that you have people who are regenerated uh, before they are saved. It means that you have unsaved people who are regenerate people. And it's just totally bogus. I mean, that's, that's bogus. A regenerate man is a saved man, a born-again man, a new creature. Regeneration, born again, new creature, that's, that's salvation. Is that the same thing as being forgiven? No, I mean, forgiveness is part of salvation, but regeneration is not forgiveness. 
uh, forgiveness is a part of our of our salvation. It's regeneration that changes us, which now enables God to forgive us in a way that doesn't violate his wisdom. But I don't think anyone ever thought that regeneration is forgiveness. He, he's, he's asking questions nobody's even bringing up. He's, he's not even staying on topic here. Um, I mean, this is not a serious question. Nobody ever argued that forgiveness and regeneration are the same thing. I simply said, that, uh, you know, in the Calvinist uh, view, you, uh, you get saved before you have uh, faith because you're regenerated before you have faith. And uh, regeneration is the same thing as salvation. But, uh, but faith is the means by which we are saved. And so faith is the means by which we are regenerated, changed, transformed, born again. You repent and believe the gospel and... Consequently, you're born again. You receive Christ, and consequently, you become a child of God. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. So the precursor is not some fanciful regeneration that the Calvinist imagines where you, you receive the abilities that you didn't have before. It's that you receive Christ and consequently become a child of God. The same thing as being adopted in the family of God, being sanctified, etc., etc. Look, again, he's, he's bringing up things nobody's even bringing up, nobody's even debating. Nobody said regeneration is sanctification. Uh, sanctification is part of salvation. Uh, sanctification is a big part of salvation. It's a fruit of salvation. It's a part of salvation. Um, a sanctified life. Uh, comes after being regenerated. Sanctified means set apart from sin, dedicated to God. Uh, it's the result of regeneration. God regenerates a sinner's moral character, so they become a sanctified person, a holy saint. Uh, that's why, I mean, sanctification is not a second blessing. Sanctification is not a process. It's a first blessing. You're either sanctified or you're not. You're sanctified or unsanctified. So a sanctified life is the result of a regenerate heart. You repent and believe, you become a new person, and then consequently live a holy life. That's how that works. I mean, Calvinists know nothing of it. They think they're regenerated, and they still sin every day. So their regeneration does not result in a holy life. Their regeneration somehow is perfectly compatible with sinning every day in word, thought, and deed. No, obviously there are distinctions that have to be drawn. Y yeah. Now, he says all this because I said that the choice to receive Christ comes before regeneration. And that's what the Bible says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God. So you need to first choose to submit and surrender your life to God, to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord. And when you come to God in repentance and in faith, he regenerates you and makes you a new person. I mean, I know when I was in rehab 19 years ago that I knelt down in prayer. I asked God to make me born again. And I went down one man and I came up another. Uh, after that, I mean, I, I, I was a new person. I lived a sanctified, holy life. So this choice to come to God, to repent, to surrender yourself to God comes before regeneration. So Calvinists have it backwards. They say regeneration comes before the choice and that you must first become a son of God before you can receive him. But that's the opposite of what 1 John uh, or John 1, 12 says. And so you have to be careful what you read into any particular text to determine what is being said here. Yes, reading into the text is the Calvinist problem. I think I've showed that time and time again. You guys read into dead in sins, things that are not there. You read into Romans 5, things that are not there. Romans 9, things that are not there. I mean, that's, that's Romans 6, or John 6. This is how you guys roll. Uh, Calvinists have a long practice of reading into text things that aren't there. Uh, that's just their mode of operation. Um, they read into John 1.13 that there's no choice in salvation, even though the immediate text says otherwise. So you have to interpret this by the Bible in this way and it, to be inconsistent just to hold on to your Calvinist theology. You have to interpret the Bible in a way that is consistent with itself if you're going to interpret it properly. And so I interpret the Bible in a way that is consistent with itself. It's the law of logic. Uh, truth cannot contradict truth. So the Calvinist interpretation of verse 13 in, in John 1 is at odds with what's clearly 
uh, stated in, in verse 12 that uh, there's a choice in salvation. So my understanding is that verse 12 is talking about our will and verse 13 is talking about our parents. That one is talking about your spiritual birth, which requires your, your choice to receive Christ. And then one is talking about your natural birth, which involves your parents' choice to have sex. It's not that one, um, or it's not only true to the context, but to the, just the Greek meaning of these words, that verse 12 is talking about your choice in salvation. Verse 13 is talking about your parents' choice in intercourse. Uh, this is a view that shows the Bible to be just consistent with itself. But the Calvinist view makes the Bible contradictory. He's specifically um, here in verse thir uh, 13. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. The term born is not... It, it's it's at the end of the sentence, and it's being assumed in light of the final phrase in John one thirteen, which is "but from God were regenerated, were born from God." And the whole point of verse thirteen is to say the it starts off with "hoy," which is, goes back to those who believe in His name, to those who received Him. And it says that they, uk ex haimaton, not from bloods, that is not of descent, your descent, who, who your daddy or mommy was, ude ek thelematos sarkos, neither from the will of the flesh, ude ek thelematos on, andros. Now, some will argue, um, one of these seems to be based upon the idea of uh, parentage, so the desire of a man. No, they actually, they're all referring to parentage. They're all referring to your first birth. Now, he already admitted that this verse is pointing back towards your parents, which was what my argument with Amelia was. Now, the contrast is that your birth came from, your first birth came from blood, from the will of flesh, from the, from the will of a man, but your second birth comes from God. So the text is not even discussing whether the new birth involves your own personal volition or not. Uh, verse 12 already said that it does. What this verse is contrasting is your first birth, uh, which comes as the result of your parents, and your second birth, which comes as a result of God. So this is a contradiction to what the Jews believed that, oh, they're children of Abraham. They were born of Abraham. And that's why John the Baptist said to them, uh, you know, say not that you're children of Abraham, for God can turn these stones into children of Abraham, but bring forth fruit and meat for repentance. So the concept is that's being refuted here in verse 13 is not that salvation is synergistic or that salvation requires man's cooperation and consent. Uh, that's what White and the Calvinists are reading into this text. The concept being refuted is this Jewish idea that their ancestors, in t or their ancestry entitles them to salvation. That they were the chosen people by birth, and therefore they're sons of God or people of God merely by human birth alone, being the natural descendants of Abraham. So James White is reading into this text with his Calvinist glasses on, applying this verse to this Calvinist-Arminian debate of monergism versus synergism, just completely ignoring the cultural context of who this verse is actually uh, speaking to. And so this verse is being spoken about to the Jews with their nations of ancestry and not talking about Arminians and their view of synergism, which is how James White applies it, quite falsely. And then the other would be the choice of a man. And you could argue either direction. I, I would assume, I mean, personally, Andros, the, the, the use of that and, and making it a contrast to Sarkos, you can go either direction on that. But the point is that the origination of regeneration is only from God. No, it's, it's all, um, to be consistent, it's all a contrast. It's, it's a redundancy uh, to hit the point home. 
It's it's harmaton, sarkas, thalematos, andros, all referring to your parents, to your first birth, to the blood, to the will of a of, of the body, the will of the flesh, to the will of a man, which is your father. Uh, it's all talking about your ancestry being a child of Abraham. It's a refutation to the idea of ancestral salvation. Um, harmaton, sarkas, thalematos are not in contrast one with another. Uh, it's and, and to be consistent, um, it's not at all referring to your cho your personal choice in salvation. Uh, again, he's refuting the idea of ancestral salvation being chosen uh, people merely by being a descendant of Abraham. He's contrasting being a mere natural descendant of Abraham with being a spiritual child of God, a concept that the Jews needed to understand. They thought they were saved because they're children of Abraham, but they weren't bringing forth fruit, meat for repentance. They might have been natural descendants of Abraham, but they were not spiritual descendants of Abraham. The synergism debate is not the topic of discussion in John 1.13. It's not being discussed in this verse at all. That was not on their mind when they wrote it, when they said it. Calvinists are reading into it and inserting their doctrine. And from all appearances, it looks like, uh, I mean, it looks like James White's really struggling to try to explain this verse. It is not from any uh, human categories whatsoever. Parentage, desire, choice. It does not come from those things, especially when it says thalematos. That's a, that's a term for will. That's, I mean, thalematos is much more a term for will than lambano is a term for choice <laughs> by a long shot. Yeah, I mean, thalematos here is talking about the will of the flesh, which is your body, your sexual desire, your bodily desire, the will of a man. This is all talking about your parents' intercourse. So lambano means to choose. Thalematos means to will. And the Bible also says, if any man will come after me, which is uh, thelo, uh, that same word there means to, to will. Uh, so if any man will come after me, the Bible says, if any man will lose his life for my sake, he will find it. So lots of verses do, uh, other verses do imply man's volitional role in salvation or a volitional role in being a Christian, volitional role of being a, a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ. If any man will come after me. It's Thelo. So again, we see this volitional nature of turning to Christ, of receiving Christ. Uh, White, I mean, White's making it too easy. He even admitted Thelematos is a, is a term that means to will. So he, uh, literally, he just said a whole lot of nothing in that whole little uh, segment. We finally looked at, we were getting to some substance, talking about the, the Greek New Testament, and uh, he just kind of kind of said a whole lot of nothing. Uh, it's it's he's He is an eisegetical heretic, reading into the Bible things that are not there, reading into verse 13, the synergism debate, when that's not the topic of debate at all in their minds. So he, he falsely accuses me of abusing the Greek, but that's precisely uh, what his Gnostic cult, known as Calvinism, is doing. He's abusing the Greek New Testament, just like how the NIV translates the word uh, sarx, or flesh, into sinful nature. If you ever read the NIV, it says uh, that term sinful nature. That's a Gnostic term. It's not in the Greek New Testament. The Bible says nothing about a sinful nature. But if you read the NIV, you think it does. Because they translate flesh, sarx, as sinful nature. Um, so when, But they're inconsistent. Because when the Bible says uh, God became flesh, or if you deny that Christ was uh, came in the flesh, or God manifest in the flesh, they don't translate that as sinful nature. Because then you would say that you know if you deny that Christ came in the sinful nature, you're an antichrist. But they will say like you know those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Oh, those that are in the sinful nature cannot please God. It's just the word flesh. It's talking about the carnal life, living for your appetites, living for. I mean, the Bible says that there's people who live whose God is their belly. They live for the appetite of their stomach. That doesn't mean your stomach is a sinful nature. Just because living for your stomach is a sin does not mean your stomach is a sinful nature. And just because you're living for your body and your bodily appetites is a sin. But that doesn't mean your, your flesh is a sinful nature. It's, that's just, it's just heresy. It's Gnostic heresy. Or they will translate um, carnal mind 
the NIV will translate the carnal mind into sinful nature. But it's the opposite. I mean, carnal mind means fleshly purposed. It's talking about a volitional state of mind that you are setting your mindset on. You are minding the things of the flesh rather than minding the things of the spirit. You see, the will is a faculty of the mind. When you say, oh, I was, I was planning on going you know, out for dinner tonight, but oh, I changed my mind. You see, the will is a faculty of the mind. So when the Bible says, you know, repent means a change your mind, it's talking about a change of will, a change of plans, a change of purpose. Carnally minded is when you are planning on living for your own carnal appetites and desires of the flesh. It's, it's a volitional, voluntary state of mind, yet they translate carnal mind as sinful nature. But nature, by definition, is involuntary. It's what you're born with. It's what you're created with. And so it's the opposite. When they translate carnal mind into sinful nature, it's the opposite of what it's supposed to be. Anyway, so talk about abusing the Greek New Testament. The NIV abuses the Greek New Testament. and It's just an eisegetical abuse of the Bible to support your Gnostic doctrines. We'll get, we'll get a little, it's, it's just too easy. It's like shooting duck in a, ducks in a pond. Um, uh, given, I mean, all right, look at the condescending arrogance of this guy. Oh, it's just too easy, like shooting ducks in a pond. You, you, don't, you don't know me, you've never talked to me, you don't even know what my theology is, and I mean, you're just rambling, not even addressing the actual arguments at hand. So he, he's apparently blind to his own lack of real substance. He's blind to his own inability to debate the matters at hand. He hasn't actually refuted the points that I've been bringing up. And pride goes before a fall. You know, when someone has so many heresies together, that this is useful to see how heresy feeds into more heresy. It's useful to see, you know, because I'm always talking about the fact that Christian truth is a beautiful woven fabric. Well, this guy has cut about every thread of it there is. A beautiful uh, fabric. Uh, God predestined you to sin. God, pre God wants babies to be aborted. God creates people to sin and go to hell. He thinks that's a beautiful fabric. Now, um, James White's theology is the, is the fabric of tulip, which is systematic points of Calvinism, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Uh, each point stands and falls together, and each of these points... Uh, really is the opposite of the truth. It's not total inability, it's free will. It's not unconditional election, it's conditional salvation. It's not limited atonement, it's, it's, it's atonement made for all. It's not irresistible grace, it's, it's you've always resisted the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. It's not perseverance of the saints, it's he that endures unto the end shall be saved. And so uh, I am, he says, I'm ripping through the fabric of Christian truth. No, I am tearing through the the counterfeit gospel of the fabric of Calvinism, ripping through the whole system, uh, because exposed, exposing it for the heresy that it really is. And so you see the massive gaps opening up in the thread, in, in the garment, because of the number of heresies. I don't see any gaps. I think I've addressed James White's pretty lame arguments pretty well. Uh, leave a comment here to see what you think. Um, in this video. Leave a comment. Tell me what you what you see. Uh, I think Calvinism, when it's logically and scripturally examined, is so problematic and riddled with inconsistencies and contradictions that it cannot be embraced or believed by an intelligent, rational, logical mind. The not the Greek text. You say first okay. you need to be regenerated, then you can have faith. Right. The Bible says first you need faith, and through faith you're purified. Right. Through faith you are regenerated. Oh, sure. Sure, sure, yeah. Faith right. is the instrument by which we are saved. You're saying we're saved prior to faith. Yeah, so do you think a person is... To catch that, he just conflated saved and regenerated as if they're the identical same thing. It's very common. All right, did you catch that? He just made a false distinction between regeneration and saved. As if you can have a regenerate man who isn't yet saved. And this is, it's just, it's very common. It's a common error for Calvinists. Uh, the Bible teaches that you repent and believe and then you are changed. They teach that you are changed and then you repent and believe. So Calvinism has everything backwards. Very, very common. People who don't understand the priority of regeneration, the fact that Scripture plainly says 
that those who are according to the flesh cannot do what is pleasing to God. Repentance and faith are actually pleasing to God. I did, did you catch that logic he had there? The Bible says those that are in the flesh cannot please God. He then adds, since repentance and faith are acts that are pleasing to God, sinners cannot repent and believe. That's horrible logic. Uh, what does it mean to be in the flesh? The context is to be carnally minded. Those who are setting their mind on the things of the flesh. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God means while they are carnally minded, they cannot be pleasing to God. Not that they can't change their mind and become pleasing to God. They're, it, this is eisegetical uh, examples right here. They're inserting their views into the text. If they change their mind, a.k.a. repent, then they're no longer in the flesh, and thus they can be pleasing to God. Uh, so Paul was by no means teaching that sinners can't repent. In fact, he already says in uh, Acts 17, 30-31, God is calling all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. I mean, why would Paul... This is the contradiction of Calvinism. They say, oh yeah, God is calling you to repent, but he's withholding from you the ability to do so. And then he'll punish you for not doing so. Like, you tell sinners to repent, and then you tell sinners that they can't repent. Anyways, Paul was by no means teaching that sinners cannot repent. All he was teaching was that sinners, while they are minding the things of the flesh, cannot be pleasing to God, because God cannot be pleased with carnality. And that's the Calvinist who sins every day. The Calvinist who sins every day is carnally minded, minding the things of the flesh. He cannot please God while he's in that state of mind. But Paul's point uh, was that God can't be pleased with carnality, not that the carnally minded are incapable of changing their mind or that they are incapable of repenting and believing and turning to God. So Calvinists, once again, have to add to the scriptures and insert their views into a text uh, when their view isn't actually there. No man is able to come to me unless the Father sent me draws him. That drawing is what, uh, what must precede. All right. No man can come. Calvinists love to quote John 6.44 out of context and insert their own notions of inability. Verse 45, as we'll see also later in this video, shows that God draws by means of teaching. Uh, this is because man cannot come unless God draws him because he is ignorant and needs to be taught by the Father, not because he's inherently unable in his will to do anything good. If man was unable to do anything good, if he inherited an inability to do anything good, then the teaching that is promised in verse 45 would not solve that problem. You're not going to... Teaching an enabled man will not make him able. So in short, John 6.44 is not at all teaching some type of inability of nature, a.k.a. no free will, which is something that Calvinists are reading into the text when they say, oh, look, no man is able. That's dunatos or dunatai. That's Greek, means ability and able. Look, no man is able. Man is enable. But, but the inability arises not from a from a corruption of nature, the inability arises from an ignorance of the mind, which is why verse 45 says they must be taught of God, and they have to hear and learn from God, and then once they hear and learn from God, they can come on to the Son. It has nothing at all to do with some inability of nature. It has to do with the ignorance of their mind. It's like me saying, look, no one can read Greek unless someone teaches him. That statement doesn't reflect a person's inability of nature to learn a language. If I say you can't learn Greek unless someone teaches it. you, you know, you just pick up a Greek New Testament, it won't make sense to you. You need someone to explain it to you. You need someone to give you the, the vocabulary. You need to understand what a case language is. You need to understand the case system of the nouns. You know, you, you, you have to learn the declensions of the verbs. And how are you going to be able to exp understand it if you're not going to have someone teach you? So just because I say no man can read Greek unless somebody teaches it to him, that doesn't mean uh, that doesn't reflect some inability of his nature to learn a language. Uh, in fact, uh, the statement implies that they have the ability to learn a language. They just need a teacher as a condition for doing so. If I say no one can learn Greek unless someone teaches him, that implies he can learn Greek if somebody teaches him. 
So it doesn't imply inability, it actually implies ability, uh, conditional upon a specific thing. And so likewise, when the Bible says, no man can come unto me unless the Father draws him, that does not imply an inability of nature to come unto Jesus. To the contrary, it actually implies that they have the ability to come to Jesus. They just need the Father to draw them by means of teaching as a condition of them doing so. So that's just simple logic and proper exegesis, looking at a verse in context, something that James White uh, is, seems uh, unwilling or unable to do. Uh, I, but I hope this might help James White come out of his heresies here. Person is born again by their deeds? No, by faith. Not by works of the law. We're not saved by works of the law. We're saved by faith. But you don't have faith because you sin every day. But according to first John, you sin every day. Where's your faith? If, according to first John, faith overcomes the world. The Bible says. If you, if you listen to first John, by your righteous deeds you're born again. I didn't say we're saved by our, our deeds. The house is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by His mercy. By His mercy did He save us. First John chapter. Two no, we're saved by five. faith. You need to, you we're need to have faith. No, we're not you saved. need to stop sinning every day. We're whenever not saved by faith, in, Jesse. We're whatever saved by grace. sin you're doing, you Jesse, you believe we're saved by we're grace? We're saved by or grace or through faith. I said faith is okay. the instrument. Yeah. We're saved by grace through faith, not that of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, least any man so should boast. Does everybody have faith? Says we're saved on two good works. So why are you committing does evil everyone works? everyone have faith, Jesse? No, faith is a choice. They just need to activate. Jesus rebuked. Jesus rebuked them for being slow of heart to believe. Right. Why? Why would he rebuke them for so being then, slow of heart to believe it is not a so choice? When so, so, so when you get to heaven, Jesse, when you get to heaven, why did Jesus it's rebuke them to your free will? Right? So, when you so I'm not sure if that other guy back there is like, you know, sort of like Joe Ventilacion's five guys running around with their books or something. <laughs> hey, I got one here. Try this. <laughs> yeah, oh boy. All right, did, did you see what he just did? He just played a really long clip with a lot of content, a lot of points. And once again, he just used a dodge technique of pointing out someone in the crowd, uh, with, which was completely irrelevant, and then just instead, just uh, instead of handling the substance of what was being discussed, he just tries to bypass it. So White completely ignores all these points that I just said, look, if faith is not a choice, why did Jesus rebuke them for being slow of heart to believe? Jesus rebuked them for being slow of heart to believe, which implies that faith is a choice that they need to make and that they could have made. So just ignore what I said. Just point out someone in the crowd, and then you don't have to refute any of the arguments, and you just uh, just go on to the next one. So, I mean, that's how this guy rolls. Tearing apart, shredding the fabric of the consistency of Christian revelation. Sola Scriptura, Tota Scriptura. You've got to have both. And um, the, um, the synergist is uh, not able to do that. He almost sounded unsure of himself. The synergist is, is, is not able to do that. Almost like he's not so sure. Uh, to the contrary, doctor, as I've already shown, we are taking the full counsel of God's word into consideration when we interpret the Bible. It's the monergist who cannot explain verses like Ezekiel 24, 13. He said, I have purged thee, and thou was not purged. Since their doctrine says God alone is active in regeneration, that it does not require man's cooperation and consent, then how can you explain God saying, I have purged thee, and thou was not purged? How can you explain that? Don't expect him to do it. He'll probably just point out somebody in the crowd. If regeneration was monergistic, in which God alone was active, then this scripture should have read, I have purged thee, and thou was purged. If, if God alone is active, if sinner, sinner does nothing, no cooperation, no consent, then I have purged thee, and thou was purged. But that's not what it says. I have purged thee, and thou was not purged. How do you explain that? So Calvinism is inconsistent with the Bible. Once again, Calvinism is inconsistent with Tota Scriptura, they take verses out of context, they isolate them, they insert their theology into them, and, and voila, you got a systematic theology of heresy. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. 
So the drawing of the Father is absolutely necessary for anyone to come to Christ. Look, nobody denied that drawing was necessary to come to Christ. Free will is governed by motives and influences. The debate is why do men need drawing to come to Christ? Is it because they're born with an inability to do anything good, just inherent in their nature? Or is it because they are ignorant and unwilling to come of their own initiation? Uh, in the former, if the sinner is just born incapable of doing anything good, then the sinner is a victim, a victim of his birth, of his ancestry. But if it's the latter, if he's ignorant, maybe by his own negligence, or if he's unwilling to come, then he's a criminal. And so, I guess Finney argued, you know, let's say a man owes you a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, whatever the sum might be, but he's unwilling to pay you. But he's a wealthy man. He has the money. He's just unwilling to pay you. So you have to go to court and have the judge order it and have the government, uh, you know, intervene and step in so that he finally pays you uh, what he owes you. Well, you could say, well, why? Why do you have to go to court if the man is capable of paying you? He's capable of paying you, so you shouldn't have to go to court, right? No, he's capable, but he's unwilling. He's unwilling to pay you, so you have to have the courts intervene. And the sinner is able to obey God. He's able to come to God. He's able to do what is good, but he's utterly unwilling to do so. And that's why you need the intervention of the Holy Spirit to step in and to draw the sinner. So man is, man, no man is able, uh, or he says, you know, no man can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him because of his unwillingness and not because of an in inability of nature. So, And everyone thusly drawn is raised up on the last day. That's what Jesus said. Uh, actually, no, a thousand times no. He says, everyone that is drawn will be raised up. That's not what Jesus said. I mean, look, I, wow. I knew Calvinism and Calvinists would twist the Bible, but I really, I didn't know James White would twist the Bible this much. Listen to what he actually said, what Jesus said. John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So it says every man that comes was drawn. And everyone who comes because they were drawn will be raised up. It does not say everyone who is drawn will come. White is inserting that, his view of in irresistible grace, he's inserting that into the text when it isn't there. So he's leaving out this key component of the verse which says that the man comes. No man can come unto me unless uh, the Father who sent me draws him. So now we're talking about a man who is drawn and comes. And I will raise him up on the last day. So the man who is drawn and comes will be raised up. The man is drawn, the man comes, the man is raised up. That's the link. You can't jump from the man is drawn to the man is raised up, leaving out this key component of the verse, which is that the man comes. It's again stated in verse uh, 45 when it says that every man who has heard and has learned of the Father comes unto me. So you have the drawing in the form of hearing and learning, and then the man comes, and then he is raised up. The man who comes is the man who is drawn, and the man who is, uh, comes because he was drawn is the man who is raised up. So, I mean, White is twisting this verse to mean, oh, everyone who is drawn is raised up. Talking about, oh, so this is only God drawing his elect by irresistible grace, and then perseverance of the saints, uh, reading his theology into a verse when it is not there at all. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Yeah, so who's the him? The him is the man who comes. No man can come to me except the Father which sent me has drawn him. So we're talking about a man who is drawn and comes. We're saying the man who comes was drawn. That's who we're talking about. And I will raise him up on the last day, the man who comes. Not every man who is drawn. 
It's not saying every man who is drawn will be raised up. It's every man who comes was drawn and they will be raised up. That's what it's saying. I mean, wow. Trying to read irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints into John 6, 44. And it's not there at all. And the whole assumption, and if you're drawn, then you have the choice to believe. And if you believe, therefore, I will raise him up on the last day. So that allows someone to say, well, you can be drawn, but not do the free will part, and therefore not be raised up on the last day. So the two hymns become different people. No, it's, it's not talking about two different people. Uh, he is saying that the man who comes was a man who was drawn, and the man who came under God's drawing will be the man raised up. That's what Jesus is saying. It doesn't say what White is inserting, that every man drawn will be raised up. It says everyone who comes was drawn. And he, talking about the man who came under the drawing, will be raised up. So he's, I mean, talk about tota scriptura, taking tota scriptura into consideration. We have to understand that it's possible uh, well, to fall away from the faith, as many verses indicate. Jesus said, if any man abide not in him, he is cut off and cast into the fire. And that word abide in the Greek means to continue. If any man does not continue in him, he is cut off and cast into the fire. So the Bible warns in many places about being cut off from the faith or falling away from the faith or losing uh, your salvation. So Jesus by no means was trying to teach, you know, total depravity, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints, all in one verse, John 6, 44. That's not what he was teaching at all. He was rebuking the crowd for not coming unto him because they didn't really worship and love the Father. They didn't hear and learn from the Father. Uh, they, they, the, there, was, there was a group of people who were uh, you know, followers of God. They believed in the Father, like, uh, like Simeon or Apollos or um, Cornelius or Lydia, and they, they had faith in the Father. And so now that the revelation of the Son was being given, the Father was teaching them the revelation of the Son. So they were being given from the Father to the Son. And they were coming. And so Jesus is now rebuking this crowd, saying they don't believe because they don't, they don't belong to the Father. Because they don't really have faith in God. If they had faith in God, if they learned from God and heard from God, they'd come unto the Son. But the fact that they're not coming unto the Son shows that they don't really belong to the Father. They're not God's people. And so it, he's not excusing them as having inability. He's rebuking them uh, for not belonging to the Father. Anyways, drawing is not regeneration. Hearing and learning and coming is regeneration. So who's the one being drawn? Those who are already believers in the Father, who worship the Father, and now they're being drawn to the Son. Uh, but these unbelievers that Jesus is talking to were not being drawn to the Son or not coming to the Son because they didn't belong to the Father. It's not talking about some elect that he predestined from the found, or before the foundation of the world. Like I said, it's talking about people like Simeon who already belonged to the Father and now was being drawn and given to the Son. That's Luke 2.25, or people like Cornelius, who belonged already to the Father and was being drawn by the Father and given to the Son in Acts 10. People like Lydia, who already belonged to the Father and were being drawn by the Father and given to the Son in Acts 16.14. Or Apollos in Acts 18.24-28, who already belonged to the Father and was now being drawn by the Father and given to the Son. So John 6 is talking about those who already belong to the Father being drawn by the Father and given to the Son. It's not at all talking about God picking an elect from eternity past who is now irresistibly drawing to Christ. Jesus is rebuking them, not excusing them. He is blaming them for not believing in him as the Son because they do not truly belong to the Father either. John 6 is by no means teaching Calvinism I mean, unless you ignore the cultural context of the audience that Jesus is speaking to and you read the text with Calvinist glasses on. Those being drawn in John 6 are those who belong to the Father. Now, does God draw all men to himself? Well, well, yes, he does. The Bible says he gives light to every man that comes into the world. Uh, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men uh, in uh, Titus 2.11. Uh, even John 6, 45 says, They shall all be taught of God. And Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men 
unto myself. But like Stephen's audience, they resist the Holy Spirit. So in John 6, White, James White thinks that the elect are the ones who are being drawn. And if the drawing mentioned is limited, then it's really not referring to a uh, election, but it's talking about a limitation to the worshipers of God. Those who already belong to the Father are consequently being drawn by the Father to the Son. So that would be like Cornelius and Lydia and Simeon and Apollos. If, if the drawing in John 6 is limited, uh, that's the limitation. Um, it doesn't say everyone that is drawn is saved. It says everyone that comes was drawn and those who come will be raised up. And that's a big difference. So the verse is by no means teaching irresistible grace where everyone is drawn that is saved. That's pure eisegesis. I might do a whole video explaining John 6.44 to Dr. James White. That might be an upcoming video. I do have a, a pretty good Greek exegesis of uh, this text on my blog. If you just type in to Google, Jesse Morrell, Greek, John 6.44, you'll find it. And Judas is clearly not one of the elect, but he is a son of perdition, and he has a purpose to fulfill in the sovereignty of God. Again, once you abandon that element of biblical revelation, nothing is going to make any sense. All right, let's talk about Judas. Uh, what was Judas chosen for? Through the Calvinist things, Judas was chosen to betray Christ. Uh, actually, the Bible says in Luke 9, verse 1 to 2, it says, then, all he, then he called his twelve disciples together, and he gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So what was Judas chosen for? To preach the gospel, to cast out devils, to heal the sick. That's what the Bible says he was chosen for. It, in fact, the Bible says Judas even had a throne in heaven. Matthew 19, 28 says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So Judas had a throne in heaven, because Jesus said to his twelve, I have twelve thrones in heaven that you will sit on. So, I mean, I guess that's also a modified or canceled prophecy because Judas didn't make it to that throne. So Judas lost it by sinning. It says in Acts 1.25 that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. So Judas lost his apostleship and his throne in heaven by sinning. Jesus even said that he lost Judas in John 17 12 but while I was with them in the world I kept them in thy name those that thou gavest me I have kept and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled so Jesus said all that you gave me I've kept I haven't lost any of them well except for Judas I lost him so Jesus lost Judas Judas was given by the father to the son and Jesus lost him that's what John 17 12 is saying and Judas went to hell. In Mark 14, 21, The Son of Man indeed goeth, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Uh, good were it that man if, it, if he had never been born. Now, uh, also at the Last Supper, Jesus turned to his twelve, including Judas, and said, This is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you. And so that means Jesus died for Judas. And since Judas went to hell, that means that the atonement does not automatically, unconditionally save. Otherwise, Judas would have been saved. It also means the atonement is not limited to those who are saved, because at the Last Supper, Jesus said he was spilling his blood for Judas, and we all know Judas wasn't saved. Judas is functioning as the son of perdition by God's sovereign choice to his destruction, and to the benefit of the world through the crucifixion because it was prophesied this would happen. Okay, they think Judas had to betray Jesus to fulfill prophecy. Actually, usually it's Acts 1.16 that's referred to in an attempt uh, to say that Judas had to fulfill some prophecy. It says, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs be fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost spoke by the mouth of David, spoke before concerning Judas, which was a guide to them that took Jesus. And what's the scripture that needs to be fulfilled? That someone needs to betray Jesus? No. 
Peter said, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric let another take. Acts 1.20 So this was by no means a prophecy of Judas betraying uh, Jesus that needed to be fulfilled. The scripture that Peter said needed to be fulfilled was that someone needs to take Judas's place. And therefore, it says in Acts 1.26, Matthias was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now, the scripture Peter referred to was not a prophecy about Judas, as the original passage speaks in the plural, and Peter modified it to be singular. It's Psalm 69.25, says, Let their habitation be desolate. But Peter changed it to his habitation. And it says, Let none dwell in their tents. Peter was not quoting from a prophecy about Judas since he had no, uh, since he had to change the passage to apply it to Judas and since he was actually merging two scriptures together. He was referencing Psalm 69.25 about his habitation being desolate, or desolate and he referenced Psalms 109.8 about another taking his office. Peter merged these two verses together and applied them to the current situation because there was a vacancy among the apostles uh, that needed to be fulfilled. So what needs to be understood is that in Hebrew culture, they applied scriptures to applicable situations, just as Christians might use a psalm to describe their day today, uh, an experience that they're going through, uh, to describe how they're feeling. The Hebrews used the scriptures in the same manner. The scriptures were fulfilled in this situation not prophetically, they were fulfilled through parallelism. The scriptures were fulfilled by Judas just through similarity, through applicability. Uh, these are known as analogous fulfillments. Hebrew writers would take Old Testament passages, which were specifically about Old Testament events, and then apply them to New Testament events because of similarity. Uh, this is done uh, by the Hebrew writer Matthew a lot. Uh, he applied uh, Hosea 11.1, 1, which was talking about God calling Israel out of Egypt, but he applied it to Jesus in Matthew 2.15. He also applied Psalms 41.9, which was talking about David's betrayal by his trusted friend and uh, counselor, um, and he then applied it to the situation with Judas in Luke 13.18. So it's not... Now, it's also interesting that... The scripture says, you know, oh, my own familiar friend in whom I've trusted has lifted up his heel against me. So that means that Judas was a friend of Jesus and Jesus trusted Judas, which makes no sense in the idea that Judas was chosen by Jesus to be the betrayer, to fulfill prophecy. Why would then Judas be called his friend? Why would Jesus trust him? That makes no sense. So it's not that in these, old, these New Testament events that these were prophetic fulfillments of these Old Testament passages, but that these events were fulfilled through similarity and through applicability. Another example is how Matthew applies the passage of 30 pieces of silver, which is found in Zechariah 11, uh, 12 to 13, and applies it to Judas's betrayal in Matthew 27, 9. The original passage had nothing to do with Judas or the betrayal of Christ at all. So Jesus, as a Hebrew, Use the scriptures the same way. When Jesus said, When I was in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled, John 17, 12. Jesus did not say that the scripture was... Uh, Jesus did not say which scripture he was talking about that was fulfilled. But we know that since there actually were no prophetic passages regarding Judas in the Old Testament, uh, the scriptural fulfillment Jesus was referring to must have been a fulfillment through similarity and applicability. Uh, regarding the phrase that it might be fulfilled, Dr. S.T. Bloomfield said that this scriptural expression sometimes means that such and such a thing so happened that this or that passage would appear quite suitably or applicable to it. Moses Stewart said that the New Testament writers often used Old Testament phraseology, which originally applied to very different connections. And they do this because such phraseology expresses in an apt and forcible manner uh, the thought which they desired then to convey. Uh, Dr. Edward Robinson said, uh, the phrase is often used to express historical or uh, typical parallelisms. So these types of passages are known as ecbatic and as opposed to telic. 
Dr. L. D. McCabe explained it. He said, the telic use implies purpose, determination, prediction, foreordination, while the ecbatic use implies only consequence, parallelism, application, or mil mere illustration. So the betrayal of Judas was not, therefore, a foreordained event that was necessary in order for, to fulfill prophecy. But Judas, his betrayal, was his own free will choice, which fulfilled the scriptures through parallelism and similarity. As already shown, the scriptures plainly teach that well, Judas was a genuine believer, a follower of Christ who fell from his apostleship. He lost his salvation through sin. I mean, to teach otherwise is to misrepresent and to misunderstand the scriptures. Jesus himself said that the Father gave Judas to him and that he lost him. John 17, 12. Judas was chosen to be a disciple. Luke 9, 23. Luke 14, 27. Then, or, or Judas chose to be a disciple. Then Jesus chose him to be an apostle. Luke um, 16, 13. John 6, 70. And then Judas fell from his apostleship by his own choice to transgress in Acts 1.19. So Judas lost both his salvation and his apostleship through sin. So Judas was saved, a genuine believer. He was not predestined to fulfill prophecy, and uh, he lost his salvation. Calvinists are wrong That's right. primarily for two reasons. The Calvinists are wrong Primarily for two reasons. Uh, the first indication, he says, is in John 6, 66, when some of those who were following Jesus did in fact turn away and stop following. If Jesus loses none of those who come to him, how is it that some of those who came to him stopped following him? Now again, you know, I'm not saying this is anywhere near one of the best responses we've ever seen, uh, because it clearly isn't. But it, it it does really prompt you to go. Did did you did you read the text? All right, John six sixty six says many of his disciples followed him no more. So White is quoting from an article that says the Calvinist view of John six forty four cannot be right because what John six sixty six says is that many of his disciples followed him no more. And John and White's view of John six uh, forty four is perseverance of the saints, irresistible grace. So how can his disciples follow him no more? I think it's actually a good point. The Calvinist argues you cannot be a disciple unless you are drawn from the Father. And everyone that is drawn by the Father will be raised up on the last day. Therefore, they argue, everyone who is a true disciple of Christ will persevere unto the end. But John 6.66 6, talks about his disciples who didn't persevere unto the end. So that's a solid point. The Calvinist's only response to this is to say that these disciples were not real disciples. Oh, they were fake disciples. Something that the text never says. He could have said many of his false disciples followed him no more. Many of his fake disciples followed him no more. It doesn't say that. It says many of his disciples. Many of his disciples. They were his disciples. And yet they followed him no more. So it makes you ask, I mean... Did James White even read the text? It's just his view is eisegesis, inserting it into the text when it's not there. Many of his disciples went away from following after and were no longer walking with him. So, why do you assume that these people were given by the Father of the Son in the first place? Why would you assume they were given by the Father? Because he thinks if they're given by the Father, they can't fall away. We already saw Jesus said, those that you gave me, I have kept all of them. I've lost none of them except for Judas. In other words, the Father gave Judas and then he lost Judas. Uh, why do we assume that they were, these people were given by the Father? Because no man can come unto Jesus unless they are drawn by the Father. John 6, 44. So if they... If they came on to Jesus, then they had been drawn by the Father. They had been given by the Father. So this verse says that these men were disciples of Christ, which means they had come on to Jesus, which means they were drawn by the Father. So the Bible says a disciple is someone who has forsaken all to follow Christ. 
Calvinism says you can't forsake all your sin unless you're first regenerated. I mean, even then you can't forsake all your sin. But according to even Calvinism, anytime the Bible speaks of a disciple, it must be speaking of a regenerate person since the unregenerate cannot become disciples of Christ. They can't forsake all to follow Christ. So when it says that many of his disciples followed him no more, even given the principles of Calvinism, it must mean that it's possible for a regenerate saved person to fall away from Christ. Unless you're going to say, well, it, they, these guys were just fake disciples, which is eisegesis, adding to the text, inserting your view into the text. It doesn't say many of his false disciples followed him no more. It could have easily said that if that was the case. But the Bible does, in fact, in other places, talk about false brethren, how Paul was in danger amongst, amongst false brethren. But for whatever reason, they decided not to classify these disciples as false disciples because they weren't. They were genuine disciples who followed him no more. Unfounded assumption that if you ever show interest in Jesus and follow him around and listen to his teaching, or if you're the son of perdition, uh, this means that you were given by the Father to the Son, and therefore it can't really mean what Calvinists say that it means. Again, watch how he falsely um, frames the debate. Oh, so you're saying if anyone expresses interest in Jesus, if anyone ever follows him around and listens to his teaching, that means they were saved. No, this text says many of his disciples followed him no more. It doesn't say many of those who expressed interest in his teaching or many of those who just followed him around and listened to him. It says many of his disciples followed him no more. So he says, oh, if you ever followed Jesus around and listened to his teaching, that's not what the text says. The text says they were his disciples. The text doesn't say they were false disciples or fake disciples or merely expressed interest in his teaching. It says they were disciples. Uh, regarding Judas, Jesus said, I've kept uh, them while I was in the world, I have kept them. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept them. None of them is lost, but the son of perdition. So Jesus lost Judas. The father gave Jesus Judas, and Jesus lost him. Uh, those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition. It's as clear as day. Judas was given by the father, and Judas was lost by Jesus. Now, I want to talk also, this is the end of uh, my critique of James White's video, but there is also a quote from James White. I'll put it on the screen. He said, I'm tired of Jesus being presented as a weak beggar. Referring to, you know, ask Jesus into your heart or, you know, that type of, uh, of thing. Um, of course, the Bible says you need to receive him as many as received him. To them, he gave the right to become the children of God. But he says, I'm tired of Jesus being presented as a weak beggar. But 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech, parakalao, which means to beg. You by us, we pray, deamai, which means to beg. You in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And so... Both of those words, actually, they're synonyms, they both mean to beg. So it says, we are ambassadors on behalf of God, begging you to be reconciled. Begging you in Christ's stead to be reconciled. So the Bible actually represents Christ as begging men to be reconciled to God. That God, in his love, would so condescend, not only to take on human flesh, but to even beg men to be reconciled to him. We have such a unselfish, benevolent, condescending God that he would do such a thing. But this is, this is the God of the Bible, but not, not the God of James White. So, it looks like James White needs to learn his Greek New Testament a little bit better. So, just to wrap up this uh, video, it looked to me like James White really was struggling throughout his video to actually address any of my points. He didn't refute a single one. He really, he had no substance. He had no content, no actual refutant, refutations. Um, and if this is the best that Calvinism has, I think they're in big trouble. If he's the best apologist for the Calvinist faith, uh, it's pretty pathetic. Honestly, 
Uh, I think he must have a huge following of idiots who just can't think for themselves, who can't study the scriptures for themselves. Calvinism is a Gnostic cult built upon eisegesis. 100% uh, of the truth, this is the truth, Calvinism um, is Gnosticism because Gnostics denied free will. Gnostics taught that nature was evil. Gnostics taught that the flesh was sinful. Gnostics taught that you can't lose your salvation. Gnostics taught that you can't stop sinning until you die. And that's, the, that's what Calvinism teaches. So the history of Reformed theology is Gnosticism to Manichaeanism to Augustinianism to Lutheranism to Calvinism. That's it right there. That's, Calvinism is not historic Christianity. Calvinists are modern-day Gnostics. It's the spirit of Antichrist spoken of in 1 John. Uh, now, it's sad. I mean, James White has dedicated like 30 years of his life to a lie, to a false religion. Of course, lots of people do that. The Mormons do that. Jehovah Witnesses do that. Uh, and James White has done that with Calvinism. 30 years of his life dedicated to a lie. And I pray that he repents. I mean, who knows? The future's open. Maybe even a guy like James White might repent. So pray that he comes to a knowledge of the truth that he repents and believes the gospel, that uh, Christ tasted death for every man. So I actually think there might be some hope for James White. I think maybe I'll be able to persuade him out of his eisegetical heresy, his illogical, um, contradictory, inconsistent theology. Uh, I genuinely believe that God might use me to help him get out of his heresy. So let's all pray for that. And so Jesse Morrell is a great example. I, I mean, literally, I hope Jesse Morrell helps you to see where the problem is.